Lecture 8, Part 2 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 8 On Justice and Moral Evil, Part 2 the will of man is the subject of that law of justice whose light is in the mind and whose guidance is offered to the will it is essential therefore both to the knowledge of self and to the knowledge of good and evil that we should understand precisely what the will is the will then is the central and sovereign power of free action in the soul whereby the man holds the possession and disposal of himself and rules and directs all the faculties and powers of his manhood. Yet though the will is sovereign over the man and free in the exercise of that sovereignty, it is always responsible to God. If it be asked whence comes the power of the will, we have already stated that it comes from God who created it, and gave it the power to act freely. But if it be asked whence comes the freedom of that power, and the freedom of choosing its motives and objects, we must answer that this freedom of use and of choice comes from the will itself. The will itself is the cause both of its choosing freely and of its acting freely, and of its refusing to act. When we consider the human will more closely, we find in it three elements, each of which requires a separate consideration. These are the appetite of the will, the power of the will, and the movement of the will. In the depth of the soul and essence of the will, there is a sense and an appetite that moves us to seek good and to avoid evil. This is the fundamental sense and appetite of man, to which, when it is in just order, every other appetite is subordinate. It is not the appetite for low and sensual good, but a spiritual appetite for universal good. This appetite, as Suarez observes, is not a special but a general appetite. It is the natural appetite for that good for which man was ordained. This appetite comes not of knowledge or of choice, but of nature, and has the good of the creature for its object. But although it comes not of knowledge, yet this vital appetite follows knowledge, because the intelligent creature seeks her own good and employs the means for reaching that good but she does this in virtue of that general sense or appetite for good which is in the root of the soul and of the will. But this appetite confesses by its very existence that it belongs to an imperfect being and expresses the wants of that being. In a word, it is the great void in our capacity for universal good craving to be filled. St. Athanasius, therefore, defines the will as the appetite of a rational and intelligent substance for that which sweetly affects the soul. And St. John of Damascus calls it the rational and vital appetite proceeding from nature. But this appetite is dim and undefined until it is enlightened by truth which reveals the good of which we are in search. The more the soul possesses of partial good, the more her appetite grows for greater good, nor will she ever be satisfied with less than perfect good. And the reason is that we are moved by appetites that seek universal good, as the reason why we seek universal good is because we are made for God. How then are we to explain the appetite for evil? The fact is that there is no appetite for evil, either in human nature or in any other nature. Plato observed long ago that no man desires evil to himself, but only good. 
and Seneca observed that no man sees the evil that he is actually doing in his own soul. The wicked man deceives himself with the pretense of good whilst he is doing evil. The appetite for good is deluded and cheated by a combination of self-love and imagination to mistake evil for good. A baser appetite is permitted to arise and to darken the appetite of the soul for universal good and deludes itself with the appearance of good, although it proves to be evil. And the self-deluded will accepts the cheat and in its weakness is generally not unwilling to be deceived and to look at the pretense of good whilst doing evil. But the appetite for good never accepts evil, except under the appearance of good. It rejects open evil as its enemy. There is always a false motive accepted by the will when it does evil. The reason of good, be it true or false, gives the motive to the appetite and the loving power of the will. And when we truly love good, we love it both for its own sake and for our own. But when we love evil under the delusive appearance of good, it is to satisfy some base appetite or passion of our own. But we love our divine Creator, observes Suarez, as the universal good of all things, and therefore as our good. And for this reason a soul that is in charity loves God more than she loves herself, because our good is included in the God we love as in its original fountain. But the appetite for good is rather the spring of the will than the will itself. It is one thing to have an appetite, another to set the will in motion, one thing to feel desire, another to act upon that desire. The power of the will, considered apart from its action, is its vital force, its virtue, or capacity for action. This power is either the natural force of the soul, which is increased by habitual exercise and discipline, or it is the natural force exalted, increased, and augmented by the divine gift of supernatural force given by God to the same soul for gaining its supernatural ends. The one is God's gift in the order of nature, the other is God's gift in the order of grace. The spiritual appetite for good is the chief element of that power, and the power is increased with increase of appetite and desire. What is this appetite but desire? There are many souls, before the world contaminates them, that suffer inexplicable desires that are vague and undefined in their objects, simply because faith has never taught them what is the true object of their spiritual appetite. And what is the final end of this immense desire? But the power of the will is one thing. The act of willing is another. The will, as it is active, is the free and uncompelled movement of the soul, either to an object or from an object, with a view to some end. The end proposed is the motive of the will and the reason why the will acts. We must consider the soul as perfectly simple in herself, but as having her sense enlightened by truth and by the law of justice, and as having the appetite of good within her. The will then moves with affection towards the good, or the seeming good, that the mind presents. But if the mind presents evil, or seeming good, the will withholds its movement, or moves away from it. This we call hatred, which moves the will from evil as love moves it towards good. But when the hatred becomes active, it seeks to punish, weaken, or destroy that in which the evil is, or in which the seeming evil appears to be. 
to understand the motives upon which the will acts we must carefully distinguish between the immediate motive and the final motive that the will has in view for the immediate good is justly ruled by the final good and the one is loved for the sake of the other if you deny yourself some present indulgence for the sake of your general health you will find it good to refuse the present good for the sake of a greater good if you refuse the same indulgence for the sake of temperance your motive is the good of the soul if you do an act of justice you do it for the immediate motive of acting justly but you may have the final motive of honoring and imitating the justice of god you help your suffering fellow creature that is your immediate motive but you have the final motive of loving god in your neighbor and thus what would be natural benevolence on the first motive becomes charity from its final motive it is well to have a clear and compact remembrance of this which sensual people seem never to understand that when two goods are offered to our choice the order of justice requires that we choose the greater good and leave the less this is the law of self-denial again when two motives present themselves for one and the same action the law of excellence requires that we put our will and intention to the higher motive for the ultimate motive exalts and enriches all the intermediate motives with its own value and makes every mediate good a step towards our final good in dealing with intermediate good the perfect soul following the light and order of justice subjects all lower motives to the motive of the love of god which she contemplates as the highest law of justice in all her acts but besides the light of god's truth and justice which illuminate the soul and give motives to the will there are other elements to be considered in the management of the will the soul is invested with a body of which she is the animating principle she is the subject of all the corporal senses appetites and passions and through them she holds much converse with the external visible and sensible world all these objects external to the soul with their movements and sensibilities become internal to the soul through the imagination which through its union with the intellectual light of the soul if not well controlled and regulated will obtain a prodigious power of exaggerating lesser good and of magnifying that lesser into the appearance of greater good by adding to it ideas from the mind that do not belong to it the ill-regulated imagination stimulated by passion confounds the pure truth in the mind with its own representations and makes that to be true which is untrue that to be just which is unjust and that to be good which is evil when the imagination is well regulated it is a grand and beautiful power interpreting the external world of sense to the mind and through the mind to the will and illustrating and giving color and interest to the inward truth and justice derived from the communicated light of god but if the will suffers the imagination to rule the intelligence instead of the intelligence ruling the imagination the result will be to delude the will and to lead her into error and evil it is obvious from this explanation that the error of the will is justly called evil and that the evil of the will is justly called error for one does not exist without the other the will then is the central and sovereign ruler of the man being the active power of the soul 
it is open to a vast range of motives from the pure and serene truth in which god reveals the principles of truth and the order of justice the luminous shadows of all good from the sense and appetite of universal good which is in the root and essence of the soul from the imagination with its restless and flitting imagery drawn from the external world from the senses and passions of the body as they are acted upon externally and act upon us internally and from the memory with all its throng of ideas imaginations and sensations derived from the past thus by a marvellous power often good often dangerous we open or close our minds to the present recall the past and make the past become the present anew it is the sublime office of the will to rule herself well and wisely in the midst of all these invitations solicitations and provocations but the law of this good and wise ruling of the will is the light of divine justice in the mind worked into the understanding by instruction and reflection and into the conscience where it acts with the force of a sense through the habit of cherishing whatever is good and right guided therefore by the light of justice in the mind and the sense of justice in the conscience the just will adheres to god before all things as the one supreme good as the supreme good of the soul and as the author of all good and of all justice the just soul feels that god is the heart of her heart and the mind of her mind and that his justice is the light of all justice she subordinates all other good to the divine good and all other justice to the divine justice she rules her senses and keeps them in their place and subjection as her servants and mortifies them into the discipline of obedience she controls her imagination and makes it subservient to the light of truth and this is the most difficult of her labors in the ruling of herself for the imagination will inopportunely obtrude where it is not wanted eclipsing the pure light of truth it can only be conquered at times by the patient stability of the will holding firmly athwart the intervening obscuration until the cloud passes and the sun of truth reappears let any one watch his will when despite of all lower solicitations it holds steadfast to its high purpose tremulous with life it resists change by the simple act of holding to its higher motive as the polar needle of the ship holds to its point whilst all around and beneath is in fluctuation so the will holds to its point cleaving with its love to its object despite of all commotion in the inferior nature the pole is not the port to which the ship is steering yet the needle pointing to the pole guides the ship to the port to which she is bound but god is both the pole and the port of the soul and the law of justice is the attraction upon the needle of the will that guides the soul on her way watch the same soul when she loses sight of her guiding good and the will no longer holds to her high motive the ruling power of the soul is no longer firm but inconstant restless and capricious it is at the mercy of the senses and the imagination it flits in weakness and discontent from one inferior object to another because all things have lost their just value in losing their just order and their right relationship through that soul with their divine author whose light and law is the measure of all goodness there is one movement of the will that should be especially noted 
because it looks at the first glance like a standstill although it is the noblest and most energetic exercise of the will i refer to the just will under trial oppression or provocation whether under temptation the presence of unacceptable evil or suffering then the just will gathers up her strength within attaches herself to her highest motive and rests for strength on god as on an immovable rock from which she refuses herself to the provocation and abides in the concentrated strength of patience and endurance this act is very simple though expressed in so many words when our lord sent his apostles to encounter so many trials he said to them in your patience you shall possess your souls the patience that holds back consent until the truth or justice of a question appears is a similar example of the energy of the will in self-control so far from reducing the will to inaction the concentration of the power of the will upon its centre and so refusing to yield to external provocation is the strongest exertion of the will and the greatest proof of its freedom hence patience and fortitude which involve what we may call the passive exercise of the will are the virtues that make man strong by the habit of concentrating strength much the same may be said of the discipline of the tongue but to quote the famous words of saint augustine cited by pope agatho in the sixth general council as the soul is nature the movement of the soul is the movement of nature and as the will is the movement of the soul it is therefore the movement of nature to continue the great doctor's explanation of free will the will is from him whose will it is if it be the will of an angel it is from that angel if it be the will of a man it is from that man if it be the will of god it is from god if god works good will in man he works it in such a manner that the will shall spring from the man whose will it is just as he makes one man spring from another for although god is the creator of man it does not follow that one man is not born of another man each one causes his own will because he wills evil but when we ask how man can have an evil will the question bears not on the cause but on the possibility of an evil will and the answer is that however good the nature of a creature may be that nature is not unchangeable and it is made from nothing the book of ecclesiasticus gives us this vivid description of man's free will god made man from the beginning and left him in the hand of his own counsel he added the commandments and precepts if thou wilt keep the commandments and perform acceptable fidelity for ever they shall preserve thee he hath set water and fire before thee stretch forth thy hand to which thou wilt before man is life and death good and evil that which he shall choose shall be given him how then are we to understand saint paul where he says that god worketh in you both to will and perfect according to his good will god works the power but not the choice of the will sometimes the scriptures ascribe our will to god sometimes to ourselves and sometimes to both these statements are easily reconcilable with free will god gives us the light the rule and the strength to choose right and act well and we use them or neglect them saint bernard explains this clearly if he says god works in us to think to will and to perfect what is good 
He does the first without us, the second with us, and the third through us. In sending us good thoughts, he prevents us. In changing our evil will, he joins our consent with his will. In ministering strength to our consent, the interior worker causes our work to be known externally. Assuredly, we cannot prevent ourselves, but he who finds no one good can save no one unless he prevents him with his grace. Grace awakens the free will when it sows good thoughts. Grace heals the will when it changes the affections. Grace strengthens the will to come to action. Grace preserves the will that it may not suffer defection. But this grace works with the will in such a manner as to prevent the will in the first instance and to accompany the will in all the rest, so that the will may work henceforth together with the grace. Thus what is begun by grace alone is perfected both by grace and free will, not working separately, not alternately, but in each good work unitedly. End of Lecture 8, Part 2。Lecture 8, Part 3 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 8 On Justice and Moral Evil Part 3 Although we have long delayed the immediate question of moral evil or sin, you will have seen that each step in our path has advanced us towards it and has been preparing us to enter upon it with a clearer understanding. As moral good is the just order of the will, moral evil or sin is the failure of the will from the law of moral good. It is the defection of the will from due order, right form, or just measure, which produces disorder, deformity, or loss of justice and right proportion. The due order and right conduct of the will take their measure from the light of reason and from the law of God, which represent his eternal justice. Man is made for justice because he is made for God, and justice perfects his nature and brings him to God. He has the form of justice within him as a luminous shadow of the justice of God, and his conscience is the interpreter of that justice and he is just when his will is conformed to that justice. He who hath not the law is a law to himself. The law of justice contains all moral good, and it springs from God's eternal view of the just and essential order of things. Justice is, therefore, the will of God commanding the will of the creature to obey that light of justice which he has implanted in the mind of that creature, or has spoken to him through the word of revelation and the light of faith. God himself, in whose hands all things are, is the authority and the sanction of the law of justice. By obeying the light and authority of God, the will of man is in due order and just conformity and right relationship with the will of God. But whenever he willfully fails from that due order and refuses to conform his will to the light of justice and to measure his conduct by the moral law and to do the will of God, he falls into sin and so into moral disorder. We have said that he falls into sin, which exactly expresses his act because it is a defection and a descent from what is high to what is low, from what is good to what is evil. These defective acts of the will are not only evil because the justice of God forbids them, 
but the justice of God forbids them because they are evil. Yet the divine forbidding of them increases their moral evil, because in sinning against the divine command we offend with greater knowledge and with direct disobedience to the authority of our divine Creator. To put this in another light, the evil of sin consists in turning the will from the unchangeable good, which is the proper good of man, and in turning that same will to that changeable good, which corrupts the soul and perverts the order of justice. Sin is therefore a sliding back and falling off from our good and from the true end of life. When we turn from the law of God, we turn from God himself and turn unlawfully to the creature, giving that will and love to the creature which is due to God. Hence sin is called a debt to justice, and in the Lord's Prayer it is called a debt to God. It is a failure in what we owe to justice, to God, and to ourselves. Or, as our own version of the Lord's Prayer puts it, it is a trespass, that is to say, it is an offensive stepping beyond the bounds of law, justice, and obedience. St. Augustine expresses the whole subject in these terms. The will is a certain middle good. When the will adheres to the universal and unchangeable good, it obtains the first and greatest good of man. But the will sins when it turns away from the universal and unchangeable good and turns to its own or to exterior or to inferior good. The will turns to its own good when it wishes to be in its own power. It turns to exterior good when it wills to make what is another's its own that is, when it wills to have what it has no right to have, and it turns to what is inferior to itself when the will gives itself over to the sensualities of the body from which the man becomes proud, curious, and lascivious. He is taken up with a life that, in comparison with the life devoted to superior good, is death. Yet the providence of God overrules that life and gives to everything its due place and to everyone what he deserves. Yet the things that the sinner gives to his will are not in themselves evil, nor is the free will in itself an evil, but evil consists in the turning of the will from unchangeable to changeable good, in doing what it is not compelled but it acts of its own free movement, and the just and deserved punishment of misery follows. This, then, is the point on which to fix our special attention, that moral evil, or sin, consists in a falling off of the will from the law of justice, which justice leads the will to its true and proper good, and in the falling upon that inferior good which is unworthy and disproportioned to the dignity of our nature and to the greatness of our end, and which disorders, debases, and corrupts our soul. But this requires some further explanation. Justice requires that we love all good, with a love proportioned to its kind, order, place, and degree. Injustice and disorder begin, therefore, when we put inferior good above superior good, and with absurd unreason cleave to it by preference. It is this absurdity of our conduct which lays it open to the satire of men who are not themselves just, for they can see the disproportion of things in their mind which their own wills disregard. This preference given to inferior good is the beginning of all disorder, and it ends in that perversion of the will which places the creature above the creator in our love. 
yet that inferior good is only given us to be used as the means of helping us to our superior good and when we thus use it lawfully and with prudence our will is in its just order but when we make the means the end and forget our true end we fall into the extreme of disorder and there is no justice in us for justice wills that everything should hold its right place due order and proper subordination and the just will is the reflection of this justice moral evil therefore as considered in itself is nothing but a failing and defection of the will from good. Consequently, the fathers have proclaimed with a unanimous voice that evil is nothingness. But it is nothingness where there might be, and ought to be, a great good. And therefore, as evil willfully destroys the good relations of the will towards the greater good, it is injustice. It is injustice towards God, to whom we owe ourselves and all we have. It is injustice towards the light of reason and the light of faith, to which we refuse the obedience of our will. And it is unjust to ourselves, making the soul unjust and unreasonable, and depriving her of the great good for which she is created. It is also unjust to God's other creatures, that were made to serve the justice of God, and that we make to serve us in our sins. It will be gathered from all that has been said that moral evil, which alone is destructive of souls, has its seat in the will. The root of sin is in the evil inclination of the will, for where evil is concerned the proverb is true, that what you intend that you do intention is the beginning of action and complete intention is complete action as far as the will is concerned hence the completion of the intention is the completion of the sin as it decides the moral condition of the will even although the act is but consummated within the soul and has not come out externally the imagination then becomes the field in which the sin is perpetrated. But when the evil disposition or malice of the will breaks out into external acts, they exhibit the force of the evil disposition within, and the malice of the will is apt to become more intense, both through the vehemence of the evil will thrown into the action, and from the rebound of passion awakened by the external act, working up the blind concupiscence of the will to pursue its evil course with greater violence. Another consequence of bringing the internal sin into external acts is but too often to spread the fire of disorder beyond the sinner, working injustice and spreading disorder elsewhere than in the soul, and injuring other souls by scandal, example, or even violence in word or deed. There is even a malice of the will so great that not content with its own disorder, it is inspired by the very pride which engenders that disorder, and which that disorder augments in its turn to level other souls to its own condition, whether of disbelief or immorality. But as the scripture says, Man sees in the face, but God in the heart. Man judges by the external act, and God weighs the internal motive. The internal conscience is closed against the inspection of the courts of human law. Malice is there presumed, and the evil intention is inferred from the outward act. But before the eye of God, and in the court of eternal justice, the whole interior of the man is open, and the extent of his guilt is seen clearly in his intention. Culpability or guiltiness, as St. Thomas observes, is the effect that follows from sin, and which obliges the guilty one to punishment. 
Sin passes as an act, but the effect of that act remains, and that effect is guiltiness. According to human judgment, the guilt must be proved by external acts before it is established and punishment awarded. But according to divine judgment, the guilt is established by the interior act. The proof of the act is recorded in the conscience, and the punishment already begins. Let us consider for a moment what are the first effects of the guilt of evil. There are two objects presented to our will which make it good. The one is the good that is worthy to be sought. The other is the rule by which we seek and by which we obtain that good. This rule is moral order or the good of order which brings us to substantial good. But by deserting the moral good of order and justice, we lose the substantial good which alone can give us peace and happiness. For moral good promises what substantial good gives. And if we love God and do His will, we shall come to His beatitude. The first effect, therefore, of the evil will, and the greatest, is the loss of that justice which promises beatitude. The second is the dreariness and vacancy that comes upon the soul when she finds that she has severed herself from the light of truth and justice and the law of good, and has given herself up to delusion and folly, which degrades her even in her own eyes and fills her with remorse. Losing her subjection to God's rule, for we can only hold to what is above us by subjection, the soul loses her hold of those spiritual cords, those rays of divine light and descents of grace, by which we hold to the will of God, and falls back upon herself to taste her own bitterness, and feel the hollowness, privation, suffering, and misery which follow the desertion of divine good the gnawings of hunger in the defeated appetite for good, and the pangs inflicted by the rebuking conscience, have been fitly called the worm of remorse, the sting of conscience, and the iron bite of sin. Too slothful to bring up the latent power of the will, too craven to meet the specters of delusive temptation with the valor of a high resolve, the will sinks from the light, and the good of the will becomes the captive of concupiscence, and the victim of evil under the mask of good, which only drops off after the evil is accomplished, and the pains of evil have begun. But where a long habit of evil has brought down the vital powers of the soul into a state of insensibility to the light of justice, and the stings of conscience, that insensibility is the numbness and paralysis of death. We cannot better confirm what we have said on the character of evil than by quoting the book on the divine names. Good, it says, is the principle and the object of all wills, for even evil things are done in the expectation of good. No one, however evil, looks for anything but good when he does evil. This shows that evil in itself and by itself has no substance, because every one proposes some good to himself in his evil action, which has only a supposed and fictitious quality. When a being is attributed to evil, it is through the mistake of ascribing one thing to another that does not belong to it. The sinner imagines some good when he contemplates evil. The error is in his own opinion that confounds the good he proposes with the evil that he commits. What he intends is one thing, and what he does is another. But evil can do nothing without a mixture of good, for what has no part or portion of good is nothing. 
evil in satan is his want of likeness and conformity with the supreme good evil in the soul of man is want of conformity with reason and with grace evil in the body is want of conformity with nature this is the reason why moral evil is called iniquity st john says every one who committeth sin committeth iniquity and sin is iniquity iniquity is the want of equity in the will to equalize the soul with the light and law of justice to sum up in the words ascribed to the areopagite evil is privation defect weakness disproportion error it is without object without beauty without life it is without intelligence without reason without perfection without any place of rest it hath no cause it is indefinite it is barren it is empty it is imbecile it is disorderly evil is aimless darksome and void of all being whatsoever this profound writer then lays down the great maxim which has become so famous that good proceeds from one full and absolute cause but evil from many particular defects and he thus explains it whatever is according to nature proceeds from a certain and definite cause but as evil is indefinite and has no certain cause it is not according to nature and what is not according to nature is neither to be found in nature nor in art for true art finds its reason in nature but although evil proceeds from many causes these are not reasons or powers but weaknesses infirmities and defects or they are a mixture of incongruous and discordant things without measure or proportion hence evils are versatile and changeable and they never remain the same they are indefinite uncertain and indeterminable they hurry this way and that to diverse things as indefinite and uncertain as themselves how the will destroys justice in the soul by falling from superior good is thus explained by st augustine sin or iniquity is not the appetite for natural evils but the desertion of the better things the scripture says that every creature of god is good consequently every tree that god planted in paradise was good it was not then to any evil in the nature of the tree to which man gave his appetite when he touched the forbidden fruit but he committed the evil act by deserting what was better the creator was a far greater good than any creature he had made and his authority was not to be abandoned for the sake of touching what god had forbidden him to touch even though what adam touched might itself be good but he hungered for a good in the creature that could only be obtained by deserting his creator who forbade his touching that tree god gave the prohibition to show that the rational soul is not in her own power but that she ought to be subject to god and to keep the order of salvation through obedience which is lost through the evil of disobedience for this reason when god forbade the tree to be touched he called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because when the man touched the tree he experienced the penalties of evil evil therefore consists in using good in an evil way when st paul rebuked the men who worshipped the creature rather than the creator and declared they were condemned in the divine judgment he did not rebuke the creature for that would have been injurious to god but he rebuked the men who use the creature in an evil way whilst giving up what is better 
the works of men are evil as the great doctor elsewhere points out when they are done according to self and not according to god this is the radical disease and the cause of all the evil effects and sufferings that follow for we repeat again and can never repeat too often that we are not made for ourselves but for god that we are no object to ourselves but that god is our final object our justice is not from ourselves but from god our life is not from ourselves but from god when therefore we turn our back on god and our face to the creature as the chief bent of our desire when we attempt to build up a spirit, life, truth, good, and happiness out of the poor, weak, inconstant, disaccordant things that are beneath the soul and designed to be her servants, we fall into a degradation and a turpitude that calumniates the whole plan of our Creator. We grow insolent against God, discard His light, overturn his justice refuse his love break the golden links that bind us to his goodness insult his patience and even repel his ever waiting mercy we set up our petty self in the void we make between heaven and earth to be honored with the love that we owe to the god that made us and to be worshipped with the obscene rites of pride vanity and sin to our unspeakable unreason dishonor and shame for this poor god of our choice is still aching with the pains of want and misery the more sin the less freedom freedom lifts up our will to great and high things sin depresses us to low and mean things when we reflect what self is we must see at once that a man chained to himself cannot be free he is a captive within the narrow crypt of his egotism and enveloped with the darkening shadows thrown off from his pride and sensuality the pathways to the divine truth and eternal good are far above his flight the wings of his spirit both the wing of faith and the wing of love are clogged with the mire of his ways so that neither his heart nor mind can ascend to the regions of truth and justice fastened as with rivets to the things beneath him his will loses its freedom in the clay of his concupiscence and that concupiscence is blind, sensual, and egotistical of the body. A man is corporally free in proportion to the space over which he can freely move, and in which he can freely act. He is mentally free in proportion to the breadth and elevation of the sphere of truth in which he can think he is morally free in proportion to the grandeur and elevation of that justice to which his will can conform its actions he is spiritually free in proportion to the greatness and purity of that good with which his soul is allied but though he has the freedom of responsibility he has no large or generous freedom when with the glue of concupiscence his will cleaves to himself and through himself to the base things of this lower world first to one and then to another the bond slave rather than the master of what was ordained for his service so that his will is neither truly free nor luminous nor elevated nor pure how is such a will to be healed and purified not by the amputation of what belongs to its nature nor by covering over its infirmity but by rectifying its injustice and by receiving a new justice and a new life from heaven put off according to your former conversation the old man who is corrupted according to the desire of error 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, who according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. The new man, the healer of the old, is Christ. Let us once more hear St. Augustine, and so conclude. Evil is not removed by the taking away of any part of our existing nature, nor by adding another nature to man, but by healing and rectifying what is vitiated and depraved in him. The will becomes truly free when it is no longer the slave of vice or sin. Such it was when God first gave it, but when the true freedom of the will is lost, God, who gave that freedom, can alone restore it. Hence truth hath said, If the Son shall set you free, then shall you be truly free. And if he had said, If the Son shall heal you, then shall you be truly healed. For he who sets free is he who heals. End of Lecture 8, Part 3lecture nine part one of the endowments of man by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture nine on penal evil or punishment part one tribulation and anguish on every soul of man that worketh evil romans chapter two verse nine we have seen that natural evil is nothing but the limitation of good. We have also seen that the overwhelming amount of natural evil has been the result of moral evil or sin, and that it bears upon it the character of punishment. We may also say that the limitation of natural good, which has followed after sin, is in many respects a providential and a merciful dispensation, forasmuch as it has made this present life less attractive, has put man himself under the discipline of labor, and has greatly diminished the resources of sin, however much remains. Could we have known man and the earth in the happy state of innocence, and then our present state, and have been able to make the comparison between them, we should have wanted no proof of the deterioration and degradation which the sin of man has brought upon the creation. Adam alone had this woeful vision of the changed state of things before him during his long sojourn on the deteriorated earth, until his bones were laid, if we believe the Hebrew tradition, in the mound of Calvary. As sin is a defection of the will, it is not visible to mortal eyes, but the results of sin are everywhere visible, both in the children of Adam and in the inferior creation, which, as it was made for man, through the providence that rules over both, partakes ever of his fortunes. The tradition of the fall of man from a golden age is so universal that it may be almost considered as a part of human conscience, as penal evil is both the natural consequence and the just punishment of moral evil, that is, of the sin of created wills, we are brought to the inevitable conclusion which both the natural instincts and the religious sense of mankind confirm, that either directly or indirectly, sin is the original cause, the ever fertile and flowing source of all the evils and calamities by which the race of man is afflicted and made to suffer. So long as man was innocent, the goodness and benignity of God alone appeared. In his fatherly providence he exercised that affluent justice towards his own eternal plans that stand for ever before his vision, and he filled up by degrees his own magnificent plan of creation. 
with the profusion of his gifts, God advanced the first good of his creation to better things, and what was lower in the creation was raised to higher states of good to fulfill its ends. But when sin broke out from the will of man, and this moral disorder deranged the whole order of the divine plan until it seemed without a remedy, the retributive justice of God burst forth from the heavens to regulate evil with punishment. That retributive justice descends with sorrowing heart and a breast of anguish upon the self-elated and rebellious children of God. The genius, as it were, of pain and privation, it descends to admonish, to chastise, to deprive the evil will of its strength in evil, lest that evil become gigantic and portentous, to drive back the evil will from evil with the miseries engendered by evil, and to bring back the evil will to good through the mercy that accompanies chastisement. But if all chastisement, with all the tender touches of mercy that come to open the heart with its visitation, fail to soften the hardness and subdue the swelling of the rebel heart, if the malice of sin is ungratefully fostered against God to the end, then, as chastisement has utterly failed to conquer the obdurate evil, justice must change the mercy of chastisement to that inevitable punishment which, to preserve the due order of things, must separate unchangeable evil from unchangeable good for everlasting. But this is not half the account of that justice which came upon man after his fall from God. Having lost the principle of justice by the moral failure of his will from its supporting power, having lost, I say, that principle of justice which God has implanted by grace in his nature, and by fidelity to which his nature would have kept its order and just relationship with God as his final end, all chastisements must ever fail to bring even one soul to God, unless a new justice come from heaven and ordain him towards God anew, taking the place of that justice which he lost in paradise. With that justice, therefore, which is due from goodness to evil, with that justice by which the divine goodness imposes an order upon evil suited to its evil character, there comes forth from the divine bosom another and a superabounding justice with the magnificence of a superabounding power that crowns the divine plan of human restoration with infinite mercy. In this new order of justice, mightier and diviner than the first, God the Son takes human nature to himself from a pure source. And he by whom man was created, by whom he is illuminated, and who is himself the most perfect and innocent justice, shall expiate the sins of man with an infinite satisfaction through sufferings inflicted upon him by injustice and sin. The punishment that regulates evil is in itself an order of good, because it comes of good, and regulates evil for the sake of good. This is exemplified in human justice, which is an imperfect imitation of divine justice. Human justice is a good and provident regulation of evil for the sake of good through the instrumentality of punishment. It so far imitates the divine justice that it always looks to an evil will as the source of the evil that it punishes. St. Paul, therefore, says of the minister of social justice, He is God's minister to thee for good. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, 
an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Every man owes loyalty and good conduct to the society of which he is a member. But if instead of doing good he does evil to society, if he troubles its order with disorder, if he disturbs its rights with injustice, he owes a debt of justice to the common good, to expiate his evil with punishment, that his disorder may be rectified by another kind of order, imposed upon him against his will. But if the evil he commits is a mortal offense destructive of society or its members, and is therefore beyond a temporal remedy, the good of society demands that he be cut off from it by exile, death, or isolation among like criminals, apart from the good members of society. The justice of man has therefore its two orders of punishment, like the justice of God. The one, a temporal chastisement in vindication of justice, directed to the amendment and recovery of the criminal, the other, a final separation from the good, both for the vindication of justice and to protect the good from incurable evil. The prerogative of mercy in the sovereign power upon amendment is again an imitation of the divine mercy, which restores the penitent to favor. Every law of God commands good in forbidding evil. It holds forth good as the reward of well-doing, and threatens evil as the consequence of evil-doing, that the fear of evil may be the beginning of good. Yet God leaves not our weak nature to struggle with divine laws, but gives divine help to reach their divine order, and the most help to those who desire and seek it most. With the appetite for good, he has implanted the fear of evil and the dread of punishment in the soul of man, that whilst the love of good may draw him to good, the fear of punishment may deter him from evil. But the divine warnings of punishment can no more be a delusion than the divine promises of reward. They are no mockery. Man is free. God cannot lie. In the hand of divine justice, the punishment of evil is the essential counterpart to the reward of good. It is so in the very reason of things, and is known to all minds, and is felt by all consciences. We are the architects of our own fortune, whether good or bad. And when we look at the two sides of justice, what special beatitude can be expected for the just soul if no especial misery awaits the unjust soul? Let the light of eternal truth but shine upon us, and even from the sufferings of sinners in this world will it show us that no one can desert God without sinking into a misery. Let but the light from the eternal good shine upon us, and it will show us how all good is in God, and that whoever leaves God must depart into evil. But evil is itself the punishment of evil. Let the light from the divine good but illuminate our darkness, and we shall see that there were no other evil to follow the desertion of that good. The loss of that good alone is the greatest of evils, and bitterest of punishments. O thou divine and incomprehensible reason, give to our reason thy gift, the light to see how great is the good of a rational soul. So great is this good, that when the soul neither enjoys God, nor holds just relations with him, she must be miserable. So true is this, to such a demonstration has it reached even in this life, that we have now whole schools of men, who after rejecting both God and their own souls in the name of philosophy, have proclaimed to the world 
that life is nothing but hopeless bitterness and misery. Thus fearfully they have proved by experience what the wise have taught without experience. When David arose from his sin and looked back upon the sufferings it had brought upon him, he exclaimed, O God, who is like to thee? How great troubles thou hast shown me, many and grievous! On which St. Augustine comments from a like bitter experience, Most justly, O thou proud one, thou art made to God's image, and wouldst be the perverse imitator of God. Whilst deserting thy good, thou wouldst have thy good still with thee. But God tells thee, if it were well with thee after parting with me, it would become evident that I am not thy good. But if God be good, the supreme good, and thy good, what canst thou find in abandoning thy God but evil? If God is thy happiness, what canst thou find in leaving thy God but misery? Come back from thy misery to God and say, O God, who is like to thee? How great troubles thou hast shown me, many and grievous. No one can conquer the laws of the Almighty. Each man must pay his debts to the divine justice. We must either do justice or suffer justice. We must either offer to God the fruits of the good we have received or we must lose the good we have neglected and abused. Nor can the least delay be tolerated between guilt and the beginning of punishment, because the beauty of universal justice cannot suffer disorder for a moment. The evil of the instant is avenged on the instant, however secretly, by privation and remorse whilst the open judgment is preparing that will bring the bitter sense of misery to the common knowledge of all men. As quick as the change from sleep to waking is the passage from sin to suffering, because the blessed state of justice is a good so exceedingly great that no one can suffer the loss of it without finding instant misery. In this present time God comes in secret and silent ways, both to the heart of the just and the heart of the unjust man. But he will not be always silent, not always secret. Much the greater part of the rewards of the just are at the present in secret, and much the greater part of the punishments of the unjust are at present in secret. Who are the just of heart? They who humbly, peacefully, and submissively endure the evils of the world, and do not accuse God because of them. Rare birds are these, but beautiful as rare, soaring with the wings of thought above this world, and resting their spirit on the world above. If they are so few, it is because most men when they do good, praise themselves, in their own breast at least, and when they do evil, they complain, and complain unjustly, and this complaint is an implicit accusation of God. But in thus winding round their self-love, and coiling a defense round their unjust heart, they reveal the depravity within them, for it is certainly unjust, and if unjust, depraved, to praise ourselves for the good that God gives us, as it is depraved to accuse God by our complaints of the evils we have done ourselves. But when a man uncoils from his self-love and turns from injustice to justice, from himself to God, he will then praise God for what is good in him and accuse himself for what is evil in him. And when his own heart is right, then he will know how good is the God of Israel to all who are right of heart. He cannot, however, be right in his own heart if he thinks that unjust men are happy, 
for whoever thinks that unjust men are happy must himself be ignorant of what it is to be happy. Plato speaks like a Christian where he says that virtue is the beauty of the soul, but that beauty is difficult. St. Augustine expresses the same thought from a higher point of view. Justice, he says, is true and sovereign beauty. You will never see that beauty where you find injustice. What is in all respects just is in all respects beautiful. Savonarola, in his Triumph of the Cross, puts it in this way. If you take two persons equally beautiful by nature, even in the judgment of wicked men, the holiest will be the most beautiful. The first penal effect of sin is the privation and loss of that spiritual beauty which is the splendor resulting from the inward grace, truth, purity, and harmony of the soul, a beauty that radiates into the features and conduct unconsciously, and which inspires even unjust men with a trust in that soul and with the charm of her excellence. But the first penalty of sin is the internal discord trouble and distress that comes upon the soul with the consciousness of deformity and the effort to conceal the inward change most commonly in vain and how often with our first parents does the pride and shame that seek concealment of the evil lead to excusings fencings and maskings of the soul's condition that falsifies the spirit and destroys the habit of sincerity. When the will of man is destroyed by sin, and by destroying the good of his nature, the central principle of life is disordered, and the force that rules life is weakened, pain and trouble follow this weakness and disorder as a necessary consequence. As the soul is the vital principle of the body as well as its ruler, Weakness, disorder, and the loss of vital power must necessarily follow in the body. As the body is an organized mixture of earthly elements, the feeblest of substances and nearest to nothingness, immortality could never have been natural to man. It was a supernatural and divine gift to our first parents. But by sin the divine gift was lost, and by sin the due subjection of the body to the soul was lost. As an effect cannot be greater than its cause, the cause of our corporal condition is the corporal condition of those from whom it is derived. We therefore inherit their mortality, and with that mortality we inherit the weakness, disorder, and lusting of the flesh against the spirit, which are the results of rebellion against our Creator. Penal evil or punishment is in its nature afflictive both on account of sin and in vindication of justice. As sin is against the will of God, and as it is a violation of justice, the punishment of sin in the order of justice is against the will, or at least against the inclination of the guilty one. As punishment follows sin, it is either the privation of the good for which man was made, and which he has abandoned and forfeited by his sin, or it is the sensible pain and suffering inflicted upon his nature because of sin. The first is the pain of loss, the second is the pain of sense. As man is made for God and for union with God through the beatific vision, by deadly sin he separates himself from God and is deprived of the beatific vision of God, which is the final happiness of man. This pain of loss which is the most grievous of all punishments, comes not by the act of God, but by the act of man, which God in his justice permits. 
the pain of sense, is partly the direct consequence of the disorder that follows sin, and partly the act of divine justice, afflicting the sinner in vindication of eternal justice. It is the man who corrupts the action of his will by his sin, but the pain which punishes sin corrupts the man. We cannot better illustrate these principles and the whole subject of punishment, and especially the distinction between the pain of loss and the pain of sense, than by giving a full exposition of the case of infants who depart this world without the grace of regeneration, and to give the exposition the greatest theological weight we shall follow the larger explanation which St. Thomas has given of the question in his special treatise on evil. Pope Innocent III says in the Decretals that the penalty due to original sin is the privation of the beatific vision. St. Thomas lays down his fundamental principle from St. Gregory the Great that the mind, when estranged from God, cannot see the divine light as it is, because that mind is captive under condemnation, and in this state of captivity that light is concealed from the mind. He then argues as follows, It is a much greater thing to obtain a great good with external help than only to obtain a little good without that external help. For instance, it is a greater thing to obtain solid and substantial health with the help of the physician than to have but feeble health without that external help. As a rational creature, man excels all the inferior creatures in this, that he is capable of the supreme good through enjoying the beatific vision of God. But the principles of his nature are not sufficient for obtaining the divine vision. He stands in need of the external help of divine grace. This external help is necessary to every rational creature to dispose and to prepare his nature, to advance that nature towards God and to make it well-pleasing to him before the rational creature can come to the perfect beatitude. St. Paul, therefore, says, The grace of God, life everlasting. But beside that divine help which is needful for every rational creature, whether angel or man, to make him pleasing to God and fit for union with him, man himself requires another supernatural help, because of his composite nature. For man is composed of body and soul, of a sensual as well as an intelligent nature. And when these are left to themselves, the body with its senses weighs upon the mind and hinders its free ascent to the things that are above his nature. This help was original justice a grace through which the mind was subject to God and the inferior powers as well as the body were completely subjected to the mind, so that the reason of man suffered no hindrance in seeking God and in advancing towards him. As the body is for the soul and the sense for the understanding, this help of original justice which subjected the body to the soul and the sensitive powers to the intelligent mind, is a certain predisposition of the man towards that other divine help of grace which prepares the mind to see God and the soul to enjoy God. When therefore any one casts that help away from him by his sin, which prepares him for his good, he deserves to lose that very good for obtaining which he was prepared, and the loss of that good is his proper punishment. The proper punishment of original sin, therefore, is the loss of grace, and consequently the loss of the divine vision 
for which man was ordained by the grace of God. But everything that fails from its final end is an utter failure, and is altogether in vain. And from this it follows that if man could not reach his beatitude, he would become an utter failure, and God would have made him in vain. To prevent his becoming such a failure through his birth in original sin, God prepared a remedy from the beginning of the human race, in the divine mediator between man and God, the God and man Christ Jesus. And through faith in him and the sacrament of faith, the obstacle of original sin might be removed, and he might be set free from the vanity of failure. In the 88th Psalm, David asks of God, Remember what my substance is, for hast thou made all the children of men in vain? Upon which the gloss observes from St. Augustine that David prayed for the incarnation of the Son, who is to take flesh from his substance, to deliver men from their vanity. End of Lecture 9, Part 1Lecture 9, Part 2 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 9 On Penal Evil or Punishment, Part 2 The soul of the child that dies without baptism is not, however, deprived of the divine vision because of Adam's personal sin but because that child is itself infected with original sin, contracted through the descent of its body from that first parent. And to use the exact words of St. Thomas, the culpability that attaches to the soul is derived from the flesh to the soul. For as St. Paul teaches, by one man sin came into the world, and by sin death and so death passed upon all men in whom all have sinned. If we consider the privation of the enjoyment of God as it respects the good that is lost, it is the greatest of privations. But as it respects the nature of the soul herself, we must take another measure to represent the divine justice. When we consider the soul in herself, the severest punishment is that which deprives her of what belongs to her nature and is due to her nature. It is a greater punishment to deprive a man of his natural inheritance, for example, than to deprive him of a crown that is not due to him. Viewed in this light, the privation of the divine vision without any punishment that affects his own nature is the mildest of punishments, because the divine vision is a good that is altogether above and beyond his nature. It is not due to his nature, and the loss of it takes nothing from his nature. But the pains of sense are not due as a punishment to original sin alone. They are only due to personal sin to sin committed by the free will of the guilty one. As original sin is not actual sin, as it is derived from the will of another, it is not subjected to sensible suffering. This distinction, although not formerly expressed, is clearly intimated in the words of Christ our Lord to Nicodemus. Amen, amen, I say to thee, Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The privation of the vision of God is here plainly pointed out as the consequence of death without the grace of baptism. It has been acutely observed that wherever our divine teacher speaks of sensible sufferings to be inflicted on the guilty, 
he always makes some reference to actual or personal sins, as where he says, Depart ye cursed into everlasting fire, for I was hungry, and ye gave me not to eat, and the rest. It has also been observed that in none of the apostolic writings is there mention of positive sufferings inflicted on those who have not been guilty of actual sins. St. Gregory Nazianzen, a man of such authority that St. Augustine called him the mouth of the church, in his fortieth oration, which is expressly on holy baptism, distinguishes three classes of persons who die without baptism, those who despise the sacrament, those who omit it through their own negligence, and those infants who die without baptism through the negligence of others. And he thus pronounces what each will incur after death. I account it will be that the first of these will suffer punishment, both for their crimes and for their contempt of baptism, that those who depart without baptism through no depravity of soul, but through their negligence, will also suffer punishment, but of a lighter kind. But the last mentioned, that is infants, will neither receive the heavenly glory, nor endure torments from the just judge. For although they were not sealed with baptism, they were yet without malice, and rather suffered this loss than were the cause of it. He who deserves no punishment is not on that account entitled to honor, as he who is unworthy of honor is not on that account deserving of punishment. St. Gregory of Nyssa also says, in his oration on infants dying without baptism, the premature death of infants demonstrates that in ceasing from this life they will neither suffer pain nor grief. Celebrated are the words of St. Bernard in his third sermon on the resurrection. What doth God hate, what doth he punish, but self-will? Let self-will cease, and hell will not exist. Against what does that fire rage? but against self-will. Although St. Augustine had great difficulty in defining what the state of infants who depart without baptism would be, yet he says, Who can doubt but that it will be the lightest of condemnations? And elsewhere he says that their penalty will be the mildest of all. St. Thomas has shown the reasonableness of this doctrine on three grounds. In the first place, it is obvious that the penalty must be in proportion to the culpability, as Isaiah says, In measure against measure, when it shall be cast off, thou shalt judge it. But the pain of sense is not a measure proportioned or due to original sin, because it is not a sin of the will or of the person, but a sin of nature which ought therefore to be punished with the natural penalty of privation, but not with the personal penalty of suffering. Sensible punishment falls upon the person because of his own passions, to which he unjustly yields himself. But the pain of loss is a penalty upon nature, because it is deprived of grace and original justice without which the vision of God cannot be given, because it cannot be given to mere nature unprepared by grace and justice to receive it. Moreover, this law and order of punishment is proclaimed in the Apocalypse. Render to her as she also hath rendered to you, and double unto her double according to her works as much as she hath glorified herself and lived in delicacies, so much torment and sorrow give ye to her. Here the pains of sense correspond with actual sins committed willfully, whether spiritual sins of pride and self-glorification, or sensual sins expressed by living in delicacies. 
but infants have no responsible will that can be the cause of sin. In the second place, the pains of sense are not due to a mere habitual disposition or inclination of nature. Neither God nor man punish men because they are by nature inclined to steal, but only because they have stolen or have had the intention of stealing. Again, where there is an habitual defect, there must be some loss proportioned to that defect. For example, a man without education is not prepared for sacred orders. But the unbaptized infant is under the defect of being without grace or original justice, and is therefore unprepared for the vision of God. But as the child has only the habitual disposition to concupiscence in its nature, without any actual concupiscence in the will, such as is found in those who have come to the age of reason, the pains of sense are not proportioned to their state or due to them if they die without the grace of regeneration, but only the pain of loss. In the third place, the pain of sense corresponds with the conversion of the soul to inferior and changeable good as the chief object of desire, whilst the pain of loss corresponds with the aversion of the soul from God. In actual sins of the will, there is both this aversion from God and this conversion to the creature in place of God, and therefore both the pain of loss and the pain of sense are due to them. But in original sin alone, there is not this turning of the will from God to the creature, but only a state of nature alienated from God, because the soul is destitute of original justice. One question yet remains to complete this inquiry. Are those who die in no other sin than what they have inherited by nature subject to grief and sorrow because of their loss? Or have they a natural happiness in their place of exile? Here, as in the whole of this question, we may accept the guidance of St. Thomas. Affliction is injustice due to the delight that is taken in sin. But there is no such selfish delight in original sin, and consequently no grief or sorrow is due to its presence. Then those who die in their infancy without the gift of faith have their minds limited to natural knowledge after they are freed from the body. They cannot have that supernatural knowledge which is given to faith so that they know not what that divine beatitude and glory is which the saints enjoy, and which is far above the natural knowledge of the creature. St. Paul teaches us much when he says, It is written that eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered the heart of man, what things God hath prepared for them that love him but God hath revealed them by his Spirit. Those, therefore, who have not the supernatural knowledge implanted in this life by faith cannot grieve for the loss of what they do not know or desire that of which they are ignorant. They are not without the natural knowledge belonging to separated souls, and from that the soul knows that she was created for beatitude and that this beatitude consists in reaching the perfect good. But what that beatitude is, or in what that good consists, is a knowledge beyond nature, and only revealed to faith. As the souls of these children are deprived of the good of faith, their knowledge of the supreme and final good is vague and general. They have not the specific light and special knowledge that can cause them to grieve at their loss. As those who are born to a low estate do not grieve at not being in exalted station, and as the children of rude races do not grieve for the want of civilization 
but are contented with their lot in life, so these aliens from divine beatitude enjoy the goods of nature without grieving for what is above their knowledge and aspirations. It must also be observed that those who quit this life in actual and personal sin have reached the age of responsibility, and they consequently had an aptitude in themselves for obtaining eternal life, which they have neglected and abused. But infants have no such aptitude in themselves. They are dependent on others for the grace of baptism, and there is therefore no equality between the two cases. That a child should receive the grace of eternal life through the will of another before it can act for itself is a superabounding and exceeding grace, and the want of such a grace cannot grieve those who are not themselves capable of seeking such a gift. Even so do the great saints receive wonderful gifts that ordinary Christians do not know, and for the want of which they do not grieve. St. Thomas therefore concludes that although children dying without baptism are separated from God and are deprived of union with him through his glorious vision, they are not utterly separated from him as partakers of natural good, and they may thus enjoy, as from God, a natural knowledge and a natural happiness. We have dwelt upon this abstruse but most interesting question at some length, not only for the sake of the instruction it conveys, but for the sake of the light which the principles here brought together gives to the whole question of penal evil. Let us now turn our consideration to the punishment of that actual sin for which the will of man is responsible. St. Augustine justly observes that if all men kept themselves to the just measure and order of their nature, there would be no evil. But if men will use the good they have in an evil way, even then they can never conquer the will of God. For God knows how to dispose of the unjust in the order of justice. If through their unjust will men will make an evil use of his good, in the might of his justice God will ordain for them what their evil deserves. He will ordain those to justice who have ordained themselves to sin. Again he says, To the most excellent of creatures, to rational souls, God has granted that they cannot be corrupted against their wills. They cannot be corrupted so long as they keep their obedience to the Lord their God and adhere to his unchangeable beauty. But if they will not keep their obedience, they are corrupted by their own will in their sins, and against their own will they will be corrupted in their punishment. For God is so great a good that no one who abandons him can be in a good state, and the rational soul is so great a good that she cannot be happy with anything less than God. This is the reason why sinners are ordained to punishment, as this ordinance is at disagreement with their nature, it is punishment, but as it accords with their guilt, it is justice. The justice of God is inseparable from his goodness, for as we have already shown, his justice is the perfect order of his perfect goodness. God is not as man that he should suffer division. His divine attributes enter into each other and are one in their operation. It is most important to keep this in view lest by thinking in a weak human way, we should set up the goodness of God against his justice, as if the one annihilated the other, although the justice of God is the very order that perfects his goodness. In these days of little faith, small reason, and great sensuality, 
this weak way of getting rid of the divine justice is not only frequent among men but they even flatter themselves with a notion that it proves their own goodness of heart against this weakness we shall adduce the solid argument of tertullian with some expansion nevertheless of his severe brevity for the sake of its easier comprehension from god alone he says can we learn how he is infinitely good and how in virtue of that goodness he is infinitely just he is infinitely good in all that is his own and infinitely just with respect to all that is ours if man had never sinned in virtue of his innocent nature he would have only known god as he is infinitely good but having lost his innocence from the necessity of the case he must suffer from the justice of god yet god is equally good in being just he exhibits the same justice the same order of good which is always one and the same though in a twofold way in helping the good and in punishing the wicked in both these exercises of justice he consults nothing but good for in the one case he is the rewarder of good and in the other he is the vindicator of good good by nature and good to man from the beginning of his existence god is only severe where the conduct of the creature calls for severity the goodness of god is inborn in him from eternity his severity is but the accidental justice that is called forth to regulate the evil of which his creature is the only cause what belongs to god's nature is the justice of good but what is applied to the wilful error of the creature is the good of justice if the nature of god be such that he cannot leave his goodness unexercised the evil cause cannot escape his justice as he is the unchangeable truth how can he dissemble the severity that is justly due to evil as we must confess that evil deeds are unjust from the same reason and truth we are compelled to admit that the good of justice must be greater in proportion as the evil of injustice becomes greater justice is not only good but it is the protector and the defense of good for unless goodness were regulated by justice it would cease to be good and would become unjust yet nothing is good that is unjust because justness is essential to good every act of justice is therefore the procuring of good whether it be in judging evil or in condemning evil or in punishing evil for even to condemn evil is to punish evil when we consider how many allurements are put forth by evil how urgent those allurements are and how destructive of good who could despise the spreading of this evil who could leave it unpunished without encouraging the destruction of good although the threatenings of our creator strike us with fear and terror yet they scarcely keep us from evil what then would it be were god not to threaten us with punishment what if those threatenings were not the very truth of his justice can that justice be evil that will not suffer evil can we deny that to be good which protects all good who can be the author of good but he who is always demanding and exacting good who can be a stranger to evil but he who is always resisting evil who is the adversary of evil but he who is the assailer of evil who is the assailer of evil but he who punishes evil god is all good because he acts in all things even in the punishment of evil for the sake of good the law of justice which embraces all the virtues under the dominion of charity 
is therefore the true order of the right relations between the soul and God. Justice puts the man in harmony with the object and end of his being. Obedience to the order of justice leads him to God. The desertion of this order is the desertion of God. A grave and deliberate violation of justice in any one point is a breach of the whole principle of order and obedience. A violation of the principles of justice and charity and consequently it is a desertion of God. St. James has expressed this truth in saying that whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, is become guilty of all. In deserting the law of justice and charity, he sins against the light of God, and is unfaithful to the grace of God. In deserting God, he commits treason against the divine sovereignty, contumacy against the divine majesty, ingratitude against the divine goodness, and is an abuser of God's prodigal gifts. He deserts God by his own free act and choice, and if he perseveres in this desertion to the end of his life, the power of choice is no longer left him, he has forever made his choice of apostasy from the infinite and eternal good for which he was made. It is final, it is irrevocable. There is a gulf between that soul and God that can never be passed over, because the communion between that soul and God has been utterly broken down by the soul herself. It belongs to the essential order of eternal good that it cannot admit of union or admixture with the malice and disorder of evil. In the judging of the unjust soul, the will is the fact. The acts of the will are the evidence. The light of the soul is the law. God and the conscience are the witnesses. Separated from the world and self-condemned, separated from God and condemned of God, the everlasting soul of the sinner, departing in his sins, can only be consigned to the place and company where malice, darkness, and disorder are everlasting. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and ye gates thereof be very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have done two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Where, then, is the mercy of God? The mercy of God is everywhere, and is everywhere exalted above his judgments. Even in hell there is mitigation of the full rigor of justice, although the hour of grace is past and conversion is no longer possible. But who in this world can fathom the depths of the evil of separation from God? Who can open the gates of justice and explore the miseries of a soul left to herself? What is it to be a living subject vacant and void, because deprived of her living object? The whole nature of the soul is there, with all her appetites, powers, passions, and cravings, yet without their objects, thirsting forever for a good that can never come, yet never consumed because immortal, longing for death, and it cometh not, the soul is immortal in immortal pains, and the wicked torment the wicked in their malice, as they have done on earth, so more potently where all is despair of good. The mercy of God is over all the earth, a mercy wide-working, superabounding, wonderful. In nothing is that mercy more plentifully shown than in the chastisement sent to correct the errors of the sinful race of man, or in the adversities raised up to purify and strengthen the just of heart. Yet the perverse are blind to them, 
and the men who fear God alone read them aright. In his pity to his children, the wrath of God comes from his mercy, chastising but to spare. He blinds the raging persecutor and strikes him down, that he may enlighten him into an apostle. Some he chastises with their own sins, that he may bring them to repentance. For many are the scourges of the sinner. Some he beats down from the pride and tumor of their souls with sharp and keen humiliations. For God resists the proud. Some he scourges with the creatures they have abused, that they may return to their Creator. For he chastiseth every son whom he receiveth. God knows far better than we do of what we stand in need, and his severe remedies are the medicines of his charity. It is among the richest ordinations of God's providence that souls profusely help each other, some with intention, some without intention, and some against intention. Hence souls obtain great help and profit both from the good and the wicked. They are moved to good by seeing the reward of the good, and are deterred from evil by seeing how the wicked are punished. The punishment of evil works are therefore for good as well as the rewards of well-doing. Then the evil, with their evil deeds, bring the virtues of the good into exercise in a thousand ways, giving them a great, a difficult, and a laborious field for their exercise. There is not a virtue, be it of prudence, justice, fortitude, or temperance, that is not called forth, put to its trial, and consolidated by the opposition of evil. There is not a theological virtue, be it faith, hope, or charity, that is not raised to a higher power, and that may not become heroic, through the opposition of error and the trials and persecutions in all shapes that the humble endure from the proud, the charitable from the uncharitable, and the godly from the godless. But the final result is an accumulation of the wealth of virtue and sanctity in souls, such as without the opposition of evil would not exist, or would only exist in a much inferior degree. The good of the just souls rises greatly, therefore, in degree and quality by their overcoming evil with good and holy souls owe much of their force and elevation to their combat with evil. Here is the place to consider whether the wonderful providence of God that disposes of the evil which man originates has not so managed the results of evil for the triumph of good and the just, as to equal, if not to surpass, the amount of good and sanctity taken altogether which might have existed had evil never been known. This is a large and profound question, which we hint at rather than attempt to solve. But here are a few points for consideration. First, the accumulation of virtue in one soul rises to much greater dignity, sanctity, and power by reason of its unity than if the same amount of virtue were distributed through a number of less virtuous souls. For the virtues and moral powers rise and multiply each other into higher degrees of sanctity when united in one soul, in proportion to the temptations overcome, the provocations mastered, and the obstacles vanquished. The faith, the magnanimity, the humility, the generous charity that are perfected in the martyr, the confessor of faith, the afflicted, the pastor who gives his life for his flock, the sister of charity, and in all the just, patient, and generous souls of every class in life, accomplish the sanctifying of the soul as much through the combat with evil 
and by the redressing of evil, as by their inward piety. But a single soul raised by the combat with evil to heroic virtue and sanctity is a host in herself in comparison with a thousand, and it may be then ten thousand, who might live but an ordinary life of piety with no evil to contend with or to rectify. Abraham alone by his fidelity amidst an evil generation arose to such a friendship with God that he almost overbalanced the evil of five criminal cities. Had there been but five just men in all those five cities, God would have spared them for the sake of Abraham. How long did God spare the kings and people of Judah for the sake of David his servant? Marvelous is the history of what the saints and just men of all times have accomplished, both on earth in combating, rectifying, and redressing evil, and with God in averting his just anger and in obtaining his mercy and compassion over the doers of evil. They overcame evil with good, both in themselves and in the world around them. What a picture has St. Paul given us of the prophets, and to what a vast number of the heroes of the gospel will that picture apply? Who by faith conquered kingdoms, wrought justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, recovered strength from weakness, became valiant in battle? put to flight the armies of foreigners. Women received their dead raised to life again. But others were racked, not accepting deliverance, that they might find a better resurrection. And others had trial of mockeries and stripes, moreover also of bands and prisons. They were stoned, they were cut asunder, they were tempted, they were put to death by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being in want, distressed, afflicted, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts, in mountains, and in dens, and in caves of the earth, and all these being approved for the testimony of faith. These are God's heroes, doing all things and sacrificing all things with a great spirit, and a high soul of sanctity for the cause of God. How much might this vivid picture of the contest of justice with evil be filled up from other great traits in the heroes of Christ? But enough has been said to show how the great virtues and sanctities are wrought out through the presence of great evils. Secondly, if evils had not existed, the greater part of the great virtues would have had no object for their exercise. Faith, hope, and charity, with religion and piety, would still have been the virtues to bring man to perfection. But where would have been the earthly and human obstacles by which they are tried and brightened? Where would be the persecutions in all their forms and shapes, by which these virtues are raised to the heroic degree. But patience, fortitude, magnanimity, the combat with self, the mortification of the senses, the higher exercises of prudence and temperance, justice to the unjust, charity not only to the unkind, but to the needy and the suffering, the defense of purity, the endurance of wrong, the vast efforts which the good make to rectify and redress evil, half the object of all our prayers, and a thousand other causes of good, which the presence of evil calls into action, would have no existence. Thirdly, when we consider the amount of moral good that is caused by the presence of evil, and consider how much higher that good rises in the souls of the just 
through the trials occasioned by evil and the force of good will brought out through the generous conflicts with evil when again we consider how many of the nobler virtues owe their very existence to the evil which they have to endure or to surmount it becomes indeed a grave question whether god has not drawn more moral good out of mankind at large by the permission of evil than if evil had never existed for however great and widespread that evil may be especially in times like ours we must take all the periods of time together and remember that great trials of evil always produce great virtues and that the accumulation of great sanctity and virtue in individual souls and their great spiritual works and influences counterbalance in the whole sum of sanctity to a prodigious extent the sum of sanctity that might have been however more widely diffused had there been no virtues created through the presence of evil to overcome evil with good what is the patience and long-suffering of god but his long-abiding mercy over his willful and wayward children what a picture st paul gives us of this long-abiding mercy or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and patience and long-suffering knowest thou not that the benignity of god leadeth thee to penance it is not god then who hardens the sinner but the sinner who hardens himself until his iniquity so deadens his interior affections that they can no longer receive the impress of the divine likeness but continues st paul according to thy hard and impenitent heart thou treasurest up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the just judgment of god who will render to every one according to his works to them indeed who according to patience and good work seek glory and honour and incorruption eternal life but to them that are contentious and obey not the truth but give credit to iniquity wrath and indignation tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that worketh evil it is not god then who stores up wrath but man who treasures up the causes of wrath within himself and who increases the store of tribulation and anguish with every new iniquity end of lecture nine part two Lecture 9, Part 3 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 9 On Penal Evil or Punishment Part 3 To sum up briefly what we have thus far said, in the doctrine of St. Thomas, the rewards agree with the will because they are the good of which we are in search. But punishments disagree with the will, because they are the evils against which the will revolts. Sin comes from the will. The punishment rebounds against the will because of sin. Hence St. Thomas argues that sin must be an incomparably greater evil than punishment we endure a less evil to prevent a greater evil we suffer the amputation of a limb to save the body but god who is the provident protector of all good sends punishment in his wisdom to prevent the growth of the greater evil of sin which is destructive of all good sin is evil by its native malice punishment is but the consequence of that evil and not merely that sensible punishment which deprives the man of corporal good, but that spiritual punishment which is the privation of light, of order, of grace, 
of beauty and of glory it is not punishment that makes us evil but the sin that deserves punishment for as the will is good through the good use of its gifts it is made evil through the evil use of them and punishment deprives us of the good things that we have used in an evil manner man is the author of sin god is the ordainer of punishment punishment is either the privation of good that he has given or of good that he has promised whether it be created good such as we have by nature or uncreated good such as the beatific vision but the whole malice of evil is in the sin not in the punishment because sin is opposed to the uncreated good that is to god himself it is also opposed to the fulfillment of the divine will that is to the whole rule of good and it is likewise opposed to the love of god to that divine love whereby we love the divine good both for its own sake and for the sake of becoming partakers of that good sin is therefore opposed to all good and to the whole order of good and when we have thus far penetrated its character it becomes clear and evident that sin is not because of punishment but that punishment is because of sin but besides the general opposition in which all sin whatsoever is opposed to the universal good each sin in particular is opposed to some particular good each vice is opposed to some special virtue punishment is therefore proportioned to the order kind and degree of good which each special vice or sin opposes and contradicts the proportion is measured as st thomas observes by the nearer or remoter distance of the good that is contradicted or rejected from our supreme good and final end an end which we made not for ourselves but for which god has made us the nearer a good is to god the greater the good is and the privation of it is the greater evil and the greater punishment but the good things in man that are nearest to god are the graces and virtues and especially the grace and virtue of purity and charity by which we most resemble god the next goods to these are the right order and disposition of the mind especially with respect to faith and the due subjection of our inferior powers to faith and right reason after the health of the soul comes the health of the body and its soundness as the responsive instrument of the soul finally as being of the lowest degree and least value come those external goods of the world that are given for the service of the virtues from this essential order and gradation of good it follows that of all punishments the greatest that can befall a man is to be excluded and cast off from his eternal beatitude the next after this is the loss of grace and virtue and consequently of the due and perfect operation of his powers after this comes the loss of the order of the natural powers of his soul and their consequent weakness for the right and proper performance of their offices and duties then come the corporal evils and privations of the body last and least of all is placed the loss of the exterior goods of this world it would be natural to expect that men would most dread the greatest punishments and would look upon the loss of their greatest good with the utmost horror this would undoubtedly be the case if all men lived the life of faith and charity but this is far from being the case most men live a natural rather than a supernatural life and are not even faithful to their nature and reason but the less a man has of moral good 
the more blind he is to the greater good, to that good for which he is made. This blindness comes from his infidelity to the light of his mind and to the admonitions of his conscience. But from this spiritual blindness the human will is often more reluctant to give up the inferior things of this world and of the body than to surrender the greatest good of the soul. A large number, especially of those who live amidst a corrupting civilization, know and care a vast deal more about sensual and temporal good than about intellectual, moral, spiritual, and divine good, and value them more. In this blind condition, the soul sees all things perversely and puts the whole order of good upside down. The victims of this blindness look upon corporal privations as more grievous than spiritual privations, and on corporal punishments as more calamitous than spiritual punishments. To them the greatest of punishments is the outward humiliation of their reputation, the suffering of corporal afflictions, or the loss of temporal things. As to disorder of soul, the loss of spiritual light, the departure of grace, or the lowering of virtue, they are of small account to those who rarely think of God or of the soul. These are many men who will not have their low ways of thinking and judging interfered with by sage or saint or by God himself. To put before their minds the eternal order of things, to show in that order how infinitely superior the divine good is above human good, and how infinitely greater eternal punishment is than temporal punishment, is to insult their pride as well as their life. The notion of denying the body to give freedom and elevation to the soul is to them an offense and an absurdity. Their habits have perverted their reason. These perverted views of the order of good explain how men become scandalized with God as though his punishments were unequal. They see the wicked man in vigor of body and in the full flow of temporal prosperity, whilst just men often suffer and are low in earthly advantages. And they are tempted to conclude that the providence of God is at fault and that he does not punish iniquity. But to the children of light these things are neither a wonder nor a scandal. They know that the body is for the soul, that exterior is for the sake of interior good, and that inferior things are only good in so far as they help us to obtain interior and superior good. But whatever of inferior good they may have in themselves, when they hinder our superior good, they become blocks in the way, snares to the feet, and obstacles to our greater good, and therefore a cause of evil to us. The divine disposer of all things knows both our strength and weakness. He knows what will help, and he knows what will hinder the advancement of each child of Adam towards his eternal good. He gives to the just man the temporal goods that will help him in virtue and will turn to his everlasting advantage. He takes them away where he sees they will turn him to evil or that he will turn them to evil or will keep him from better things or perhaps deprive him of his eternal happiness. This privation of temporal good is directed to eternal good. To the just man, therefore, these privations are no punishment, especially as he accepts them with good will as being ordained by the providence of God. But to leave these corporal and temporal goods to the unjust man is a heavy punishment, not because they are against his present will, but because they will lead to greater sins and will draw him further from God, which will bring him by his own acts 
into greater punishments against his will. He is therefore less under the providence of God than the just man, who for his spiritual and eternal good is deprived of those corporal and temporal things. But if the unjust man is deprived of temporal goods or suffers in body, it is a severe punishment to him. He not only suffers against his will, but as these are his supreme goods, he has nothing better upon which to rest his soul. The just man is not punished, because he suffers privation in submission to the will of God, which he makes his own. But the unjust man suffers either for his past or for his present sins, and therefore his sufferings are a punishment, although that punishment may not heal him. If, however, he is left in prosperity, these words of wisdom find their truth in him. The creatures of God are turned into an abomination, and a temptation, and a snare to the feet of the unwise." according to the measure of the sin shall be the measure of the stripes trials sent to wean the soul from temptation to strengthen her in patience to detach her from self-love and to purify her for greater gifts when generous souls accept them with humility and thankfulness are not punishments but loving providences Real punishments are proportioned to the kind of sin and the degree of malice in the will. A sin that turns the soul away from God as her supreme end is mortal. A sin that does not turn the soul away from God as her supreme end is venial. The punishment of the first is the privation of her final end and of her spiritual life. The punishment of the second is a certain retardation of the soul's liberty in approaching to her divine good, and a certain slackening of the force of spiritual life, according to the nature and frequency of the sin. Venial sins make our progress more difficult, and those who love God know what a punishment that is. Some punishments are ordained for the amendment of sinners, others for the expiation and purgation of souls repentant of their sins, be it in this world or in the next. For after sin is forgiven, an expiation remains, an expiation that draws its efficacy from its union with the one, the only, the divine expiation that was offered on the cross. But the punishment of sinners who turn from God and never turn to Him again, who surrender the life of the soul to the creature and never return to the life of justice, that awful punishment is as everlasting as the soul, not because God delights in punishment, but because He is just to the eternal order of things, just to both evil and to good. As in human justice the greater criminals are exiled from society, both to deter from like evils and to keep society pure, so in the divine justice some are separated forever from God and from the just because it is just and is due to the nature of things and is inevitable also that the fear of like evils may keep other men from evil, and because, after the probation of the just is ended, society must then keep pure and holy for evermore. It is therefore said of the heavenly Jerusalem, There shall not enter into it anything defiled, or that worketh abomination, or maketh a lie but they that are written in the book of the Lamb. But punishment is more than a privation, it is also an infliction, as the sinner not only turns from the Creator, but turns to the creature, as he not only deserts God, but makes the creature his chief good, 
he not only loses what he has abandoned, but is punished by the creature, for whose sake he has quitted the law of his Creator. As he has brought the creature to ignominy by his abuse of it, the creature itself must become his punishment. Who fears to lose what he does not value? Who fears to lose what he so readily abandons? Can he who neither thinks nor cares for his eternal happiness be kept from evil through the fear of its loss? There must be other punishments, therefore, such as the sinner will fear, punishments of sense from the creature, such as he cannot help understanding and fearing, even in the midst of his sins. As there is a good due even from the creation to those who use it well and wisely, there is an evil due from the creation to those who use it wrongfully and foolishly. And as God has made it just by his promise that they who love him above all things and devote themselves to him shall find their perfection and joy in him, he has equally ordained that they who love the creature rather than the creator shall find their punishment from the creature. Having given their soul to the things beneath her and inferior to her, against all order reason and nature these same things shall become to her the active cause of suffering and misery hence in the sacred scriptures god so often threatens sinners not only with the loss of heaven but also with grievous sufferings from his creatures changed through their folly into the instruments of his sovereign will and justice he will sharpen his severe wrath as a sword, and the world shall fight with him against the foolish. As the imagination is a great element in seducing souls to evil, it is a great element in the punishment of evil. Think what it is for a soul to be stripped of all earthly surroundings, to be detached from the mortal body, and given up to the disorder and confusion wrought upon her in the course of an evil life. As that great disciple of the apostolic men, St. Irenaeus, says, they held themselves aloof from the paternal light, and as they had power over their wills, they overpassed the law of liberty with iniquity. God has therefore prepared a dwelling for them, that suits their dispositions. As they despise the light, he has prepared darkness for them with befitting punishment. Memory, the sense of loss, and the baleful sufferings within and around their spirits must therefore be to them in place of light. There can be nothing earthly and nothing heavenly to take the soul from off herself. There is no justice to keep the powers of the soul in order, no charity to keep them in unity, no good to keep them in pleasant exercise. The defection of evil has loosened the whole spirit into disorder and confusion. The capacity for infinite good is vacant of good. The living subject is void even of the hope of her living object. The fallen spirit has not even the light that illuminates the eternal good, but only the reason why both the light and the good are lost to her forever. Every disordered and distracted faculty of that spirit wants its good object. The soul is therefore dark, loveless, dreary, full of fears and alarms and the inextinguishable conflagration from the interminable disorders of the unchangeable evils among which that soul is placed, and of which she makes a part, destroys without destroying, because those spirits are immortal in immortal pains. The worm of conscience dieth not, the fire is not extinguished. But what gives to the worm its sting, and to the fire its force, 
is the evil in the soul that rejects the everlasting good for which she was created the justice that shone in her mind she would not have in her heart and behold that justice is with her for ever there is an admirable communion of all holy spirits and souls who are united in god for their mutual good and happiness and there is a portentous communion of all evil spirits and souls who work together to mutual punishment and misery the good help each other in many ways invisibly as well as visibly this is one of the grand mysteries of faith the malignant torment each other in many ways this is one of the great mysteries of evil the general tradition of mankind from its earliest records accords with the sacred scriptures in the belief which from genesis to the apocalypse exhibit the good angels ministering to men of good will whilst the apostate angels tempt men to evil strive for their ruin and insult them in their misery the spiritual world is close upon us and only separated from our vision by the earthly things that veil our spirits when eliseus obtained by his prayers the opening of the eyes of his servant he saw the armies of the lord encamped around them more numerous and mighty than the army of assyria and st paul tells the faithful not that you will come but that you are come to the company of many thousands of angels and to the spirits of the just made perfect on the other hand st peter warns us be sober and watch because your adversary the devil like a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour whom resist ye strong in faith knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world everywhere the scriptures show that the fallen angels are the seducers of mankind it is accordant therefore with eternal justice and ordained in the divine decrees that the just who have accepted the help and guidance of holy angels and the examples of the saints should enter their heavenly society and that the wicked who have followed the evil angels in their seductions should follow them to their punishment many persons devote themselves in these educated days to the wonders beauties and sublimities of nature but much of this study and contemplation is unreasonable because they think not of the divine author of these wonderful works but when they turn to works of art they act reasonably by going to the mind of the artist and think as much of him as of his work what a creation of beauty and sublimity they would find if they devoted themselves to the wonderful works of god's mercy but like all the profounder truths they are paradoxes to the natural man however clear to the spiritual man for example were it not for the pains trials and afflictions of this mortal life that force men back upon themselves pierce them with sorrow soften them to the sense of their inward wants and compel them to ascend to god for relief how small would be the number to escape the final evil but when the divine mercy makes the too attractive flower of this life to die among the thorns and the spirit shrinks home to herself and there finds god awaiting her return the first fear of his presence changes to attraction and the eternal beauties begin to dawn upon her sufferings and sorrows are the medicines of the soul sharp afflictions are the surgical remedies cutting out the gangrene of pride and cleansing away the humours of self-love the sufferings of souls are chiefly the result of evil habits either conscious or unconscious to the sufferer often indeed these habits are unconscious 
lying deep and hidden from sight for want of that humility that brings them to self-knowledge and secures their departure for self-love is the root and cause of all spiritual maladies it weakens and inflames the soul making her keenly sensitive to the suffering of nature if observes the eminent writer whom we are quoting in this and subsequent paragraphs you inflict an equal amount of suffering on two persons one of whom has ten degrees of self-love and the other ten degrees of the love of god and if you multiply the ten degrees of weakness by the ten degrees of strength you will find that the one who has ten degrees of self-love will suffer a hundred times more than the one who has the ten degrees of the love of god this is no theory but the experience of those who have the guidance of souls as pain is providentially ordained to enforce attention to the wounds and maladies of the body and to compel us to seek their cure so the pains of conscience warn us of the presence of evil in the soul and enforce self-examination conversion and repentance conscience warns the will before the act to deter us from evil acts and after the evil act is done it inflicts trouble and distress god hath ordained says st augustine that every disorderly soul should be her own executioner whilst the wounded body suffers pain there is yet hope the vital elements are striving to restore the injured part to life and soundness if the conscience ceases to inflict pain on the wounded soul the evil has hardened and grown inveterate there is loss of sensibility to evil paralysis of spirit and the numbness of death the man is tranquil says st isidore from ignorance of himself and insolent from ignorance of god the souls of just men suffer in their season but with incalculable profit to themselves how different in kind and remote in spirit are the sufferings of the just from those of the unjust they suffer like holy job in hope in an elevated spirit and for their greater purification they suffer but to gain a greater abstraction from selfish weakness to make a nobler surrender of themselves to god to the deepening of their faith to a more invigorating generosity to the deepening of self-knowledge and humility and to the drawing with intenser affection towards that supreme good in whom all sufferings find an end the principle of the commutation of forces is far from being limited to material things because all activity conveyed into material things has its origin in spiritual powers from invisible things all things visible were made holy souls have the power of quietly transforming inflicted sufferings into sanctity this is the mystery of the cross there are even causes of suffering and of great suffering to pure and humble souls that the sensual and proud cannot understand they suffer at the spectacle of sins in a way that the lovers of god can alone understand and their sufferings as well as prayers are expiatory offerings for the conversion of sinners they suffer from the sight of their own weakness they suffer from delay of the better things that make them perfect they suffer from every cloud that comes between their spirit and the view of god they suffer from the hope delayed of the eternal vision they suffer as none but they can understand from the strain upon their nature through the expanding influence of the fire of divine charity their sufferings arise from no pain of evil troubling their peace and rest within 
but from the pains of divine love working in a soul still imprisoned and confined by the earthly body how can any one say that the just and the unjust suffer alike the just soul suffers from external evils only and suffers them in peace and charity whilst the unjust soul suffers not only from external evils but much more from internal evils and suffers with misery the just soul suffers with hope and resignation looking to the speedy end of all suffering the unjust soul suffers fruitlessly and hopelessly suffers unhappily and unresignedly seeing no termination to suffering unless god grant the grace of conversion the just soul suffers in god and in the upholding strength of god the unjust soul suffers in herself having no spiritual strength in the weakness of wounded pride and with the self-love that sharpens sensibility to suffering the just soul is conscious of the secret benedictions which god conceals in her sufferings detaching her from self and drawing her affections from things perishable to things imperishable the unjust soul has all her trials aggravated from the bitter root of evil within her with fears in the imagination and forebodings of a dreadful future the just soul looks from the centre of her life into the sure light of god and muses on the divine promise i am with thee in thy troubles i will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me but the wicked man is proud all his days the sound of dread is always in his ears and when there is peace he always expecteth treason such says st gregory on the text are the suspicions and terrors of guilty consciences what is music to the ears of the just is to them the discordant sounding of evil they fear when no one pursueth the falling leaf or the murmuring stream may inspire them with alarm the just man is in peace whilst the conscience of the wicked will not leave him in security the very walls that hide him seem to know his secret though no one shares his secret yet were he buried in a tomb of the desert his conscience gives him no rest from fear the soul that loves god has only reverential fears she has but little delight in this world because her heart is with her treasure but the unjust man is at war with his better nature and with the nobler good intended for him he has no delight beyond this world and every attack of disease every touch of calamity brings the end of life in view with alarm with the anticipated sense of loss with the bitings of remorse with memories too bitter to dwell upon and with servile fears invisible powers strange though obscure mysteries are about the dying man whose hopes are left with his body in the grave in a word to evil men all the evils of this life are pure evils whilst to the man of good will they are changed by their contact with his good will into a hundredfold of good to the man of grace and good will therefore the psalmist sings with confidence that he is protected by god he will overshadow thee with his shoulders and under his wings thou shalt trust his truth shall compass thee with a shield thou shalt not be afraid of the terror of the night of the arrow that flieth about in the day of the business that walketh in the dark of invasion or of the noonday devil a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand but these evils shall not come nigh to thee but thou shalt consider with thine eyes and shalt see the reward of the wicked 
End of Lecture 9, Part 3「Lecture 10, Part 1 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 10 Why Man Was Not Created Perfect Part 1 When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 10 a cry is sometimes heard from unbelieving hearts, which is a cry of self-vindication, and is expressed in terms like these. Why are we so weak and unfinished? If God is indefinitely good, why are we left exposed to evil and misery? Sometimes men who are weak in faith are likewise heard to murmur, but in notes more hushed and low, and the burden of their plaint is this. Why did not God so make us that we might not sin? These cries rose to a clamor with the Valentinians in the second century of Christianity, and were replied to by the great bishop and martyr of Lyon, St. Irenaeus, the disciple of the apostolic men. They were raised anew by the Manichaeans of the fourth and fifth centuries, and were replied to by St. Basil, St. Augustine, and Titus of Bosra. The question is of great extent, embracing the whole nature of intellectual creation, as well as the whole economy of God. For its solution, we must look not only to the light of reason, but to the light of revelation. And when we have brought these two lights to bear upon the subject, we shall not fail to obtain a profound instruction, both as to the nature of the rational creature and the character of God's external operations. No question can more thoroughly explain the infinite distance between the Creator and the creature, or give more light upon the wisdom of God as it is manifested in the ways of His providence and the dispensations of His grace. The question has been delayed to this tenth lecture expressly with the view of your being prepared for its consideration by the principles already put forth and explained. And although the compass of a lecture is but brief for so vast a theme, yet even this limited extent of consideration cannot fail to strengthen the minds of those who love to enlarge their souls and animate their piety by reflecting on the wonderful ways of God. As the nature of God is goodness, as his power is omnipotence, and his work is mercy, we must expect such a plan from his external mind for the formation of his intelligent creatures as shall exceed in goodness, magnificence, and mercy all that our weak and limited minds could by the light of our reason in our present state anticipate, especially whilst obscured by earth, sensuality, and sin. As God is most simple, because most perfect, we must also expect the eternal plan to be one and simple as it exists in the mind of God, but to us, who are far removed from the open presence of God, are chained to our bodily senses, and live among countless shadows and obscurations, the wonderful design of God can only be seen in part, and its execution anticipated in part, as beheld in obscure lights that reach us through the veils and curtains of created things. Let us return for a moment to the book of Job. Behold, God is high in strength, and there is no one like to him among the lawgivers. Who can search out his ways, or who can say to him, Thou hast wrought iniquity? 
Remember that thou knowest not his work, which men have sung. All men see him, every one beholdeth him afar off. Behold, God is great, conquering knowledge, the number of his years cannot be reached. Who can search out his ways? Who inhabiteth unapproachable light, and whom no man hath seen at any time? Yet all men see him afar off, they see him in the things that bear witness to him. We see his truth in the light of our reason, his law in the voice of our conscience, his justice in our sense of wrongdoing, his promise of greater good in our aspirations towards better things. The testimony of God's presence is in the soul of every man. He has only to enter into himself, and he will find it there. Man would not be at all were God not with him and he with God, however secret from mortal sight that eternal presence may be. And he certainly would not be man unless the witness of God were in his conscience. But we know not his work which men have sung. The devout prophets, poets, philosophers, and theologians have made God and his works the highest theme of their contemplation. But who has seen God's side of his works? The sun's side of the cloud is luminous, but its earthly side is dark. Who has seen God at his work of creation? Who has seen the word of God within the Father's bosom, through whom all things were made? Who has seen the light of God's mind in which he beholds all things? Who has seen his Holy Spirit of wisdom, reaching from end to end of all things mightily, and disposing of all things sweetly? We are but children of a short time, born in the midway of things, newcomers into a world that is yet strange to us, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. As the bird in the egg, we are still in the first and immature stage of our existence, and often confound shadows with realities, and are startled at fancies and fears which make the wise in heaven smile. To get a partial sight of a peace here and a peace there, of some grand design, will not give us the mind of the artist. The men in the ranks do not see the order in which the great army is marshaled. That is in the mind of the commander. If you enter the works of some great engineer and begin to handle tools and machines that you don't understand, you may not only get wounded, but you may have your limbs crushed for your ignorant interference. But if you come to the conclusion that the evil is in the works, and not in your own rash conduct, you will show more folly in your judgment than rashness in your acts. The man who has never ruled anything but his family will know but little of the mind that governs a kingdom, and the man who rules a kingdom will have but a very limited knowledge of the mind of God who governs the universe. What do these men of new lights with the freshest theory of the universal plan in their mind, know either of the universe or of the divine ruler of the universe. They have only got the old light of the old human reason in a twist that makes it look like new. That terminal ray which has entered the mind from the universal light in a condition so thin and attenuated after being refracted from its primal purity through the medium of created things, has not the strength and compass that will enable us to embrace both God and his works. To see God's works as God beholds them demands his infinite vision. But you are as yet confined to your earthly place at a vast depth below the regions of light, are confined, as it were, to a single bay within the obscure crypts of that glorious palace of the universe 
which God has built for his delight and glory. And you must wait until the divine architect comes to teach you, before you can understand the unity, the order, and the extent of its design, and its magnificent arrangements. There was none like to him among the lawgivers. In what condition art thou then, O creature of a day, to judge the decrees of the divine legislator? Hast thou entered into the unapproachable light in which God dwelleth? Hast thou sat in counsel with him? Dost thou not know that the eternal king has his royal reserves of wisdom as well as his published laws? He has taught us by his works, he has taught us by his prophets, Last of all, he has taught us by his Son. But he has not equaled us to himself in knowledge. For as far as God is above the creature, so far is his light above our light, and his knowledge above our knowledge. Peradventure, says holy Job, thou wilt comprehend the steps of God, and wilt find out the Almighty perfectly. He is higher than heaven, and what wilt thou do? He is deeper than hell, and how wilt thou know? He knoweth the vanity of men. The Lord is high, conquering our knowledge. God conquers our knowledge when he shows us the limits of our reason and the errors into which our senses involve us. He conquers our knowledge when he teaches us to seek truth from him by faith and greater knowledge by a humble dependence on his word. Even the most enlightened of us cannot penetrate through the forms and qualities of things into that secret force which constitutes their substance. Nor can we see how they exist in the power of God and not in their own. Under every order, species, and individual thing, be it the petal of a flower, the wing of a fly, or the soul of man. There is a mystery too profound for either sense or mind to fathom. But when we rest on the God of truth, we rest upon all truth, both what he generously teaches us and what he royally reserves for the eternal day. If we see certain great principles of truth by direct perception, they can only be applied through a process of reasoning that marks the limitation of our vision. If by the faculty of comparison we gain many clear and certain conclusions, in how many cases is the result of our mental labors left in doubt and uncertainty? We see not the broad, full prospect of truth, but only the procession of truth after truth, one to our understanding by thought after thought. We have not seen the ocean of truth, but only the raindrops wafted to us from that ocean, not the light of truth in its fountain, where all truth is one and indivisible, but only certain terminal and disparted rays of truth. We see not that truth in its native purity, but as invested with an imagery befitting our compound nature of soul and body, of mind and earthly sense. Truths that seem wide apart to our limited intelligence, however united in themselves, we often find it hard to conciliate because we want the perception of that intermediate truth in which they are united. Hence difficulties arise to us which God alone can conquer, by infusing a greater light into our minds. For although the whole light of the object of our thought is all around us, and is not farther from us than the God of truth, yet our mind is limited, and our understanding, immersed in sense and often alienated from God and crossed by the shadows projected from ourselves, is only sufficiently illuminated to touch this and that point that looms through the mists and shadows raised from sensible things 
that veil the object in its completeness from our eyes thus compassed with obscurity we are inclined to imagine with vividness not the truth that is open to us so much as what we feel within ourselves and to judge what is beyond us according to our own temper and disposition what remains for us but that by going out of ourselves we listen to the voice of eternal truth revealing to our faith what we see not with our reason the revelation of god is the abundant communication of what our reason cannot reach faith is the reasonable and consistent adhesion of our mind to the author of all truth if the chief sum of our human knowledge comes of faith in our fellow men and the affairs of human life rest on faith in each other why should we hold back our faith from the god of truth when he makes known to us what of ourselves we cannot see until in reward for our faith the vision of truth shall be opened to our enraptured gaze faith is the preordained remedy of our natural ignorance of divine things and we ought to be content with divine authority and to bear our own ignorance with patience and peace this just order of things god has measured out for our state of trial it is our reasonable service to god well pleasing the sacrifice of our mental pride and the proper remedy for our pride of heart the bent of pride is to independence this morbid tendency makes the man restless and impatient under his present ignorance and ambitious to have the command of knowledge he will not see that knowledge commands him vain of the surface knowledge of what falls under the senses and of his dominion over material things he thinks to make himself independent of the authority of god when he delivers the eternal truth proud of an imaginary liberty and not seeing that it chains him to his inferior nature with a hard servitude he looks with a kind of horror to the revelation that subjects his mind and will to the divine authority and compels him to realize that god is both his master and his teacher he scorns the truth that comes through faith because it is the gift of the humble and because he cannot ascribe it to his own fountain but the humility of the humble which is the most generous of all virtues and the reasonable service of the whole man to truth knows and confesses the restricted limits of man's reason disposes the soul to faith and leads the reason up to that truth which the eternal wisdom reveals then god conquers our knowledge and helps our submission to the truth through the victorious strength of his grace in his hand he hideth the light and commandeth it to come again he showeth his friends concerning it that it is his and that they may come up to it if you could see god's creative and providential action moving from eternity through the ages unto eternity you might have some notion of the divine plan of creation if you could see all the generations of the children of adam pass before you and could compass the operations of god throughout the extent of the human family you might know something of the breadth of the eternal design if you could scale the heights of heaven and behold the just made perfect and then descend into the abyss and behold the refuse of humanity in its failure and if you could see the prodigious provisions of light and grace beyond the native powers of man by the help of which the blessed have ascended to god and then see the wonderful helps that the unhappy who have fallen from god have rejected you might know something of the height and depth of god's moral government 
of the human race. But as it is, what do you know of anyone's internal history beyond your own? And how much do you know of your own? How far have you measured in detail or taken the total sum of the providential gifts and the divine influences which under God's guiding hand have come to you? How much have you accepted? Or how much of all have you neglected or rejected? How much do you know of the conduct of your mind towards God's light? Or of the conduct of your will towards His grace? Or of your general conduct towards His providence? The waste of opportunity given to men is enormous. What just and true distinction have you made between God's part in you and what is justly and fairly your own? The whole question of human justice towards God lies in this interrogation. But if you know so little of yourself, how can you expect to know the height and depth, the length and breadth, of God's eternal plan in creating the human race, except so far as it has pleased Him to teach you. Nature cannot be violated. Man cannot exist before he is created. He cannot be called to the divine counsel to say how he shall be made, or to what end he shall be made. Were he made, as some in their blind conceit imagine they ought to be made, he would be something very much less than man. Yet no one really wishes to exchange his personal existence for that of another, however gifted, for that would be his own annihilation. What he really wants is to better his own condition, and that is in his power if he chooses to accept the means. The reaches of his mind and of his heart are unlimited, and he has only to bend his stubborn nature down to God to receive the means by which he may advance to the infinite and eternal good. In these facts, written in every sincere conscience, the plan of God becomes manifest, and it rebukes the presumption of those men who complain of their imperfect nature instead of working to obtain its perfection. Nothing more clearly proves the wisdom of one order of things than the absurdities that present themselves on the assumption of another the directly opposite. Instructed by the previous lectures, you will be able to enter into the sense, or you may more truly call it the nonsense, of the following supposition. Let us indulge the querulous man with the absurd fancy that he might have existed before his existence, and might have made himself in a better way. It is excessively ridiculous, but let us place the impossibility for a ground of argument. In the first place, this self-creator can have no claim upon God. He must make himself for himself. He must begin and end in himself, and what self is without God we have already seen. In the second place, he will have no right to the creatures of God, and how is he to get on without them? In the next place, he could not give himself those immortal gifts that in the nature of things belong to God alone. Where would be the image of God? where that trinity of powers in one spiritual substance which has its glory in its divine original, where would be the light of reason and the principles of unchangeable truth? God alone can implant them as created reflections of his own eternal truth, as he does implant them in every soul at its creation. Where would be the appetite for universal good? having nothing in him greater than himself, to what greater good could he aspire? Where would be the capacity for eternal things? And if it were there, how could it be provided for? 
made for himself his capacity could not extend beyond himself having no choice between himself and things greater than himself where would be his freedom subject and object at once without any personal distinction between them there could be no free movement between one and the other the whole work for man it could not be must eventuate in a dull stupidity where would be the light of justice and the law of conscience those reflections of the divine order and eternal justice of things these can only be implanted in souls by god to guide them to imperishable good where again would be the spiritual provisions to nourish the heart and the life and where those increasing radiations of the divine spirit that give faith and hope and the love of eternal things self-love must be of necessity the principle of that self-created one for what other principle could the self-creator implant but self-love with nothing better to feed upon is the last degree of misery a creature made on no higher type than its own subjective existence and so shorn of the lights and hopes of better things must be an irrational unconscienced lawless irresponsible and idiotic thing it could have none of those nobler gifts whose first principle is in god it would be a hopeless bundle of chaotic sensations without an object yet strange as it may sound to good christian ears there are men who in the name of science go so far in their folly as to attempt to remake themselves by the process of separating themselves from god but god upholds them in his creative hand nevertheless and that with infinite patience for were it otherwise their separation would be their annihilation this is the moral of our otherwise absurd supposition end of lecture ten part one lecture ten part two of the endowments of man by william bernard ullathorne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 10. Why Man Was Not Created Perfect. Part 2. The reasons why God did not make man perfect, as far as we are able to see them, may be stated under these six heads. Number 1. There is but one uncreated being who is absolutely perfect with every kind of perfection, and he is the reason and the cause of all things that exist. As man is a creation of God and is made from nothing, he must of necessity be limited, and as a limited being he must be changeable. As a creature, he must also of necessity be dependent on his creator. A being so independent as to want for nothing, and to be incapable of failure, would not be man, but God. But a limited and changeable creature must, by the nature of things, be in itself imperfect. Number 2. It is an immeasurably greater work on the part of God, and is incomparably more honorable to the creature, that God should have made man to be a cause in himself, than if his Creator had been the one and only cause of his perfection. We perhaps seldom realize the grandeur of a creative act which puts the rational creature into his own power with freedom to originate his own actions so that with the helps given him by god he may work out his own perfection it is this free power of causation implanted in his will that makes him the originator of his own acts it is a certain sub-creative power that god has given to his creature 
by which he most resembles God. But as this will or power of causation belongs to the creature, it is essentially limited and therefore changeable. As it is placed between superior good and many kinds of inferior good, it is free to choose superior good or to turn to inferior good and to cleave with affection to one or to the other. But man is perfected by willing superior good and is deteriorated by willing inferior good. And as both himself and his will are made from nothing, unless his will is divinely strengthened, his natural tendency is to those inferior things that are nearest to his native nothingness. Number three. The perfection of what is created is not in itself, but in its final end. Nothing is made for itself, but for something greater than itself. God has an end in view in all that he creates, or he would not be the eternal wisdom. But the end of man is God. He can only therefore be perfected when he reaches his final end in God. For this end he bears the image of God. No image has glory in itself, but only from the original which it represents. And this living image is made to be filled according to its capacity with the power and glory of God. But this implies a complete subjection of the soul to God. In the nature of things, therefore, man cannot be perfect in himself. He can only be perfect when he is united with God. Number four. The primary end of man's creation is the glory of God in the manifestation of his divine attributes. But as these external manifestations are made to limited creatures, they are distinct and progressive. First, the power of God is manifested in the act of creation. Next, the wisdom of God is manifested in the order of providence, by which one thing is made to advance and complete another. Then, to the rational creature made for God, the light of truth and justice is communicated, which brings that rational creature into relation with the invisible and eternal world and after the rational man is formed, he still has need of the supernatural gifts of faith and charity to bring his mind and heart into direct communion with God. Thus the natural manifestations of God to his creature are followed by his divine and supernatural manifestations. But the grand and final manifestation of God to his intelligent creature is when, in reward for his fidelity, he manifests himself by the beatific vision. Number five. The due counterpart to the progressive manifestation of God to his creature is the progressive advancement of the creature towards God. Man is made with the noble attribute of free will, that he may cooperate with God in accomplishing his own perfection. He is therefore a moral being, and this is the explanation of his conscience. But he is made from nothing, and the distance between nothingness and God is infinite. Justice and truth require that man should know the nothingness from which he is taken, and that he should clearly know that he owes all things to God. Otherwise his mind would be filled with the most destructive error, and his heart with the most destructive injustice. He has therefore received his creation on the verge of nothingness, with little substance of good, but with great capacity for good. He is made both perfect and imperfect, perfect in capacity for infinite good, but imperfect in not having reached that good, because he cannot be really perfect until he has reached the unchangeable good. 
for God has given him a complete nature to be perfected by what is above his nature, and above all created and creatable natures. God has given him this great capacity for what is greater than himself, and the free principle of action, that he might have the unspeakable privilege and dignity of cooperating with God in the glorious work of perfecting himself by corresponding willingly with all the gifts of nature and grace, and with all the manifestations of goodness and mercy that God shall vouchsafe to him. By thus advancing from light to light, from grace to grace, and from virtue to virtue, man is able to reach an incomparably greater perfection than if he had been made as perfect as he could be from the first, without the free exercise of his own will and conduct. Number six. The very fact that man is made for what is infinitely greater than he is, and that he is made for God and not for himself, implies that he must be imperfect before he can be perfect. As an intelligent and moral being made to know, to will, and to love, yet brought into existence from nothing, he must be tried before he can be approved. His nature must receive divine elements of light and power before he can ascend in mind and heart towards the divine good. And he must show that he can be faithful to the divine good he receives whilst yet on trial, before he is united to the unchangeable good forevermore. In his responsible days of probation, instead of being at discord with the eternal truth or with the divine elements of grace, he must freely and willingly respond to them and make them actively his own by the exercise of those supernatural virtues of which they are the principle. He has then within him those divine powers that will bring him to God and to his perfection. It is the distance of man, therefore, from the final object of his existence that makes him imperfect and is the cause of his unhappiness. But every step which he takes towards God advances him on the way of perfection and diminishes his unhappiness. It is not those who are in their due order towards God and who give their hearts to him who are dissatisfied with their present condition or complain of being unhappy. But it is those only who are unfaithful to God and who vainly seek for their chief end in themselves. And here let me make a remark which is of vital importance. If we see such a vast amount of moral misery in the present state of the world, of a moral misery which is incomparably the greatest of all miseries, and either causes or deepens every other kind of suffering, we may ascribe no small part of it to the exclusion of the principle of final causes from the sphere of modern thought and to the bold asserting of man's self-sufficiency. These destructive methods of thinking percolate into every kind of writing and reach every kind of reader, soaking into and sapping the foundations of religious truth in minds innumerable. Yet in the practical affairs of this life, men invariably act on the principle of final causes, they shape their means to their ends, and the intermediate ends are made subordinate to the chief end they have in view. But man himself has a final end, to which all other ends are subordinate, and nothing can be more irrational than to exclude that end from human thought and conduct. The old philosophies, as Varro has shown, made the chief good of man the first object of their thought and inquiry. But in these disjointed times, even when not theoretically, yet practically, men of science, 
humanitarians, statesmen, politicians, political economists, and even literary men, lose sight of the one great object for which man is born into this world, and leave him by implication, when not of set purpose, to his own self-sufficiency. Then the loss of the light of distinction between the objective truth and the subjective man, which is the radical weakness of the modern infidel philosophies, has contributed greatly to propagate the absurd notion that man is self-sufficient, both for his thinking and his conduct. Yet the final end of man is the first motive of his existence, and his progress towards that end is the measure of his manhood and the secret of his content and happiness. Even on the ground of humanity, therefore, the final end of man ought to be the prime regulator of his thought, conduct, and affairs. For the discarding of final causes is the loss of wisdom in thought and of prudence in action. And to treat man as though he had no end beyond this world is to do the utmost violence to his nature. When a man grows querulous over his own imperfect nature, he would do well to settle with himself before he complains of his Creator. Let him reflect how much truth he might have had and has not, because when offered to his knowledge he gave not to it the attention of his mind and will. Let him reflect how much good he might have had and has it not, because when the occasion offered he failed in courage and let it pass. Let him examine and consider how far and how often he has failed to give that wise and just direction to his will that was within his power and not beyond his lights. He may then obtain some notion of those latent powers within him that he has let go to rust and decay for the want of due exercise and discipline. If this examination shows him how much more perfect he might have been than he is, let him not accuse God, but his own will. After which he may take to his heart these words of Albert the Great, Nothing richer can be offered to God than a good will, for the good will is the originator of all good and is the mother of all virtues. Whosoever begins that good will has secured all the help he needs for living well. Why are we not created in such a manner, asks St. Basil, that from our nature we should be unable to sin and should not have the power to do so, though we willed it? And to this he answers, You do not think you have good servants when you are compelled to chain them but you think them good when they do the duties they owe you freely and with good will. Nor can God be pleased with what is done on compulsion, but only with what is done from virtue. But virtue cannot come of necessity, it must come of free will, and this will is yours and depends for its exercise on yourself. He, therefore, who would complain of his Maker for not making him so that he might not sin, must, of course, prefer an unreasonable to a reasonable nature, and would choose an immovable existence, incapable of better things, before an existence that is free and capable of action. It is obvious that a creature made from nothing and limited by nature cannot be made incapable of sin, unless made without free will. This point has been fully treated in the lectures on evil. But had we been created without free will, we could never have subjected ourselves to God. We could not have made the divine will our own. We could have made no generous offering either of ourselves or of anything to God. We could have done nothing to the glory of God 
or towards our own perfection we could not have even used our reason or have searched into any truth we should have been incapable of any virtue whatsoever as saint basil intimates we should have been fixed immovable passive and unchangeable just as we were created on the other hand were we not placed between good and evil and with our will open to both we should lose the occasion for the exercise of the stronger virtues that make us strong the prudence that guards against evil the vigor that resists temptation the manifold toil of pursuing good the fortitude that resists the patience that endures and the magnanimity that rises above evil we should know nothing of that joy of self-sacrifice that gives splendor to the virtues the virtues that strengthen the soul would not exist and what virtues still remained would languish and lose their vigor to be without a free will is to be without merit or deservings of any kind and to have nothing that deserves esteem or reward a will without freedom is not a will a soul without a will is not a soul and a man without a soul is not a man to be free in one's will is to be the sovereign of oneself and to have this intelligent dominion over one's own actions is the proof of a spiritual nature and in this we resemble god god has honored us says titus of bosra by so making us in his image that as god is good in the freedom of his nature we might honor him with the freedom of our will and that by abstaining from sin whilst capable of sinning our free will might do honor to virtue the perfection of man begins with his sanctification advances with his greater sanctification and is consummated in the beatific vision of god his advancement therefore in perfection is to be looked for in the progress of his nature from nothingness to god first that which is earthly then that which is heavenly first the body then the soul then by divine condescension the light and grace from heaven to raise the soul above herself and bring the mind and will into supernatural relations with god then the mind enters into the light of god by faith and the will into the power of god by hope and love and by religion the will is subject to god and worships him in obedience to the divine ordinances in which he has shown that he would be worshipped and receives the sacraments in which he wills that we should receive his graces and as light comes upon light and grace on grace the faithful man advances from virtue to virtue perfecting his sanctification and preparing himself for his final union with god but if god were to make us perfect from the beginning of our existence what kind of a perfection would that be there would be no virtue no cooperation in our own sanctification no triumph over the powers of evil no mutual working of light and free understanding no corresponding action of grace and free will no works of faith love and patience to be crowned with beatitude no crowning of the moral good in which god crowns the operations of his own gifts if we did not advance by sensible and marked degrees from the animal to the rational and from the rational to the spiritual life and thence again to higher degrees of spiritual good we should confound our own nature with the light and grace of god and the workings of grace with the workings of nature we should never distinguish between those supernatural and exuberant gifts of god and the feeble powers that belong to our nature 
we should claim the divine gifts as part of our nature and thus fall into a most delusive egotism as well as into a terrible falsehood and injustice we could not have that beautiful humility which so much consists in the confession of the gifts of god for it is by being first without the divine gifts and feeling how poor and imperfect we are without them and by then receiving them that we know with most practical knowledge what we are of ourselves and what with the grace of god but we pass from nature to the gifts of god by a way so visible marked and distinct that we must see unmistakably that nature comes by birth and grace from heaven upon our nature and can never claim the gifts of grace as though they were the provisions of our nature again as we are conscious of our free will and conscious in our experience that we are free to accept or to reject the help of god to cooperate or not to cooperate with the gifts of grace we are not in the same peril of confounding the divine gifts with the powers of our nature as we should be were we created perfect in nature and endowed with perfect grace at one and the same instant thus we escape the danger of that worst of errors that error of inexpiable pride and injustice in the confounding of the two which caused the angels to fall from god in the course of his voluminous works and especially in that against julian the pelagian st augustine has put forth three reasons why man in his mortal nature must be exposed to the danger of sin he first lays down the principle that god alone is by nature immortal quoting st paul who teaches that he alone inhabiteth immortality from which it follows that man was never immortal by nature but only in virtue of a divine gift god alone is absolutely pure and holy by nature and therefore by nature incapable of sin god cannot admit sin in himself because he cannot abandon his own divine nature for there is nothing better than himself to which he could adhere and by the abandoning of which he could sin the second of the great doctor's reasons has been anticipated but we will give it substance in confirmation of our own as every creature emerges from nothingness and carries the seeds of change within him and as he therefore labors under his native inconstancy and mutability it is fitting that for a time his native weakness should be felt and seen for what we are born with and can claim as our own is our nature and we should not have a just and faithful mind about our nature if we knew not by experience what that nature is and what apart from the supernatural help of god we ourselves are without this experimental knowledge of what we are by nature where could we get that truthful sense and right perception of what we are apart from god which furnishes us the ground for that fundamental virtue of humility by which we are made subject to god and are capable of receiving his gifts but if the supernatural state of grace were given to man from the moment of his existence he would never have known what of himself he is because the state of grace would be inseparable from the state of nature the due order of things therefore required that in our present state of existence nature should first appear alone and that afterwards we should rise to better things our human nature is therefore so regulated that it first appears in a condition altogether distinct from that which it becomes after god has sent upon us every good and perfect gift from heaven 
but had these gifts been given from the first and given with such power that we could not separate ourselves from god by sin we should have been so absorbed in god through his gifts as never to have known what by nature we are nor from what poverty weakness and mutability god had raised us up we should never have known our native nothingness or have been able to do justice to all that god had done for us and so st augustine concludes his argument with these words man could do no evil either with his will or against his will if it were not that he is made from nothing that is to say were he not something less than god but the divine nature alone is unchangeable because god alone is not from nothing but is eternal the third reason given by st augustine why man should begin in an imperfect state and liable to sin is this as god is the perfect good he envies no good whatever to his creatures to all he gives the good they have whether it be the less the greater or the greatest good to adam it was a great gift that he need not have died although he was able to cause his own death and to all men it is a great gift to receive a will from god that is able to avoid sin even although it is able to commit sin it is scarcely necessary to enlarge upon the beauty and splendor of such a gift what an honor it is to man that from the first he is put in a state in which although tempted to sin and able to sin he may still abstain from sin and so win for himself that better state of existence in which he can sin no more what a privilege it is to be so placed that with god's help he may become the author and architect of his own unchangeable happiness and by exercising constancy in the midst of instability may purchase an estate of eternal immutability what a dignity it is for man to put his industrious will and helping hand to second the work of god and to work with god not in making the primary elements of his weak and rudimentary nature but in filling up that nature with good and in forming himself to spiritual beauty had god given him perfection from the first he would have had nothing of his own in that perfection it is a great thing concludes st augustine to be able not to sin but it is a far greater to be incapable of sin and it is justly ordained that whilst that first state gives us the occasion for merit the last state should give us the reward of well-doing we must rise from the merit of the less good to the reward of the greater good how firm must be the union of the soul with god how strong the gift of justice how pure the sanctity how absorbing the charity before the divine influence enters so deeply into our nature and so completely conquers the instability of the soul that she shall no longer be capable of sinning but if this were our first condition where would be the trial where the combat where the reward of patience where the victor's crown it is such a permanent state of sanctity that nothing greater in a created being could be thought of but this full and secure felicity to which nothing can be added is won by trial and is the reward of the saints end of lecture ten part two lecture ten part three of the endowments of man by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture ten 
Why Man Was Not Created Perfect Part 3 The divine wisdom teaches us in Ecclesiasticus that all things are made double, one against another, and God hath made nothing defective. He hath established the good things of every one, and who shall be filled with his glory? Of this corresponding order of things, the most conspicuous example is that of the heavens doubled against the earth, and shedding their beneficent influences upon all that the earth contains. The firmament on high is his beauty, the beauty of heaven with its glorious show, the sun when he appeareth showing forth at his rising, an admirable instrument, the work of the Most High. A nearer example of this double formation of things, one against another, is the human body, each part of whose construction is doubled, one part against the other, and in which the noble and commanding members, the organs of mind and will, are placed superior as against the less noble and obediential members, which are placed inferior. When we enter our interior, we find there the superior soul doubled against the inferior soul. As Aristotle expresses it in his politics, there is implanted in the soul a double part, one that commands and one that obeys. The superior is to the inferior soul what the heavens are to the earth for on the superior side is the light of truth and justice, whilst on the inferior side are the movements of sense and the animal instincts that press upon the soul from below, whilst the will is the central power between the two, making its free choice between the heavenly light above and the earthly instinct beneath. In this doubling of the spiritual against the carnal man, and in setting his light over our darkness, God hath established the good things of every one, and the question remains, Who shall be filled with his glory? To which the answer comes, He who looks up to the light above, and who takes hold on the heavenly grace, and who enters into the strength of God. For nature has expressed this truth by the pen of the pagan poet, I see the better things and approve them, but I follow the worse. And grace has expressed the same truth more clearly by the pen of St. Paul, The good which I will, I do not. And again, I am delighted with the law of God according to the inner man, but I see another law in my members, fighting against the law of my mind. Yet we may still adhere to the text of Ecclesiasticus, God hath made nothing defective, he hath established the good things of every one. He has put the light of truth in our mind, like the heavens above the earth, and this light is doubled over our weak and imperfect nature that we may know what to approve and what to condemn, in what way to advance and from what to recede, that we may not err from the path that leads to our perfection. We see the better things above doubled against the inferior things below, that we may reconcile the two by choosing the superior for our master and the inferior for our servant. And as the weakness of our inferior nature is revealed to us by the light placed like a sun in our superior nature, we have the unfailing admonition to seek the strength we need from God, who never fails those who seek his grace with all their heart. In his advancement of learning, Lord Bacon has expressed the truth we are here treating in a quaint but forcible English which commends itself to close thinkers. He says, There is found in everything a double nature of good. This double nature of good, and the comparative thereof, is much more engraven in man if he degenerate not. 
his approach or assumption to divine or angelic nature is the perfection of his form the error or false imitation of which good is that which is the tempest of human life while man upon the instinct of an advancement formal and essential is carried to seek advancement local let those who boast themselves the followers of the scientific method of bacon in which he was long before anticipated by his great namesake the franciscan friar of oxford observe how in the spirit of a true philosopher he establishes the formal essential and final end of man and then measures his human progress by his advancement to that end to put what he here says into modern language there are two ideas or forms of good before the human mind that of ourself as a natural good wanting completeness and that of god as the form of divine or perfect good but until our imperfect nature approaches or is taken up to the divine good which is also the angelic good we do not receive the perfection of our form but when a man misdirects his instinct or appetite that points to this supreme or universal good and diverts that instinct or appetite to what is local that is to what is of this earth he commits the grave error of seeking the universal good in a false direction and encounters the tempest of life making no advancement meanwhile towards that divine or angelic good which forms him to perfection but the less a man has degenerated the more he holds engraven in him the comparative value of these two kinds of good knowing himself to be the lesser good whose form is incomplete and that god is the perfect good and that when he is advanced or taken up to god his form obtains its perfection should any one say that he wishes to abstain from evil but that he cannot do so he ought to remember that after a man has been long infected with disease he cannot be cured by wishing it an evil habit of long standing can only be got rid of by introducing a greater good into the soul that by its vital force the evil may be expelled out of the system if he will only seek that greater good it will be given him even the fear of being caught and punished as titus of bosra observes when it gets possession of a man will conquer his cupidity and stay him from evil doing and this itself shows that sin is not the growth of nature but a work of the affections let us all therefore praise the laws that punish the guilty without making any apology and that confirm the common sense of mankind which has no notion that men are driven by nature to crime but is convinced that they give themselves to crime of their own free choice and deserve their punishment we now come to the masterly argument of saint irenaeus that disciple of the apostolic men whose praise has flowed from the pens of many fathers of the church listen then to the substance of his teaching you ask why god could not have made man perfect from the beginning you ought to know then that whatever is created must be inferior to its creator and that what is not uncreated must fall short of perfection being of recent date they are in an infantile condition the mother could give strong meat to her child but the child is unable to receive it and god might have given perfection to man from his earliest existence but being yet an infant he could not receive it it was for a like reason that our lord came to us only in these latter times summing up all things in himself and not coming as he might have come but as we are able to behold him he might have come in his immortal glory 
but how could we have borne the weight of that glory? For this reason, although he was the perfect bread of the Father, he gave himself to us as milk is given to infants, that being nourished at his breast, we might get accustomed to this milk diet in partaking of the word of God, and so become able to receive the bread of immortality, which is the spirit of the Father. St. Paul had this in view when he said to the Corinthians, I gave you milk to drink, not meat, because you were not yet able. As if he had said to them, You have learnt the Lord's coming as man, but because of your infirmity, the Spirit of the Lord does not yet rest upon you. As the Apostle had the power of giving the Corinthians strong meat from the beginning, God had the power of giving man perfection from the beginning. But man was only recently created. He could not receive it, or if he did receive it, he could not have dealt with it. There was nothing impossible on God's part. The defect was in the newly created man. God hath exhibited his power, wisdom, and goodness in one united plan, his power in creating and constituting the things that did not exist before, his wisdom in adapting and fitting them harmoniously into each other, and his unspeakable benignity in giving them growth and prolonged existence to reflect the glory of the uncreated one, the glory of God, who gives them good without jealousy. For God is the cause of all things, and all things are subject to God. And as the glory of the uncreated one is incorruptible, to be subject to God is the preservation of incorruption. It is through this order, harmony, and divine guidance of things that man is man, and is constituted to the image and likeness of God. The Father planned all things well, and gave the command. The Son executed the command and framed the work. The Holy Spirit nourishes and gives increase to that which is made. But man is advanced to what is perfect by little and little, and is thus advanced by being brought nearer to the uncreated one. It was necessary that he be first created, that after being created he receive growth, that after receiving growth he be strengthened, that after he is strengthened he be multiplied, that after he is multiplied he be recovered from his disorder, that after he is recovered from his disorder he be glorified, and that in being glorified he see the Lord God. For God remains yet to be seen, and the vision of God is the cause of incorruption, and incorruption bringeth near to God. It is unreasonable, therefore, to ascribe our infirmity to God instead of waiting for our growth. He who does this neither knows God nor himself. He is as unsatiable as he is ungrateful, and it is through excess of passion that he is unwilling to be what God has made him. Flying beyond the law of his nature, he would wish to be like God his creator, even before he has become a man. The dumb beasts make no complaint that they are not men. They are thankful for their condition as it is. But men are more unreasonable. They complain of God that he makes them men first, that they may be made gods hereafter, instead of being made gods all at once. Yet how can they change their creator with grudging and envy, when he tells them even now, I have said, you are gods and all sons of the Most High. And then he says to us, who are still incapable of bearing the power of his divinity, but nevertheless ye shall die as men. In this manner does the Almighty set forth his own benignity 
and our infirmity, whilst he intimates at the same time that we are left in our own power. For in his benignity he has already given good to us, and given it to us in such a way that we may be like him in the very fact of being in our own power. But in his foresight he knows our weakness, and what befalls us through our weakness, and has therefore reserved to his own love and power the gift to enable us to overcome our frailty. It was needful then for us that nature should make its appearance first, and that afterwards what is corruptible should be absorbed in incorruption, and what is mortal in immortality. And it is for the sake of this exceeding good that man is made in the image of God, that he may be transferred to his likeness and may receive the knowledge of good and evil. Our good in this world is to believe God, to obey him, and to keep his commandments. This is the cause of our life. Our evil is to disobey God. This is the cause of our death. God therefore gave us a large mental light, that with its help we may know the good of obedience and the evil of disobedience, and that having experienced both of them, we may come to the making of a wise choice, and may not through our indolence be neglectors of his commands for we have much firmer and more certain knowledge of what has passed through our experience than of what we only know by conjecture and surmise. And were we left in ignorance of evil, how could we obtain the discipline of good? The experience of evil as well as of good begets a firmer determination to keep the good of life by obeying God and to shun the evil of death that comes of disobedience. But if we are thoughtless enough to neglect the two kinds of knowledge that come of this double experience, we unconsciously kill the man within us. How can you be a god before you are completed as a man? Or how can you expect to be perfect having come so recently into existence? How can you be immortal after failing in your mortal nature to obey your Creator? It is not you who make God, but God who makes you. And until you have been faithful to your state of man, God will not give you His glory. As you are of God's making, and as your creation is still going on, you must wait patiently for the hand of your Maker who will supply what is wanting in due course of time. Give your heart to him in a soft and pliable condition, like the clay in the potter's hands. For if you become hard, you will not be able to receive the impression of his plastic fingers. Keep that form into which the divine artist molds you. For by retaining the form that God may please to give you, you rise into perfection. Depend upon it that as the divine workman molds you into a better design, he will conceal your clay with silver and gold, and will adorn you with such perfection that the king will desire your beauty. But if you are stiff and unyielding, you repel the hand of the divine artist. You prove yourself ungrateful to his noble design and will lose the divine art that would form you and the divine workmanship that would perfect you and lose your own life as well. For whilst it depends on the divine goodness to make us perfect, it depends on our own submissiveness whether we will be made perfect so that only on the condition of our delivering ourselves with submissive confidence into his hands shall we receive his divine workmanship in return, and so become his perfect work. As God is able to raise up children to Abraham 
from the very stones. There is no want of power or skill on his part. But if instead of trusting yourself to him, you will fly from his hands, you are yourself the cause of your imperfect condition. It is you who will neither let your God perfect you, nor work with him that you may be perfected. Although a man may blind himself, he cannot destroy the light, which remains ever as before. He may avoid the light by going into the dark, because no one is compelled to accept his illumination, whether he will or not. God compels no one to accept his skill to make him perfect, against his own will. There is no question but that men are in their own power, but when they use their freedom to withdraw from their father's light, they transgress the law of liberty and lose the better things through their own fault. As God foresees and provides all things, he has prepared suitable dwellings, as well for those who love his light as for those who fly from his light. For those who with love thirst for his light, in his benignity he has prepared an incorruptible light. But for those who despise his light, who fly from its approach, and choose to blind themselves in darkness, he has prepared such mansions of darkness as befit the enemies of light, and such a subjection to punishment as befits them who will not be subject to him. To be subject to God is everlasting rest, but they that fly from light and peace and refuse God's rest will find a dwelling prepared for their restless condition, which is devoid of that light and peace from which they so willingly fly. It is they who, by abandoning God, defraud themselves of the good that is only to be found in God. And it is they who, by abandoning peace and rest, bring themselves into fellowship with pain. By their abandonment of light, they justly dwell in darkness. By choosing to withhold themselves from God's eternal light, which has in it the promise of eternal good, they are themselves the unhappy cause of receiving their dwelling in that everlasting darkness which is empty of all good. This, then, is the great plan of God's divine economy, that man should pass through all things and be tried in all, and have the experience of moral conduct before he comes to the resurrection from the dead. And after his experience has taught him who has delivered him, and from what he has been delivered, he will then be everlastingly grateful to God, and will greatly love him. For as the scripture says, To whom much is forgiven, he greatly loveth. He also learns by experience to know himself, and to understand how weak and mortal he is. He learns likewise by experience to know God, to know his goodness, mightiness, and immortality, since he gives immortality to that which is by nature mortal, and eternity to that which is by its natural constitution temporal. He also learns to know by experience the attributes of God, as in his exercise of them he reveals his greatness. For God is the glory of man, but man is the recipient of those providential operations that make known to him the wisdom, power, and mercy of God. As the physician makes his qualifications known by healing his patients, God makes his attributes known by healing man and giving him perfection. St. Paul has touched upon this profound reason of the divine economy where he says, God hath included all in unbelief, that he may have mercy on all. Man has only to abide in the love of God with subjection and gratitude, 
and he will receive from God the power to make progress and to reach his glorious end by becoming like to him who died for him. It was for this very purpose that God the Word was made like to sinful flesh, that he might condemn sin in the flesh and cast it out and call upon men to imitate his example. He laid his father's law upon them and called on them to imitate God by observing that law, that in becoming like to him they might deserve to see him. He was made man and dwelt in man, that whilst obeying his father's will he might accustom man to receive God, and accustom God to dwell in man. It is a useful danger, observes Titus of Bosra, even if it were not a necessary danger, that we should not be created absolutely good, but exposed at first to evil, for otherwise we should be wholly defeated of good. The man is good who is just and temperate, but he is just by abstaining from injustice, and temperate by abstaining from intemperance. What virtues could he carry to heaven if he had nothing to contend for, and nothing to contend against? If a man had been put to no trial between good and evil, the grand work of God's fatherly providence would never have brought his paternal attributes to all hearts nor would his wonderful condescension have been known to his human children. That infinite patience with his creatures, and that long forbearance with the ungrateful, would not have glorified our heavenly Father, have filled the angels and the just with wonder, and the penitent with consolation and astonishment. The untiring bounty and care of our Heavenly Father's providence, as it is exercised over his enemies as well as his friends, that maketh his Son to rise upon the good and the bad, and reigneth upon the just and the unjust, would not have filled heaven and earth with amazement at his goodness. Had we not been exposed to evil as well as good, the mercy of God that pursues the sinner with remorse, that turns sin into bitterness, that follows the sinner with yearning compassion, that is ever ready with life and healing to restore him to pardon and friendship, would not have revealed to his creatures the unspeakable tenderness of God. The divine power would not have come forth in all its magnificence, with love for its motive, and wisdom for its guide, to draw good with incredible abundance out of evil. Nor would the divine generosity have been displayed to his intelligent creatures in the truly godlike exercise of lifting up the lowly and the fallen, raising up the needy from the dust, and the poor from the dunghill, to make them sit with princes, even with the princes of his people. What, in short, should we have ever known of the fatherly attributes of our God that reveal the profound things of his heart, that inexhaustible goodness, that unconquerable patience, that infinite mercy, and unspeakable tenderness of love, had we never known weakness or evil? Were it possible, notwithstanding our free will and our origin from nothingness, and had it been so ordained that we should be created incapable of sinning, our human nature would never have been raised from a depth so low to a height so divine, by its personal union with God in the incarnation of His eternal Word for our redemption. Through that unspeakable union of God with man, we have obtained a divine head to the whole human race, for our greater union with God through the right of the divine humanity, and such an abundance of every kind of grace suited to our human condition as we could never have hoped for 
except at a fearful cost of the sacrifice of Christ, the Son of God. Again, if man had not been placed between good and evil, he would have had no history, as he could have made no progress. And what does this signify? That there would be no eternal remembrance for the heavens of that wonderful and most ample course of God's dealing with men through the ages, or of man's continual combat with evil, and of his deliverance from evil to good. The prophets, the law, the gospel would not have been. The apostles, the martyrs, the fathers, the saints, all perfected through suffering, would not have been under divine direction. The successive illuminators of the world and the wonder-workers of God's wisdom and power. The solemn rite of sacrifice would not have worshipped God in the former ages, foreshadowing the cross and keeping up men's hopes and trust in a divine deliverer. Nor should we have seen God in our nature, in human habit like our own, walking before us in example, bearing our sins and sorrows, enlightening us with heavenly truth in a human way, and giving us assurance that by following him we come to God and even to the mountain of his vision. We should never have had that sublime and awful demonstration of God's justice or that crowning proof of his inexhaustible love in the sacrifice of his Son upon the cross for the remission of our sins, which shall be sung as the hymn of the glorified throughout eternity. Nor should we have known the exceeding humility and charity of the Son of God, whose spirit flows in grace to heal the wounds of fallen humanity. Before the question is asked, why God did not make man perfect and sinless from the first, it must be remembered that we are speaking of God's earthly dispensation, and that for reasons profound beyond our search, as well as for reasons made known to us, it was the eternal plan to have a great earthly dispensation, with a wonderful exercise of the divine power, wisdom, mercy, and goodness, and that the greater the difficulties arising from the weak elements of this creation, all the more grand and glorious is the divine triumph in raising up such a vast amount of everlasting good from elements so weak and from wills so unstable. It should also be remembered that if we had never known our weakness, we should never have known what strength we receive from God to accomplish our union with Him. Had we never been liable to sin, we should never have been taken from the stock of Adam to be engrafted on the divine humanity of Christ. Had we been without free will, we should have been incapable of love and incapable of devotedness. Just think of a blessedness in which you could not love, or be grateful, or be generous. Just think of a blessedness in which you could not freely give yourselves as children to the Father of your blessedness. Had we been created perfect without our will and cooperation, it would have been rather a passive than an active perfection, more like that of a material than of a free and spiritual nature. Had we been created in heaven rather than on earth, we must have been creatures of another kind. And had we been there made perfect at once, we could never have known our nature and what it is in itself as apart from the divine gifts by which it is perfected. The angels, therefore, were placed on trial and left capable of sin before they were perfected. Had we not been tried and found wanting until the inmost core of our nature was searched through with divine light and grace, 
the deepest grounds for that profound and sweet humility which is the soul's inmost expression of truthful sincerity justice and right dependence would not be there to make her virtue most pleasing to god those highest motives of gratitude for the deliverance from evil would be wanting to the soul and finally the overpowering argument to superabounding love arising from the contrast between all that god has pardoned in the past and all the beatitude he gives in the everlasting present would not be there to perfect the ardor of grateful love for to whom less is forgiven he loveth less end of lecture ten part three Lecture 11, Part 1 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 11, The Fall of Man in Connection with the Fall of the Angels and the Redemption of Christ. Part 1. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 If there be an absurd way of denying accepted truth, it must be that of withholding the mind from the evidence. Yet this is the ordinary course followed by what are called free thinkers in religion. Like all the most evident things, religion is her own witness and carries her own credentials proves how well she is fitted to the deepest requirements of human nature and explains that nature as nothing else can do but the free thinker first withdraws his mind and heart from religion and then undertakes to settle the cause of religion in her absence so far however is this mode of proceeding from simplifying the condition of human life or from removing its perplexities, that it only augments them a thousandfold, whilst it leaves nothing whatever explained. For when a man rejects the revelation of God, and refuses to believe his descent and inheritance from the fallen Adam, he finds nothing so hard to explain as the condition of humanity and his own position in this mysterious world. The common refuge of theory-makers is to assume that man is descended from primitive ancestors that were rude, brutal, and but little removed from animal life, and that he has developed with time into an intellectual and moral perfection as the result of progressive civilization. But however plausible this theory may look to the mere rational man at first sight, and when taken apart from the history of his race, it will not bear a close inspection. An effect cannot be greater than its cause. The brutal man could not produce the intellectual and moral man from a mere change of external circumstances. He must have within him the light of intellectual and moral principles. If these principles and powers are not already within him, they must have been subsequently implanted by some great intellectual and moral cause, which would be equivalent to a new creation. The theory of human advancement from an inhuman condition is contradicted by the whole tradition of the human race, which has brought everywhere the remembrance of a primeval state of innocence and happiness from which man has fallen. And to this external tradition must be added the internal consciousness of man, bearing witness to the historic fact and making him sensible to the very center of his nature, that he is not what he was created, but has undergone some sad and calamitous deterioration. When faith, therefore, comes to teach us the history of our fall, 
we at once find the solution of the riddle of human life and the manifest reply to many anxious questionings of the soul the proofs of the fall are everywhere to the mind that looks for them we see them in the condition of man and in the condition of the world we hear them in the voice of humanity in the testimonies of history and the revelations of god those however who measure the state and progress of man by inapplicable tests are sure to go wrong the true state of human progress is not to be found in accumulated property nor in the knowledge of sublunary things nor in social polish but in the advancement of man towards his supreme good towards which a simple and unpretentious mode of life resting mainly on the providence of god is the most favorable the savage represents not the primitive life of man but the corruption of that life if on the other hand we examine the early civilizations as represented in the founding of cities we find them taking their rise from the atrocious conquests of ambitious chiefs who hunt their fellow men seize upon their possessions and reduce them to a life of miserable slavery even the polished greeks and imperial romans based their civilization on no better foundation then the city itself and its founders become the object of men's worship in place of god every great and complicated civilization when it is not strongly imbued and tempered with the principles of christian faith gives rise to a vast amount of mental and moral corruption and by the unequal distribution of the goods of this life occasions a mass of misery beyond the power of the state to remedy it is difficult therefore and even impossible to think that mere human civilization can be the chief cause of human perfection and happiness if we look to the dawn of history we find a race of men leading a simple pastoral life in their families having few material wants conversing with god and worshipping him in simplicity of heart the scope of their mind is turned more to heavenly than to earthly things these are the descendants of seth and enos and they are called the sons of god we see another race who build cities of course by the usual expedients of conquest and slavery they forge metals into weapons of war and invent musical instruments probably for idolatrous worship as well as war these are the descendants of cain and they are called the children of men from this first civilization came the first great corruption of human life but after the sons of god formed alliances with the daughters of men after the godly race had united with the ungodly race and shared in their corrupt civilization the whole human family corrupted its way and then came the deluge of water to sweep out the deluge of iniquity however great then may be the value of a true civilization and however it may be in the order of divine providence it is undeniable that the world has seen a vast amount of false civilization resulting in the most calamitous corruption of human nature to measure the well-being of man by the standard of civilization as it consists in crowded populations in accumulation of wealth in artificial modes and fashions of life in the unceasing toil of the multitude in the ease and leisure of the few and in the ambition of all to rise above their neighbors in show and social status is to utterly mistake the nature of man and the elements that constitute his happiness it is not in the crowded ways of human life that a man strengthens feeds and elevates his mind and gives vigor and tone to his moral character 
but in the retirement of domestic life or in the retreats of solitude. And he spoke wisely and well who said, I never retire from among men without finding myself less a man. The one question decisive of human happiness is whether a man most seeks God or himself. For there is but one fundamental law of human progress and perfection, and that is the progress of the man towards his supreme good and final end. And to this principle all the cares and concerns of this life are subordinate. From this principle it necessarily follows that a people who live by faith and make their religion the first object of their life will never exhibit to the eyes of worldly men as great an appearance of worldly prosperity as they who make this world their first object and God but a secondary consideration. They have much less of this world's ambition. They are not eager for display, whether of their bodily or mental good. They are not always on the stretch after this world's goods. They make not their life an unbroken toil after money or distinction, as if it were the one virtue of human nature. They are more blessed, nevertheless, in the material goods that they know they have received from God, because they have fewer wants, and use their temporal goods with temperance and moderation, and are free in giving for the love of God, which is a great joy of life. In the eye of wisdom, the true test of social economy and the just standard of civilization do not consist in the amount of wealth and the spread of ideas possessed by society at large, however distributed, but in the way in which such circumstances affect the souls of men in their individual capacity, as they are persons created for God, and not merely as they are members of a human commonwealth, where one contributes mind and the sense of superiority, and a hundred contribute unwearied toil and the sense of inferiority. To return from this digression, a great proof of the fall of man shines forth from the first dawn of history, in the expectation entertained by man of a divine deliverer, and in the vicarious sacrifices in which the belief and hope of that deliverer is expressed. It is difficult to imagine how this mode of worshipping God could have arisen and spread through the world without an adequate cause. It is impossible to suppose that this universal practice of propitiatory sacrifices spread everywhere with the human race, from their earliest remembrances until they reached the sacrifice of redemption, could have originated with mankind unless there had been an original commandment from God to which the sense of his fallen condition and of the want of a divine deliverance led man to correspond. We find a line of prophetic men from the earliest period of human life who keep up the teaching of the one true God and of the promised deliverer until that line centers in a prophetic family and that family grows into a prophetic nation. The history of that nation becomes famous in the world, and its records are filled with the actions of God as the governor and guide of that people. They are constantly suffering for their infidelity to the voice of God, yet they record their own guiltiness and never cease from offering sacrifices in hope of their divine deliverer, who shall free the whole world from evil. The more they sin, the more they disobey, the more they reveal the weakness of human nature, the more loud and strenuous becomes the voice of their prophets, portraying the whole character of that divine deliverer, even to the minutest particulars, 
with all the harrowing circumstances of his sufferings and death. The very prophets themselves are the vivid figures in their own persons of his life and sufferings. And whilst this prophetic nation exhibits a light to the whole world, which the world is slow to perceive, even amid the grossest corruptions of paganism, three fundamental truths, however much abused, are still discernible among the nations at large. That man has fallen from a primitive state of happiness, that the divinity is to be propitiated by vicarious sacrifices, and that man is in want of a divine deliverer. Hence, though they lost sight of the true God, they still feigned to themselves some God or other, born of a woman, whom they invoked as the helper and deliverer of man. And upon these three fundamental ideas, which seem to be inherent in man, when purged of all their errors and superstitions, Christianity was grafted. St. Paul appealed to what Tertullian calls this natural Christianity of the human soul when he preached the unknown God to the Athenians. There is nothing isolated in the universe. Between heaven and earth there is a perpetual correspondence. All things that are like are drawn towards each other by the attraction of their likeness. There are many relations established between the things above and the things beneath, which are the most clearly seen by the purest minds. The two great divisions of created intelligences notwithstanding the great difference of their constitution, have many things in common. They have one Creator, Lord and Father. They have one and the same divine illuminator of their intelligence. They have one and the same principle of their perfection in the grace of the Holy Spirit. They have the likeness of God in common and the spiritual virtues in common and their chief interests in common. The supreme good of angels and of men is one and the same, and as they were created to meet in one common good and in one eternal society with God, they have a mutual interest in each other, and in proportion to their goodness are attracted towards each other. As the first and brightest of intelligent creations, the angels are called in the book of Job the morning stars and the sons of God. When the foundations of the earth were laid for the habitation of mankind, we are divinely told that the morning stars sang together and the sons of God made a joyful melody. To the angelic hosts, the creation of man was a great and joyful event for it brought them brethren in a new sphere of intelligent life and opened to them a ministry of charity to those brethren in the day of their trial and a most honorable service. For as St. Paul tells us, they are all ministering spirits sent to minister to them who shall receive the inheritance of salvation. This is ever the divine way that God should show his royal generosity and absence of all jealousy by ennobling his creatures in giving them high offices and ministries so that those who are superior may enlighten, protect, and serve those of their brethren who are still inferior in place and weak in good. Having passed their own probation and reached their final good, they receive this additional honor, happiness, and likeness to God, that they are made the ministers of God to men, to be a charitable help to those who are striving to obtain their final end. If we take the concordance in hand and turn to the word angel, you will find that from the beginning to the end of the scriptures, the ministry of angels to men is recorded in more than three hundred places. 
if you scan the mythologies of the gentiles with an intelligent view to their first origin it is difficult to resist the conclusion that they originated in the corruption of the earlier belief in the ministry of angels the very strifes between the inferior gods and the revolutions in the heavens which those mythologies celebrate are but the clouded and perverted reminiscence of the conflict of the good and evil angels and the fall of the latter from their principalities god is not far from each one of us nor the ministering angels who are with god st paul therefore teaches the hebrews you are come to mount zion and to the city of the living god the heavenly jerusalem and to the company of many thousands of angels and to the church of the firstborn who are written in heaven and to god the judge of all and to the spirits of the just made perfect the angels were created in a place of probation to which the scriptures give the name of heaven although it was not the heaven of beatitude where they lived by faith and contemplation until having stood their trial they passed to the eternal vision of god pure spirits they received excelling gifts above their nature and by their fidelity they perfected their love the eternal word was their illuminator and therefore their mediator and the holy spirit was by his gifts of grace their sanctifier and their perfecter but like ourselves they were made from nothing and were consequently by nature weak and changeable their nature was weak though their gifts were strong let them once lose their humility and the more noble their gifts the greater the peril of their appropriating as their own what they have divinely received from god and so falling from god through the vice of pride and the descent from justice as it is the office of the higher intelligences among men to enlighten guide and influence those who are endowed with less intelligence so it is the office of the higher orders of angelic intelligences to illuminate the lower orders with their superior light and influence now lucifer was one of the noblest and most highly endowed among the angelic hosts who like some great heresiarch drew a third of the angels into his apostasy from god revolting in their pride as pure spirits from the divine author of their good acting from no corporal weakness and under no influence from an external temper these angels greatly sinned against so great a light and with so great a pride that their fall was irreparable there is no redemption for them and st paul assures us that jesus nowhere takes hold of the angels but of the seed of abraham he taketh hold the great mystery of redemption from sin and of a new headship to the creation was preordained in favor of the human race and this most amazing of all mysteries was partly revealed to the angels during their probation as a test of their faith and humility and by their faith in this mystery or their revolt from its revelation the angels stood in the truth or fell but this requires a larger explanation how magnificent were the endowments of those angels before their fall and how terrible the pride through which they fell may be gathered from the prophet ezekiel where he describes the fall of their leader as a type of the fall of the king of tyre thou wast the seal of resemblance full of wisdom and perfect in beauty thou wast the pleasure of the paradise of god every precious stone was thy covering thou wast a cherub stretching out thy wings and covering and i set thee in the holy mountain of god thou hast walked in the midst of the stones of fire 
Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day of thy creation, until iniquity was found in thee. And I cast thee out from the mountain of God, and destroyed thee, O covering cherub, out of the midst of the stones of fire. And thy heart was lifted up in thy beauty, and thou hast lost thy wisdom in thy beauty. I have cast thee to the ground. The height of ambition to which Lucifer aspired in his pride is more fully described by the prophet Isaiah, where he puts forward as the type of the king of Babylon. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, who didst rise in the morning? How art thou fallen to the earth that didst wound the nations? And thou saidst in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit in the mountain of the covenant, in the sides of the north I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like to the Most High, but yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, into the depth of the pit. This description points to an ambition on the part of Lucifer, to take the headship of creation and of the covenant in place of the Son of God. It is an intimation that the pride of the great cherub rose to its intolerable pitch of insolence through jealousy of the predestined incarnation of the Son of God, and through the defeat of an ambition to take the headship of the creation. St. Paul is frequent in urging the truth that although the angels were appointed to minister to men in what concerns their salvation, yet they are not the saviors of men. To which he asks of the angels, hath God said at any time, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God adore him. Here is a plain indication that when the Incarnation was revealed to the angels, they were commanded to adore the Son of God in the form of man. Again the Apostle asks, To which of the angels said he at any time, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thy enemies my footstool? And he shows that God would not subject the world to the angels and so give them the headship, but that in Jesus Christ he lifted up man to a condition above the angels, through his death putting all things under his feet, destroying the empire of death, that is to say, the devil, for he nowhere layeth hold of the angels, but of the seed of Abraham he layeth hold. If we unite this doctrine of St. Paul, with the description of the fall of Lucifer by Isaiah, the conclusion rises to the strongest probability that there was some mysterious ambition and jealousy among the proud angels respecting the Incarnation, and some mysterious rejection of them in connection with that mystery. This is fully brought out by St. John in the Apocalypse, where the vision depicts the fall of Satan and his angels as the type of Antichrist and his followers. In that most wonderful book, the incarnate word of God is the central figure. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. We are made to see the whole course of the angelic history, as well as of our human history, ending in good or evil, according as angels or men conduct themselves towards the mystery of human redemption. There the influence of angels, both good and evil, upon the destinies of mankind, are clearly shown. There we behold that mystery of the divine incarnation as the beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. There we see the great patience of God in the exercise of his providence, ruling all things in view of the final exaltation of the just with his incarnate Son, 
and of the final overthrow of his adversaries with their chief instigator, Satan. The Apocalypse is the prophecy of prophecies, unlocking the final sense of all preceding prophets, and drawing from the conflict of the good and evil angels in heaven on account of the first revelation of the predestined incarnation, the type of the conflict on earth between faith and infidelity, between the church and the unbelieving world, as they respect that mystery accomplished. Such is the character of all prophecy. One person is put as the type of another, one group of events becomes the type of another where the principle of the conflict continues the same. In the Apocalypse, the mother of Christ is put forth as the type of the church, which is the mother of the faithful. And as Mary is the spouse of the Holy Ghost, so the church is the spouse of Christ. And Satan is put forth with profound significance as the type of Antichrist. The conflict of the good and evil angels, resulting from the vision of the Son of God as the Son of the glorified woman, is more than a type of the conflict between the societies of faith and infidelity on earth, forasmuch as the good and evil angels are seen to take their sides and actually join in the conflict between good and evil, even to the consummation of all things. And the temple of God was seen in heaven, writes St. John, and the ark of the testament was seen in the temple. Christ is the testament, Mary is the ark of the testament. As St. John of Damascus says, she is the animated ark of the living God. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon beneath her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried out travailing in birth, and was in pain to be delivered. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great dragon having seven heads and ten thorns, and on his head seven diadems, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, that when she should be delivered, he might devour her son. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her son was taken up to God and to his throne. This great dragon is afterwards called that old serpent who is called the devil, who seduceth the whole world. The first of the two great signs in heaven is the glorified mother of God incarnate in our humanity, for her son is taken up to God and to his throne, and none but God can sit upon the throne of God. But as a type of the church, a part of this description refers to the sufferings through which the children of the church are brought to God, the other sign, the great dragon lying in wait to destroy the child after his birth, is Satan, the type of Antichrist, as he is his instigator. This type was first fulfilled in Herod, who sought the death of the child, from whom he was saved by the flight of the woman through the desert into Egypt. Both St. Peter and St. Paul speak of the divine incarnation as predestined before all ages and all creation. St. Paul applies to it the words of the psalm, Sacrifice and oblation thou wouldst not, but thou hast fitted a body to me. Behold, I come, in the head of the book it is written of me, that I should do thy will, O God. St. Peter speaks of the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, foreknown indeed before the constitution of the world, but manifested in the last times. St. Paul says again, We have redemption through his blood, 
who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Whilst in the Apocalypse Christ is called the beginning of the creation of God. End of Lecture 11, Part 1Lecture 11, Part 2 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 11, The Fall of Man in Connection with the Fall of the Angels and the Redemption of Christ. Part 2. What then is more probable than that when the angels were tried in faith, and their humility tested they received the revelation of the future incarnation of the word of god through whom they themselves were both created and illuminated and who being made so much better than the angels as he hath inherited a more excellent name than they yet was made a little lower than the angels and for the sufferings of death crowned with glory and honour whom the Father hath set over all his works, and hath subjected all things under his feet. St. Paul intimates this trial of the angelic faith when he says, When he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God adore him. This clearly points to a command that the angels of God should worship the incarnate Son upon their very first introduction to the mystery. That the name and mystery of Christ is intimately connected with the fall of Satan, our Lord himself seems to intimate. When the seventy-two disciples returned to him with joy, saying, Lord, the devils also are subject to us in thy name, he said to them, I saw Satan like lightning falling from heaven. What then was the trial of the angels? In what difficult truth did the majority of their number stand steadfast, whilst a third part of them stood not in the truth? They were tried by faith as we are tried. Were they tried by the self-same mystery of faith by which the world is tried? The angels knew the eternal word of God as their creator and illuminator, and the vision of St. John presents them as tried by the sign or vision of the birth of a divine child from woman, who is taken up to the throne of God, after which there immediately springs a great conflict between the good and evil angels, one side cleaving to God and the other rising in rebellion against God. This view of the subject is confirmed in other parts of the scriptures. St. Peter tells us that the angels long to look down into the deep mystery of redemption, and he tells us further that the angels, powers, and virtues are made subject to Christ. But this longing to penetrate the mystery indicates a knowledge begun in faith, though not consummated in vision. And as the sublime and awful mystery was revealed to men so long before its accomplishment, why should it not have been revealed yet earlier to the angels? The knowledge of the divine incarnation concerned them intimately, and in more ways than as a trial of their faith and submission. Christ was to sit in his humanity at the right hand of the Father, to hold the primacy over the angels as well as over men, and they were to be subject under his feet. When he enters into the world, all the angels of God are to adore him. Making purgation of sins, says the apostle, he sitteth on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath inherited a greater name than they. Again, at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And once more, 
the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, raising him up from the dead, setting him on his right hand in the heavenly places, above all principality and power and virtue and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that place which is to come. And he has subjected all things under his feet. We already see what a great interest the angels have in the mystery of the Incarnation. But this is not all. St. Paul teaches that there was a renewal and re-establishment of all things in heaven as well as on earth through the blood of Christ. And whilst he tells this to the Ephesians, he tells the Colossians that it is the will of the Father, through him, to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, both as to the things on earth and the things in heaven. And let this be remarked, that the fall of Satan and his angels from heaven is represented in the Apocalypse as immediately following the opposition of Satan to the child born of the woman, to the child that sits on the throne of God, and that straightway after their fall, St. John heard the exclamations of the angels who stood faithful and firm in the truth, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of God, and the power of his Christ. From this it would seem obvious that the angels were saved through their faith put on its trial, through the revelation of the divine incarnation, and through their humility in adoring God, clothed in a form less noble than their own. All this again tends to show what great interest the angels had in the divine mystery of the incarnation, and in the whole condition of humanity. How the good angels could be saved through Christ, though they had never fallen, is explained in the ancient book on the divine names, where the author says, Would any one praise that salvation, whereby all things are protected from things that are worse? We allow the praise of this first of all salvations that keeps things so steadfast and unchangeable as not to sink down into evil. It is by no means beyond the scope of sacred theology to praise this kind of salvation that delivers any nature from the loss of that good which accords with its kind. The theologians, therefore, call this also by the name of redemption, because it suffers not the creature to fall back towards nothingness. But this is the salvation of the angels, who by the power of divine grace stood in the truth revealed to them and kept their innocence. St. Ignatius the martyr, therefore, says to the Smyrnians that if the glorious angels and princes, whether visible or invisible, Believe not in the blood of Christ, it is to their condemnation. And St. Jerome says in his comment on the Ephesians that the Son of God descended into the lowest regions of the earth and went up above all the heavens, not only that he might fulfill the law and the prophets, but that he might also execute certain hidden dispensations which are only known to himself and to the Father. We know not after what manner the blood of Christ profited the angels, but we know nevertheless that it did profit them. St. Bernard asks in his exposition of the Canticles how Christ could be the redemption of the angels, and he gives the answer in these terms. He who raised up man from his fall gave to the angel who stood that he might not fall. Whilst he thus rescued man from captivity, he protected the angel from captivity. In that way, he was equally a redemption to both, delivering the one and preserving the other. It is thus made plain how Christ the Lord was redemption to the holy angels, as he was their justice 
wisdom, and sanctification. We may now return with greater light to the vision of St. John. The part already quoted most certainly refers to the divine incarnation and to Satan as the adversary of that wonderful mystery. And these scenes in heaven are typical of the perpetual combat between Christ in his church and Satan in the world. St. Methodius says that this was a belief in the church, and St. Augustine tells his people that they knew it to be so. This vision of the incarnation of the Son of God is also a direct blow at the Corinthians and the Ebionites, the sects denying the incarnation against whom St. John wrote his gospel. The rod of iron with which the divine child was to rule the nations is the attribute of Christ both in the second psalm and in an earlier part of the apocalypse. No sooner is Satan defeated of his aim and the child taken up to God and his throne than there was a great battle in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who seduceth the whole world. And he was cast unto the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This is a literal description of the fall of the angels, followed immediately upon the revelation of the woman giving birth to the child who ascends to the throne of God. The conflict between spiritual intelligences is, of course, a conflict with spiritual weapons. The angels that stood firm contended with faith, with humility, and with submission to the great revelation of the incarnate word, whilst the unfaithful angels fought against God and his angels with their pride and rebellion, and not standing in the truth, they fell and were cast out. The archangel who led the faithful angels took up the word Michael for his cry, that is to say, who is like to God, and it became his designation. The leader of the rebellious hosts received the name of Satan, which means the adversary, and this became his designation. Here you must especially note how Isaiah, Ezekiel, and St. John accord in stating that Satan was cast upon the earth. Our Lord also calls Satan the prince of this world, and St. Paul describes the wicked angels as the rulers of the world of this darkness, the spirits of wickedness in high places. On this part of the vision St. John is explicit, as we shall see directly. And there was evidently some great purpose contemplated in permitting the entrance of the evil spirits into this world before their final punishment. No sooner are they cast out of heaven than St. John hears the rejoicings of the good angels over their victory and a loud voice saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, because the accuser of our brethren is cast forth. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Undoubtedly there is a blending of the heavenly and earthly victories in these lines, yet the angels attribute their salvation and strength the passing of their trial and the coming of their kingdom to the power of Christ and to the virtue of his blood. And now, being secure of their own salvation, they show an intense solicitude for that of their brethren on the earth. Hence a portentous cry is heard from one of them, Woe to the earth and to the sea! because the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast upon the earth, he persecuted the woman and her seed. 
the whole of this narrative is profoundly significant it is more than a vision it is the history of what had passed in the heaven of the angels blended with prophecy of what shall pass upon the earth the principle involved in the heavenly as well as in the earthly conflict is faith in the incarnation of the son of god the strife between the good and evil angels only ceases in the heavens to be transferred to the earth and there the contest is renewed for the souls of men who stand or fall as the angels stood or fell by their fidelity or infidelity to the mystery and grace of the incarnation the good angels are christ's ministers to protect men from evil and draw them to the grace of christ contending against the evil spirits for our salvation the bad angels are the ministers of their own malice and envy contending for man's destruction they lost their own good in refusing obedience and worship to the god-made man and for that very reason they seek to destroy the good of man and to draw him into their own apostasy the scriptures everywhere record this contest of spirits good and bad for the salvation or destruction of man and even the pagan world was conscious of being surrounded by invisible powers inferior to god that exercise a great influence over mankind for weal or woe the fall of satan began in self-love and developed into a pride so monstrous as to aim at independence by an enormous abuse of god's gifts he sought to make himself the centre of good and of dominion he was ambitious to usurp the headship of creation in place of the word made man his defeated pride burst forth into a fixed and unchangeable hatred of god and into an equal hatred of man because of the elevation of human nature in the son of god above the angelic hosts hence his hatred of the image of god in man hence his malicious enmity to all mankind hence his undying envy of that race of mortals which is destined to fill up the seats vacated in heaven by him and his followers as he plotted the destruction of the divine child revealed to him as born of woman and has been plotting the destruction of man from that time to this our lord says of him that he was a manslayer from the beginning the question now arises why did god permit satan to enter the world and to seek the destruction of man although the judgments of god are unsearchable and his ways past finding out yet he has not left us without some knowledge of those ways man must be tried as the angels were tried that those who are faithful may be approved man must be searched through that he may know that his strength is not in himself he must be tempted as the angels were tempted how else shall he know the weakness of his nature and the gift and the power of divine grace if he conquers as the faithful angels conquered he will be crowned with glory and honor if he fall as many angels fell it is because of some terrible weakness and it is good for him to find that weakness out because it is unsuited to the everlasting kingdom for the mercy of our heavenly father has provided that his fall shall not be irreparable and that he shall not perish in that just proving of his frailty but that he shall be able to obtain all the strength that he needs from a new head and saviour of the human race satan has no power over the man if the man be only vigilant and faithful he cannot oppress him with violence 
he has no power to compel him against his will and inclination, whilst every caution is given him beforehand. Satan must find an ally in the man himself before he can overthrow him and take possession. He can only proceed by stratagems and beguilements. Each of the combatants has a helper. If Satan has his serpent, the man has the grace of God, as well as the command of God to steady him. The insidious assault is aimed at God as well as at the man, and though the man may be worsted, God cannot be conquered. The man finds out his weakness. God provides the remedy. But if man had been withheld from the combat, Satan would not have been overthrown. St. Chrysostom puts the case in the following parable. An athlete enters the arena and challenges two others to the combat. One of them is weak, unpracticed, and soon vanquished in the conflict. The other is strong and perfect in all athletic exercises. But if you refuse the challenge and prohibit the trial, whose honor would be injured? The honor of the weak one who is so quickly overcome, or the honor of the strong one who conquers for both? God created man just to show his justice and good to show his goodness, and placed him in paradise to show his bounty. But after his weakness had been revealed to him, it was good for him to be cast out of paradise, that he might win greater fortitude under a sterner discipline. It was good for him to learn by his defeat and failure that his strength is in God and not in himself and that it is only through the divine power that Satan is vanquished and kept at a distance. Thus did, by the fall of one, strength and salvation come to all. For behold, God descends in a cause that is his own as well as ours. It was against the woman and her divine child that Satan warred in heaven, it was against the mother of mankind that he first spread his deceits on earth. He approaches her disguisedly, questions her insidiously, awakens her curiosity, allures her by the senses with desire of the forbidden fruit, prompts her to the pride of independence, and insinuates the ambition of becoming like to God, knowing good and evil. Thus outwardly allured by the tempter, she swells inwardly with pride against the command, and that pride breaks forth outwardly into manifold evil. She plucked the fruit and did eat, and her disobedience was consummated. Then the woman became the tempter of the man. She gave him the fruit with ensnaring words and endearments, and he did eat and his disobedience was also consummated. But mark the result. The eyes of both were opened, and they perceived themselves to be naked. Their sin revealed to them the whole of their infirmity. Whilst sin is yet in progress, the inward pride from which it springs goes on increasing. It swells, it inebriates, it blinds the soul and that with the constantly augmented appearance of a greater good. But no sooner is the evil consummated than the eyes are opened and the delusion vanishes. The soul has turned from God and the spiritual life has departed. Nature remains, but its happy condition is changed into disorder and is wounded to its center. Clothed heretofore in soul with God's grace, and in body with innocence and purity, and having had no experience of a worse state of existence, the eyes of the human pair were opened to their past good by their present evil, and they find themselves naked both in body and soul. 
having broken from the rule of God, their bodies break away from the rule of their enfeebled and discordant souls. Shame covers them with confusion. Fear fills them with distress, the sickness of the soul in her loss, the sadness of the spirit in its bereavement of vital force, the sense of defilement, the hollowness of a life now first estranged from the life of God, and the terror of death shoot the keenest pangs as of spiritual dissolution through the conscience into all their being. As far as they yet know, they are not only fallen from God, but are cast away without the hope of deliverance, and in their dread of divine judgment they hide themselves, as if poor blinded mortals that could be from the presence of God. But this is God's cause. It was in hatred of God and of God's image in man that Satan tempted the parents of the human race. It was hatred of the predestined woman and her divine child, whose revelation had tested his faith and the faith of his followers, and found them wanting, that inspired Satan to seek the destruction of the mother of mankind. The woman fell through Satan, and the man through the woman. They found out their nothingness, and were humbled to the dust. Still, it is God's cause. And what is worthy of profound reflection, the remedy was found in that very mystery which Satan and his angels had assailed in heaven, and for infidelity to which they were cast upon the earth. The parents of mankind had abandoned their Creator, and have given their faith and obedience to his adversary. They have lost their claim to the divine protection, and deserve to be abandoned to themselves. But there is another side to the question, forasmuch as God's honor, his infinite greatness, and divine dignity are involved. It is not becoming that his magnificent plan should be defeated through the machinations of an adversary whom he had cast out of heaven for his crimes. God created man for his own glory, and predestined his nature to everlasting union with himself. And inasmuch as the malice of Satan was more aimed at his creator than at man, it became the infinite majesty and was most worthy of the divine goodness, that he should rescue man from his misery, and defeat the malignity of Satan. The greater part of the angels stood firm, and the angelic nature was saved and glorified in all its orders. But as the whole race of man was centered in Adam, the whole of humanity fell in him. The angels are pure spirits, they are more intelligent than man, and less exposed to temptation. To whatever they give themselves, whether to good or evil, they are more fixed in their determination. The angels that fell went wrong of their own free action, and were under no evil influence. But man was seduced by the spirit of evil. Hence, whilst the fall of the angels was irreparable, man was created to fill their vacant seats, so that if man is saved, the divine plan is not defrauded of its end, and the seats of glory are filled. St. Athanasius boldly declares that it would be unworthy of God's goodness to suffer his own work in man to be destroyed through the devil's fraud. It would be unbecoming that God's workmanship in man should become extinct, whether through his own negligence or through the devil's imposition. The devil could not be allowed so to gain his end as to deprive God of the glory of perfecting his own work. The great St. Leo has argued the point in these terms. Forasmuch as the devil glorified, that man had lost the divine gifts through his fraud and deception, and had so been stripped of his immortality, and placed under the stern sentence of death, 
and forasmuch as the same Satan had obtained a solace to his wickedness in bringing over a companion to his prevarication, it pleased God to change the first sentence passed on man, a sentence both just and deservedly severe, and passed on one whom he had established in honor. But this demanded the dispensation of God's secret counsel, that he who is unchangeable, and whose will cannot lose its benignity, may complete his fatherly design in a mystery more hidden, and that, however driven to crime by the devil's craft and wickedness, man may not perish in opposition to the whole intention of God. This mystery, hidden from the foundation of the world, although partly revealed to the angels for another purpose, this secret within the divine reserves, is the incarnation of the word of God. God might have created another Adam, and have endowed him with new grace. But what could this new man have done for the old Adam? What security was there that another mere creature would not have failed like the first? Some mighty angel might have been sent to vanquish Satan, as Michael did of old. But how could he have atoned for man? How could he have given him that grace of reconciliation which must be the work of God? How could he have given a new and heavenly birth unto the countless children of Adam? The sin of man has a certain relative infinity in its malice as being against the infinite sanctity and majesty of God. The divine goodness has been defeated in its aim, and the divine gifts have been violated by the sin of man. God's glorious workmanship has also been defiled. The fallen Adam is the destined father of countless children, all as yet incorporated in him and all to be born of him in the course of time. They are predestined to cover the earth through the long ages, yet they are all by nature partakers of his fall. It is a case demanding a divine intervention of the most extraordinary kind, for it is a far less work of divine power and wisdom to create man than to recreate him from a moral ruin. This calls for the intervention of the firmest, the most profound, the most divine of moral powers. As the iniquity is human, it must be atoned for in a human way. But as it has a relative infinity of guilt, as being committed against God, the atonement must be divine. The root of the evil is pride of heart, the venomous element of all sin, and this must be supplanted by a new humility. Its outcome is the loss of subjection to God and disobedience to His voice, and this must be exchanged for a new submission and a new obedience. The inward rebellion of the will issues forth in the rebellion of the senses, defiling the whole man, and this must be rectified through suffering and self-denial. The whole man is turned from God, and through divine power must the whole man be turned to God anew. Divine life must, therefore, enter into our human nature, not as it is sinful, but into a human nature divinely prepared and untouched by sin anticipating the merits of the redemption to be wrought, a daughter of Adam was prepared pure from all sin, and from her that pure humanity was divinely created, in which the Son of God laid hold of death, and by his death defeated death, and restored us to life. Each kind of sin must have its expiation before the virtue it has destroyed can have its supernatural restoration. Not only for Adam and Eve, 
but also for the myriads of mortals that spring from their marvelous fertility this expiation this conquest of sin of death and the devil this humility this self-denial this fortitude of obedience this grace of all the virtues will be needed that god may accomplish his grand intention of securing the final object of man's creation end of lecture eleven part two lecture eleven part three of the endowments of man by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture eleven the fall of man in connection with the fall of the angels and the redemption of christ part three the mercy of god is inseparable from his justice and his justice from his mercy how shall these divine attributes act together in such a way that both may be completely satisfied as justice is no longer left in man how shall it appear in him anew how shall mercy descend to him in the company of justice god brings forth the hidden mystery of his eternal counsel the word of god through whom all things were made hath alone the power to renew all things and unquestionably the greatest renovation which calls for the divinest power is to replace injustice with justice and pride with humility to raise fallen souls out of the abyss of sin and to bring them back to god from that infinite distance to which they were banished from his friendship in obedience to his father's will the son of god takes human nature into his person and makes that nature everlastingly secure he does this before the ages in divine intention and actually in due course of time he takes the headship of the human race in place of the fallen adam and with the headship of the human race the headship also of the angels and of all creation in the person of god but in the nature of man yet in the purity and sanctity of his divinity he offers that human nature in atonement in justice in intercession for his adopted brethren upon which the father is well pleased to look he shall be born of that pure and predestined virgin who was revealed to the angels and was described to men by the prophets born not of man but of the operation of the holy spirit and so shall have his human origin in a way wholly different from the other children of adam as satan brought sin and death into the world through the first woman he shall be vanquished and his arms taken from him through the child of the second woman and as the human race formed one corporation with the fallen adam they shall by faith be incorporated with a better adam inseparable from god from whom grace and justice shall descend as from the head to the members yet so that he first offer atonement for the sins of men and substitute his divine humility and obedience for our pride and rebellion let me now ask your gravest attention to the following sentences of st leo for in them he sounds the whole moral depth of the mystery of human redemption the whole victory whereby our saviour conquered the devil and the world was conceived in humility and was worked out by humility his predestined days began and ended under persecution sufferings came upon the child and the meekness of the child came to the suffering man because in one and the same descent of majesty he took a human birth 
and received the human death when therefore almighty god took up a cause so exceedingly bad as our cause was he made it good by the prerogative of humility and through this humility he destroyed both sin and death for this reason the whole sum of the wisdom of christian discipline is to be found neither in voluble speech nor in keen disputations nor in the appetite for praise and glory but it consists in true humility freely accepted and this from his mother's womb to his agony on the cross the lord jesus christ chose for all strength and taught that strength to us but to this profoundest view of the incarnation wherein the son of god sounded all the depths of the infirm creature we must add the most exalted view of this divine economy that glory to god in the highest which arose from the manifestation of the noblest of all possible creations a creation recapitulating all spiritual and earthly creations in one most perfect composition of all that was highest in heaven with all that was humblest in humanity clasped forever in hypostatic union with the eternal word this is the very ecstasy of creation the son of god going out of himself as it were to embrace all the elements of creation from the highest to the lowest in his person for in christ the father raised up both a spiritual and an earthly creation into union with the godhead of the son to sit at his right hand and to renew all things heavenly and earthly in him from the contemplation of the great mystery preparing to descend upon the earth let us return to our first parents in their fall and desolation we beheld them naked in soul and body captives to the devil trembling with fear dazed with trouble and confusion and expecting the judgment of god the lord descends into the garden of paradise and is heard walking in human form and speaking with a human voice as already preluding the incarnation the guilty pair attempt in their terror to conceal themselves god calls them he questions them they answer by evasions and by mutual recriminations their shame and confusion contend with their self-love and reveal the broken condition of their souls the voice of the lord recalls them to their conscience and they hear their sentence which however humbling to pride and hard to flesh and blood is a sentence of mercy they are cast out of paradise as the disobedient angels were cast out of heaven but they go forth in hope whilst the angels went forth in despair they are subjected to a severe and humbling discipline of labor and suffering but this penalty is imposed as a medicine to their pride and as a safeguard to their weakness they go forth in hope because they have heard of their promised redemption in the sentence pronounced on their destroyer i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed she shall crush thy head and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel well did satan know his adversary not the seed of the man before him but the seed of the woman the child of that woman of whom he already had foreknowledge of that woman revealed to him in heaven whose child was taken up to god and to his throne the child of that woman shall crush his head and defeat his enterprise of destroying the human race that you may better understand the great cause that is pleading between heaven and earth let us pass in meditation through the eternal gates and enter the holy court 
where man and his tempter are arraigned before the eternal justice. If the awful presence of the divine justice fills our poor nature with dread, behold side by side with that august majesty sit the gentle forms of grace and mercy, prepared to moderate the severity of judgment. There are three parties to the cause, the offended majesty of God, man the criminal, and Satan the instigator of the crime. The first plea is against Satan, that, being the enemy of God from pure malice, he had invaded the rights of God, and that, exercising a malicious stratagem and fraud, he has seduced God's creature and servant, made for his service and glory, and has withdrawn him from his duty and obedience to his sovereign Lord, that by false statements he has led the man to aspire with treasonable pride to be as God, that after withdrawing him from God and his salvation, he has kept him in an evil bondage under his own power, and that Satan has therefore incurred a greater punishment than he has yet received for his former crimes. The second plea is against man, that he also has invaded the rights of God and has treated the divine authority with contempt and disobedience that he has withdrawn his faith from God who made him, and has given it to the enemy of God, that he has risen up in a revolting spirit of pride, and has aspired to be as God, that he has deprived his Lord and Creator of that homage and due service, which both as a rational creature, and as the representative of the whole earthly creation, he owed to God and that he has done this in the face of a divine command, and in defiance of the light and grace with which his divine master had endowed him, and that however he may have been deceived and misled by an enemy in the guise of a friend, he has acted against the known will of God, and of his own free will and choice, and with deep ingratitude to his divine benefactor. He has therefore incurred the sentence of death, both of soul and body. But there is a third case before the court of eternal justice, a case that pleads to mercy as well as to justice. For Satan has inflicted great evils on man, and has inflicted them under the fraudulent promise of good. Under the malicious pretext of rendering him a great service, he has deprived him of all his goods, and even of the hope and expectation of his supreme and eternal good. For as much as man is God's creature, and that he owes subjection and obedience to God alone, Satan holds an unjust possession of him. But for as much as man gave himself to Satan of his own free act and will, he is justly left in the bonds of Satan. For although Satan has no inherent right to take possession of man and to treat him oppressively, yet man has, through his own fault and folly, deserved the bondage and oppression that he suffers. For granting he was deceived, he was deceived with his eyes open, and after the Lord his God had given him full caution, and had enforced that caution with a clear command, he fell into Satan's snares. But he has no valid excuse for doing so, because he was not ignorant of his duty, and he knew that he ought not to covet or desire what was against the known will of God, as it was openly declared to him both by his internal light and by an external command. In consequence of his prevarication and sin, therefore, man is justly subject to Satan. But forasmuch as his adversary had acted a false, fraudulent, and malicious part, he is not justly subject to Satan. But the cause between man and Satan is secondary to the cause between man and God. 
he has deserted his creator for whom he was made he has deserted his faith and trust in his divine benefactor who provided him with all things good and desirable and who contemplated his advancement in due time to his own immortal glory moreover his lord had appointed him his representative on earth had given him the dominion of the visible creation and had not only formed him to his own image and likeness but had made him the head the heart and voice of the world that through him all the creatures beneath him might worship honour and obey their creator and might be subject to god through his piety by his revolt he has not only ruined himself beyond his power to repair but has defeated god's design over his creation at large and brought deterioration upon the entire world this is the position of the case and the sum of the cause still if man can only find an advocate and a protector to bring satan into court his right to hold possession of man may be repelled no such an advocate however can be found unless god himself take up the cause but unless man first returns to god god cannot take up his cause the divine justice must first receive satisfaction for his apostasy and sin he must first make atonement to god and purge his contempt by suitable reparation but this he cannot do having turned himself away from god the grace of god has left him and wanting grace and the subjection to god which grace gives he cannot turn to god anew or find anything within him that is worthy of god deeply wounded and terribly disordered from his fall he is powerless to rise again having preferred the creature to the creator his sin is relatively infinite he has no justice in him that will enable him to approach the eternal justice how then can the sinful creature offer his sinful self for an atonement this would not be an atonement but an insult sunk in spiritual death what life or justice has he to offer for a reparation the irrational creatures are at his disposal and he may offer them in sacrifice but how can irrational creatures atone for the crimes of spiritual beings made in the image of god they can only receive a violence which they instinctively resist can he offer man for man the innocent man has ceased to exist and the sinful man alone remains but a sinful sacrifice is an abomination to the lord as man can neither offer himself or anything less than himself that can in the least atone or find anything in him that is just he has no escape from condemnation no means of deliverance from everlasting death but god would not have his work to perish he would not have his glorious plan of creation and the still more glorious plan for its glorification to become a defeat and a failure and that through the malice of his own apostate creature in his divine reserves the almighty and all-wise god has a yet more magnificent plan for restoring and perfecting his creation and of conquering evil with the greatest good he comes therefore to his fallen creature both in mercy and in justice and delivers him from death by a most wonderful invention of justice yet before man can have a just and reasonable deliverance justice must be satisfied on both sides of the case for god must have a just cause for delivering him and man must have a just way of escape from his injustice 
but these God alone can provide. Mercy and grace step forward to reconcile the claims of justice in a way most wonderful. Mercy and grace and justice unite in one divine person, and in that divine person God gives to man another man, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, and he shall be offered in the place of fallen man. That this compensation may be worthy the justice of God, this man is incomparably greater than Adam and all his race. The Son of God is made man, and partakes the nature of Adam in a pure and divine way, and becoming a victim in his humanity of humility and obedience, he offers his life and death to God the Father in atonement for the injustice of the whole human race. He gives himself to mankind and becomes the brother of men, that from mankind he may receive himself anew as their expiatory victim. In the words of Isaiah, a child is born to us, and the son is given to us, and the government is on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of the world to come, the Prince of Peace. As he is given by God to man, Christ is the gift of divine mercy and grace. As he is offered to God by man, his offering is the justice due from mankind to God. He is no sooner born than he begins to propitiate the Father, for which reason the angels sing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will. He first restores man to God in himself, and then he offers himself for all men to God after which God smiles once more upon the earth with a mercy super-exalted over his judgment. But man has still to escape the penalties of his pride and disobedience, and to purge his contempt with a condign satisfaction. This also was compensated by the Son of God in his free acceptance of the humiliations and sufferings which for himself he did not owe, and he attached them with all his obedience to the dignity and merit of his divine person. Being in the form of God, says St. Paul, he thought it not robbery to be equal to God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of man, and in habit found as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. Except, therefore, for the voluntary humiliations and sufferings of the holy and innocent one, freely accepted and freely offered for mankind, man had no escape from condemnation. But Christ delivered him from the everlasting penalties due to his pride and disobedience, provided he accept that deliverance, and is willing to return to God through the paths ordained for his return. As for sinful man, he suffers no more than he has been justly ordained to suffer for his contempt, and therefore can pay nothing towards his deliverance which is wholly the work of the innocent and divine man. When Christ had atoned for our guilt by his birth and death, and had paid our debt, there was no place left for Satan's calumnious accusations. He lost his dominion over man so soon as he chooses to accept his divine deliverer, and is freed from the devil's bondage. Judgment was exercised against his claims in the Passion of Christ, when he took the handwriting that was against us, attached it to his cross, and blotted it out with his blood. Once incorporated with Christ and possessed of his blood, we may say of Satan with the psalmist, 
when my enemies shall be turned back, they shall be weakened and shall perish before thy face. For thou hast maintained my judgment and my cause, thou hast sat on the throne who judgest justice. Upon the cause between man and God, judgment is reserved to the end of life and if in the interval through christ he is reconciled to god he may await that judgment without fear for having destroyed death by death and obtained the reversal of our judgment by the rights which he has won for us christ raises us up from death to life and in token of this power he descended into hell from his cross broke the brazen gates asunder and delivered those spirits from their captivity who had believed the promise and had descended thither to await the coming of their divine deliverer christ took away our reproach and restored our honour for in what does that honour consist but in the likeness of god when man aspired to be as god he lost that honour and becoming foolish he did not understand. Then he had to suffer that reproach of his Creator, Behold, Adam hath become as one of us, knowing good and evil. When the first of men heard this terrible rebuke, one might almost imagine that the psalmist at a later time but repeated the earnest entreaty of his soul, Thou hast rebuked the proud, they are cursed who decline from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt. Most wonderfully has God removed our reproach and contempt. For behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and his name is the God with us. He shall eat milk and butter, that he may know how to reprove evil and choose good these few words embrace the foundation of our faith the father of our race aspires to be as god and one of the divine persons of the holy trinity exclaims behold adam hath become as one of us knowing good and evil just awful and severe is this ironical reproach yet has it received a merciful direction to reveal to man his weakness and his folly but how is this reproach removed from those who have taken refuge in the humility of christ for they may say even with glowing truth behold god has become as one of us and the voice of contempt is changed into the voice of praise Christ knows good with a perfect knowledge and experience. He also knows evil with a perfect knowledge, though without experience. He knows good that he may impart it to us. He knows evil that he may deliver us from it. That also which was so bitter and ironical a reproof when addressed to the first Adam has become the most authentic truth when addressed to the second Adam. From the voice of the Holy Trinity it can be said to him, Behold, Adam hath become as one of us, because of his divinity. Whilst from the voice of humanity it may be said to him, Behold, Adam hath become as one of us, because of his humanity. As our creation was the work of power, our redemption is the work of mercy. Mercy has come down from heaven in the divinity of our Savior, and justice has sprung up from the earth in his humanity. The mystery of redemption is the mercy of recreation and of regeneration in the blood of Christ. And the holy scriptures, which are ever concentrating our mind and heart upon this work of redemption, as either promised or fulfilled, are inexhaustible in exhibiting the works and ways of mercy, which all gather round or flow out from this inexhaustible fountain of mercy. He hath not dealt with us according to our sins, 
nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For according to the height of the heavens above the earth, he hath strengthened his mercy towards them that fear him. It is also written that the Lord is sweet to all who call upon him, that he loveth mercy and judgment, that his tender mercies are above all his works, and that the earth is full of his mercy. This broad, deep, and inexhaustible stream of mercy flows into all the ways of human nature, and beats ever at the doors of proud and obdurate hearts to find an entrance. It flows, and ever continues to flow, from the fountain of life opened in the mystery of our redemption. Christ is our mercy, and his grace is the power of his mercy sweet yet strong, and sometimes even terrible in its first assaults on hearts given up to pride and malice. Mercy is patient, is long-suffering, is not easily turned from its purpose. It watches the willful, wayward heart of man, ready to take the first opening, and to bring by that opening the gift of repentance. The divine attribute of mercy comes in every form and shape of grace, preventing, soliciting, attracting, inbreathing, arguing, entreating, rebuking, chastising souls away from evil with stripes in compassion for their misery, striking the headstrong from their pride with terror, visiting in gentle mood those who are softened by affliction. The grace of mercy humbles the proud and consoles the humble, lifts up the sincere mind with faith, inspires the desponding heart with hope, and quickens the obedient soul with the flame of charity. Mercy abides her time for the returning sinner, embraces the penitent with benignity, and descends to the humble with sweetness infuses strength into the desolate with secrecy, rewards the merciful with superabounding mercy. As Christ is our mercy, and pride alone resists the operation of his mercy, humble souls, vacant of themselves, are the animated, beautiful, and capacious vessels of his mercy, since he endured with much patience vessels of wrath, fitted for destruction, that he might show the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath prepared unto glory. But in this world of grief and trouble, the mercies of grace are not the joys of the blessed, but the consolations of our exile. Therefore we say, Let thy mercy be to my consolation. End of Lecture 11, Part 3。Lecture 12, Part 1 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 12, The Restoration of Man. Part 1. Behold, I make all things new. Apocalypse chapter 21 verse 5. To cultivate the body at the cost of the soul is to subvert the order of life, and by a parity of truth to cultivate earthly science at the cost of spiritual wisdom is to subvert the order of knowledge and to sacrifice the wisdom of the mind. What is science but the knowledge of things in their causes? But the causes of material things are spiritual. And what is wisdom but the knowledge of the highest things in their highest causes, and in the ultimate ends for which they exist? Man is placed in this world as a middle term between earth and heaven, holding by his body of the earth and by his soul of heaven. 
he is placed between the superior good of heaven and the inferior good of this world, that by the help of God and his own virtue he may ascend by degrees from earthly to divine things. He is a middle good with a great capacity for divine good, that by the light and grace of God he may exercise the sublime office of spiritualizing his whole nature and exalting it in mind and heart in the direction of eternal truth and good, and may so use the elements of this world as to bring them into the service of his spiritual life and intelligence. If he reverses this noble order of things, and directs his mind and conduct to the materializing of his mind and the sensualizing of his life, instead of ascending to superior good, he loses even his middle good, and descends in all his nature to a degraded state and position altogether unworthy of his humanity, and perverts both his gifts and his nature. But the wise man is he who is intelligent upon himself, who understands why God has placed him in this position, and who is recognized in these words of the psalm, Blessed is the man whose help is in thee. He hath disposed ascensions in his heart, in the veil of tears, in the place where he is set. There is a vanity of science which is not less vicious than the moral vanity of the heart, a vanity wholly given to the elements of this world, to the exclusion of the solid things of the soul. This vanity vitiates both the man and his science, sometimes even to the absurd extent of his imagining that the science of this world may stand in place both of religion and of the highest and purest virtue. Yet such a one sees nothing in its highest cause nor in its final end. To him all is as though it were suspended on nothing, and all as though it tended to nothing. We may justly call this vanity, as Solomon discovered many ages ago in surveying the tendencies of the natural sciences, when cultivated apart from God. And vanity is vacuity. Like the devoting of the soul to the body, it leaves the inward man vacant and his spirit void. For neither the body nor the things of the body can fill the spirit or give it rest or bring the desired fruits to its toils. The garment of science is not the body of science, nor the body the soul, nor the soul the life of science. There can be no soul of science for him who is contented with the outward and material garment of visible things, or with the mere body of this world, and who cannot, or rather will not, ascend in mind from things visible to things invisible. Nor can he pass from the soul to the life of science, who will not ascend from things created to their divine creator, to their first and final cause, to the divine illuminator of all, and to the divine perfecter of all. It is a marked weakness of such men that, failing in wisdom, they do not estimate things so much according to their real or relative value in the order of good or in the scale of things as by their newness, their way of affecting the curiosity of the mind and their interest as matters of inquiry so that they are inclined to look upon all things as equal to the mind, with the only distinction of their being novel, rare, or curious. But with this tendency of mind, with this minute philosophy, the grand view of the greater things is too apt to be lost sight of, and the great and universal truths which God designed for all men are too apt to recede from sight, not because they are not present and visible as ever, 
but because these minute philosophers have contracted their vision and bent it downward and they next deny what they have disenabled themselves to see but all truth belongs to god who is its first possessor and all truth exists in a preeminent way in god and the nearer we are to god the more truth we see and by having this greater truth are the more like in mind to god and be it ever remembered that truth is the oldest of all things whilst man is both new and fond of novelties changeable in himself he is fond of change but let him who seeks the divine truth remember that it comes from god and can never be devised by man for it is most ancient fixed and unchangeable and our adherence to that ancient truth makes us of a constant and unchangeable yet of an ever-growing and fruitful mind for our mind is like the fruit tree in this respect that if rooted in the truth it is fruitful but if it is constantly shifting from opinion to opinion it can bear no solid fruit all things in the creation have their lights and shadows there is nothing in this visible world from the sun in the heavens to the pebble that rolls under our feet from the man with whom we are familiar to the insect we examine with the microscope that has not a side that is in light and another that is in obscurity whatever we know in this world whether by perception or by the testimony of others is partly known and partly unknown yet we have sufficient knowledge to secure certainty sufficient for conviction for assent for belief and for our guidance and nothing can be more irrational nothing more unphilosophical than to argue from the obscure against the clear side of any fact or truth as if the one was the denial of the other whereas it is that which is clear that vouches for that which is obscure in one and the same subject yet this is the common method of sceptics and unbelievers but if our natural knowledge presents us with both lights and shadows with clear evidence attended by obscurities beyond the reach of our limited mind and faculties how much more must we expect this to be the case when our minds are brought into contact with the divine and supernatural truths of revelation nor must it be forgotten that in his divine economy of revelation the god of heaven contemplates a twofold purpose the one to enlighten us with divine truth and to guide us by that light on our way to heaven the other to try our faith and obedience he therefore who asks for a perfect light all around and through a mystery of faith whose seat is in god as the condition of accepting it is much more absurd than he who expects a perfect light all around and through the objects of nature whose place is in this world before he assents to their truth and existence the light given with divine revelation is so tempered that the good may use it with confidence and are never without sufficient light whilst it is in the power of the evil disposed to refuse that light for god has made his revelation the test and trial whether we will freely accept his truth by faith or not there is light enough and much more than enough for them who are humble-minded and willing to see there is obscurity enough to test their spirits who are proud-minded and unwilling to see there is light to enlighten the faithful and obscurity to humble them there is obscurity enough for the unfaithful man to blind himself with whilst there is light enough to condemn him for his willing blindness 
there is brightness enough in the doctrines of faith to make our belief reasonable and darkness enough to make our adhesion a meritorious obedience and an act of fidelity to divine authority at the same time in the precepts and counsels of faith there is an exquisite order beauty and light which attract the love and obedience of the heart whilst their difficulty arises in the course of their exercise making them the meritorious work of virtue. The principles embodied in these remarks will be no unsuitable preparation for entering upon the grand theme of human restoration, a theme which involves the greatest of all human interests. No sooner did man dare to break the law of God than he fell on the instant from that high honor to which God had raised him, so long as he walked in the path of rectitude, his heart was pure and innocent, and he was clothed in the white stole of justice as with a garment of grace and beauty. Loving God with his beautiful gift of love, he was loved by God as with a father's love. The unfailing light of celestial truth shone to his mind, and the frank and complete integrity gave serene power to his will. All his appetites obeyed his will with calmness, and he beheld the sovereign dominion not only over his body, but over all that in nature was inferior to him. Peace and joy abounded in his heart, and his happiness was augmented with the certain hope of eternal life and of rising after a time to supreme beatitude with god but alas no sooner has he drunk the deadly venom of sin than all this is taken from him and he falls as a king from his throne what tongue can tell the evils that fall upon man when he falls away from god the loss of his spiritual gifts destroys his communion with heaven the horrible turpitude of guilt defiles his nature to its center. The divine love is for him changed into wrath and fills him with terror. He is enchained in a hard bondage to the devil who seduced him. His cupidities have arisen over his weakened powers of control and rage against him. Fears and troubles agitate him. The dread of an eternal as well as of a natural death pursues him. The loss of light and the obscuring influences of sin leave a darkness on his mind that even weakens his intelligence of the laws of nature, over which he was appointed to hold dominion, and clouds all his faculties and powers had he any hope of deliverance from his great and many evils his lot would be less sad and mournful but by his own conduct he has closed up every way of escape before he can be delivered from his fallen state and disgraceful servitude the divine justice must be satisfied the divine honor repaired an equitable atonement must be offered for his sins, and a just price paid for his redemption. But what good has he to offer to God? What life can he substitute for the life in God that he has lost? Having lost the supernatural element of life which made him pleasing to God, what grace has he left with which to make his offering acceptable to God? He has nothing left him but his fallen nature, separated from God, weakened, darkened, defiled with injustice and disorder, and already forfeited to death and everlasting punishment. Even the human race to be yet born from him is involved in his condemnation because God had made him the one fontal principle of all humanity. There is no way left open from man to God. The only possible way open is from God to man. 
deliverance may come from heaven it cannot possibly come from the earth the fathers of the church have argued from the omnipotence of god that he might have effected the deliverance of man and his restoration to justice in some other way but that in his infinite goodness and mercy and for his own divine glory he chose the most magnificent and generous way the way most abounding in goodness and condescension the way most necessary to accomplish a most secure as well as a most plentiful and overabounding redemption and salvation to man through the incarnation of his eternal word in the first place it was the most secure because man in his weakness might fall again but by the incarnation of the son of god human nature as the fountain of redemption and salvation was made everlastingly secure by its inseparable union with the person of the son of god in the second place the incarnation of the eternal word was most singularly adapted to the weakness and to the requirements of man for man is a creature of sense as well as mind and is more inclined to things visible than to things invisible and more easily passes to things invisible through the things that are visible the whole world therefore is so made by god that through visible things we may be able to ascend more easily to the knowledge of things invisible but now since his fall man is carnal sold unto sin and it is therefore still more needful for him that truth and justice and the power of redemption and salvation should come to him from heaven in a visible and even in a human form with human affections and sympathies that he may be drawn back to god and to his salvation even by the cords of adam in the third place the magnificent scheme of the incarnation is the most glorious to god for however great and godlike it is to create good it is incomparably greater to conquer evil with good and to destroy that evil through the creation of a greater good but the incarnation of the son of god is the most magnificent of all creations most magnificent above all creations both of angels and of men most magnificent in the personal union of that creation with the eternal word through whom all things were created and most magnificent in its infinite condescension and what adds immeasurably to this magnificence god takes occasion of the great evil with which his creatures oppose him to accomplish this grandest of creations that he may overcome evil with the creation and endowment of superabounding good then came forth the most wonderful manifestation of the attributes of god in their most magnificent exercise to use the words of st john of damascus the mystery of the incarnation showed forth the united goodness and wisdom and justice and power of god his goodness in that he did not despise the infirmity of his own creature his justice in that when man was vanquished he caused his tyrant to be vanquished in no other way than by man nor did he rescue man himself from death by violence his wisdom in that he provided a most becoming payment of a most difficult debt and his infinite power because nothing can be greater in the exercise of power than that god should be made man returning to the divine goodness as in this glorious mystery it is the highest degree manifested we must remember that the nature of god is goodness 
and that it belongs to goodness to communicate good, and to the supreme goodness to communicate himself to the creature in a supreme way. But this he has accomplished, as St. Augustine observes, when he united a created nature to himself, and that in a way so intimate that the soul and flesh of man become one in person with the eternal word. Wherefore, in the solemn words of the God incarnate himself, God so loved the world as to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. For God sent not his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world may be saved by him. He came not only to heal our misery, but to promote us, as became so divine a redeemer and benefactor, to greater good than we had lost by our sin. What faith can be so firm and assured as that which rests upon the very word of truth, appearing visibly in the world, speaking in our own nature to us, living the truth before our eyes, conversing with men face to face and soul to soul, as a man speaks with his friend. That man might walk with confidence in the truth, says St. Augustine, the Son of God, the very truth, took the nature of man to found and establish the truth in us. What could raise our hope so high, or give so firm a trust in the goodness and mercy of God, as that the Son of God should partake our very nature? He has become one of us, to inspire us with full confidence in his loving disposition to do all things for us. He who has given us himself, will he not give us all things? He tells us that we have only to ask and to receive. What again could be more eminently calculated to bring us back to the love of God than a proof so great and striking of the love of God for us? God commendeth his charity towards us, because when as yet we were sinners, according to the time, Christ died for us. One of the greatest causes of his coming in the flesh was to show the exceeding love of God for us. It might have been difficult for man to love God if he did not know that God loved him. But God hath first loved us, and has exhibited his love in a condescension so marvelous, with suffering so great, in a work so full of love, that we must indeed be hardened if we return not love for love. Then what a good, and what a very needful good, has been received by us in the example of a perfect human life, which the Son of God has set before us, so that we have only to follow him in order to perfect our life and secure our happiness as St. Augustine pithily expresses it, our duty does not consist in following man whom we see, but in following God whom we do not see. And for this reason God was made man and presented himself to man that man might see him. Again, in the mystery of the word made flesh, we have the actual proof that man may be a partaker of the divinity which is the true beatitude of man and the final end of human life. For we are taught by the very fact that God is made man, that our human nature is capable of union with God. But if the incarnation of the Son of God is the most glorious and efficacious of all designs for the promotion of our spiritual good, it is equally the most efficacious for the removal of that evil which is the great obstacle to all good. Why should men any longer fear the spiritual powers of evil after they are associated with God in their own nature? 
for he has exalted that nature above all spiritual creations and filled that nature with divine power to conquer every spirit of evil so that they tremble at the very name of jesus and fly at its invocation from the mystery of the incarnation we also learn to understand the great dignity of human nature that we may neither dishonor nor defile that nature in ourselves for god has shown us how high a place our human nature holds in the creation by the very fact that he sent his son to appear to men as truly man acknowledge the dignity o christian says st leo and as thou art made a partaker of the divine nature do not thou degenerate in thy conduct by falling back into thy former vileness then the mystery of the incarnation puts an end to the false and self-confident presumption of man for by it we learn that the grace of god whereby we are saved is given us in christ without any previous merit or deserving on our part and the pride of man which is the source of all evil and the greatest of all hindrances to his union with god is rebuked and healed through the humility of the son of god but the greatest achievement of power combined with love and mercy which the son of god has accomplished in his humanity is the deliverance of man from the servitude of sin satan was overcome by the justice of the man christ jesus who gave the fullest satisfaction for us no mere man could satisfy for the whole human race nor did it become god to give satisfaction for the sins committed against him it was needful therefore that christ should be both god and man this saint leo has explained in words to be ever remembered infirmity was taken up by power humility by majesty and what was mortal by eternity that as a suitable remedy for our evils one and the same mediator between god and men might die in his human nature and rise again by his divine nature for were he not true god he would not have brought us healing and were he not true man he would not have been our example saint athanasius observes that our knowledge that the world was created through the word of god prepares us worthily to understand why the world should be restored to the father through the same word of god for it can never be contradictory that the father who made the world through his word should heal the same world through the self-same word in this remark saint athanasius but follows the inspired order of teaching which sublimely opens the gospel of saint john although certain pagan philosophers obtained a glimpse of the word of god as the power through which the world was created they might have obtained what they imperfectly knew from the chosen nation st paul assures us that by faith we know that the world was framed by the word of god that from invisible things visible things might be made as by faith we also know that the divine word is the true light which enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world End of Lecture 12, Part 1。Lecture 12, Part 2 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 12 The Restoration of Man part two here let us pause what makes this world so wonderful as contemplated in the light of god is its resting on the invisible force of the word of god and its being presided over by his invisible light 
of which the light of the sun is the visible symbol. The force of the eternal word by which the world and all things therein is upheld, and the light with which he enlightens every intelligence, is known to faith, and in part is understood through faith. The deeper we go into the visible things of this world, the more we come upon something mysterious and unsearchable, which escapes both our sense and mind. Everywhere we move in the midst of invisible power, what we call the most solid things, because they most resist our senses, are capable of being changed into invisible forms in which they are much more the objects of science. And science knows well that with sufficient power the whole visible world could be changed into elements invisible to mortal sense. But this implies the mind and power of God. If matter be so mysterious and capable of such subtle changes of form, how much more profound and mysterious to us is the substance and nature of spiritual life, whose effects we see, whose power we feel, but to whose essence we cannot penetrate. And how much more is our mind and spiritual life surrounded with inexhaustible mysteries that recede on every side into eternity. The word of God is behind the whole creation, and embraces the whole creation, upholding all things by the word of his power. He is therefore described in the book of wisdom as the wisdom that reaches from end to end of all things mightily, and disposes of all things sweetly. The word of God is equally over the whole creation, enlightening all intelligences, and making what truth he chooses intelligible to us and is in the whole creation renewing all things, except the minds that resist his light, and the wills that use their freedom to resist his grace. He was in the world, says St. John, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. It is the test of the creations of God, as opposed to the inventions of men, that they everywhere rest upon unfathomable foundations, and that beyond a certain depth their mystery is unsearchable. But how much more sublime, profound, and unsearchable in its depths is that divinest of creations, in which the eternal word and creator of all things takes a created nature up to his own person, in which the plentitude of the Godhead dwelt bodily. High as the throne of God, profound as eternity, yet descending into the lowest depths of humanity, the incarnation of the Son of God, whilst made visible and sensible to mortal eyes and ears, is unsearchable in its elevation, unfathomable in its depths, and inexhaustible in truth and grace. Familiar to the faith and love of the child is he who became a child for our salvation. Homely in all human life, as a divine friend and consoler to the poor and to the working man, is he who became poor and a working man, to give an example to all. To the sufferer he comes as one who has suffered more, to the desolate as one who has endured greater desolation, bringing healing to their wounds and strength to their weakness. Whilst to the humble student of divine things and to the devout contemplative he opens light after light and truth after truth and one degree of more perfect life after another, and all this truth and life of love grows day by day from him who is the divine son of truth and life. Yet the end is but as the beginning of the inexhaustible riches of his light and treasures of his grace. 
but after all the light and knowledge which the most enlightened doctor and fervid saint have derived from the contemplation of this mystery be it an inspired saint john or saint paul or a doctor like saint athanasius saint augustine or saint thomas they still find the stupendous mysteries receding from their sight into the regions of eternity and nothing is left but to exclaim with saint paul o oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and of the knowledge of god how incomprehensible are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways what sublimer proof can we have of the presence of god in man and of man in god than his familiar presence with the humblest child of faith whilst of unsearchable majesty and truth to the most illuminated souls but all the works of god in creation are progressive decreed before the foundation of the world and promised after the fall the divine incarnation was delayed until man was prepared for its reception he had first to learn his own weakness his proneness to error his helplessness and misery without the grace of god death came and corruption grew and iniquity was bred from iniquity until it exceeded all measure men stopped at no evil but added new inventions of crime and idolatry to the old until human nature became insatiable of sin death more and more prevailed and corruption obtained a power that was ever on the increase the greater part of mankind became so infected with the earthly and carnal life as to lose all sight of what is spiritual so that few men could lift their minds above the visible and material heavens they placed their fictitious gods the creatures of their imagination in the sky on the mountain tops in the woods and brooks beneath the earth in the sea and by their domestic hearth the law of death reigned everywhere among the gentiles and even among the chosen and prophetic race as st paul shows and through the weakness of human nature the law of life became to many of them a law of death the human race was perishing in soul perishing even in bodily corruption at the great centres of civilization satan seemed to be gaining his whole cause and only seemed to require time to gain possession of the whole human race of what profit would it have been to continue mankind or the world devoted to the service of man both man and the world would have failed from their final end but on the other hand to quote saint athanasius whom we shall chiefly follow in our further exposition it would be less than becoming for creatures endowed with reason and partakers by that reason of the word of god to be suffered to perish altogether it would be beneath the divine goodness to suffer creatures made by god to be totally destroyed and for no other reason than that the devil had circumvented man by craftiness was the divine art which god had exhibited in man to come to nothing because he was thoughtless and the devil crafty was the good god to suffer corruption to prevail over his perishing creatures was he to leave death to tyrannize over them for what end were they made better had they never been made than that the whole race should perish utterly god therefore consulted his own divine goodness and entered upon the work of mercy but in his justice god had proclaimed the law of death from the beginning against transgression and the sin of apostasy from his law and having proclaimed the law it must be fulfilled accordingly st paul tells us that death reigned from adam until moses 
even over them who had not sinned after the similitude of the transgression of Adam, who was a figure of him who was to come. Then came the law to one people, revealing the death of sin, but doing nothing to remove it, filled with the promise, but accomplishing nothing except to raise up faith and hope in the promise not yet fulfilled. Death must reign over man for a certain time, or God would not be truthful in threatening death. But is his work to perish? He did not create us for ourselves, for that would be our misery. He did not create us to be independent of him, for that would be our destruction. He suffered us to fall, that we might find out our native nothingness and that finding out what we are without his grace, we might learn to know that without him we are poor, naked, blind, and miserable. Satan appeared to succeed, but God has his great work in view, and has already prepared that intervention whereby he will exhibit his wisdom and goodness by drawing the greatest good out of the greatest evil. The device of the tempter is allowed to work that after man has been humiliated to the very root of his nature and has experienced all his weakness, the longing might revive in him for that good which the world cannot give, and that from the bitter taste of himself and of this deceptive world, his very discontent with himself may dispose him for better things. For the image of God was yet in him, however much obscured. The appetite for the greater good was not extinct, but had lost its sway. Conscience, however dimmed, was not dead, and the sense of God's presence had not abandoned him so far, but that in solemn moments he forgot his false gods, and called upon the one true God. What shall God do? He might strike men with repentance, as he did the Ninevites, but repentance alone can only restrain man from evil for the time. It could not change his inward condition. It could not draw out the root of corruption. It could not restore the divine likeness, except through the restorative power of the word of God who made all things from nothing. He alone could change corruption into incorruption. He alone could give the gifts which recover men to the friendship of God. He alone could enlighten the blind and heal the wounded unto death, and was alone worthy to intercede through his sufferings and death for our deliverance. To accomplish this sublime work of restoration, the Son of God, who is never distant from his creatures, but with his Father fills all things with his presence, came into this carnal and corruptible world, came with the utmost benignity, and showed himself openly. He saw how the sentence of death passed on human transgression had gathered force from every human corruption, and how that sentence could not be removed until it had been fulfilled. He beheld how the malice of men had grown out of all measure, and how it was working with ever-increasing vehemence to the destruction of humanity, until it could be no longer tolerated. He beheld all men guilty of death, and without a way of deliverance. Moved at the spectacle, and enduring no longer that death should hold his reign over humanity without limit or restraint, he resolved that what he had made and enlightened with reason should not perish, and was unwilling longer to permit the great design of his father in forming man to be in vain. He therefore took a body like to ours. In taking that body to himself, it was not his only object to be seen and heard by men, who were become too gross to behold him spiritually, or he would have taken a more excellent body. But he took a body like ours, 
and of the same stock, although he did not take it after our manner. He took that body from an immaculate virgin, not through the intervention of man, but through the power of the Holy Ghost, and he made that body an instrument for his service, in which he might dwell, through which he might make himself known, by which he might claim kindred with us, with which he might offer an acceptable sacrifice to his father for his brethren. He received that body animated with a soul like ours, that he might be in all things perfect man. And in the act of its creation, that humanity was united, not indeed to the nature of God, but to the person of the eternal word, so that his human nature was and is the very humanity of the Son of God. His body he delivered to death, and with a supreme kindliness gave his life to the Father for all men whom he had made his brethren, that the law of death might expend its force upon him, and so be dissolved in all men who die to themselves in him, and that henceforth this law of death might have no more force over those who are made like to him. He also offered his body, the body, remember, of the Son of God, that through the power and virtue dwelling in that body and the grace of the resurrection from the dead, he might restore our bodies after they are gone to corruption and might recall them from death to life, destroying death utterly as the stubble is destroyed by fire. Where the sovereign reigns in grace and power, there is order, peace, and security from hostile foes. But the great evil that had befallen the kingdom of this world was the alienation of its sovereign lord and master from his subjects, through their own perversity, which left them a prey to death and Satan. When therefore the Lord of life turned once more in mercy to the world, and took up his dwelling with us in our nature, the hostile powers were checked, and turned back at his presence. Death was encountered by life, and eternal peace restored. What can be imagined more worthy the divine goodness than this sublime conduct of the Son of God? How infinite his condescension to his fallen creatures! What a mighty antagonist to the spirit of evil is the Lord of life! He makes himself a member of the human race to expel the evils which have taken possession of his brethren. By his teaching he corrects their ignorance. By his virtue and power he restores all that they have lost to them. All this is confirmed by the inspired words of St. Paul, who tells us, The charity of Christ presseth us, judging this, that if one died for all, then all were dead and Christ died for all, that they also who live may not now live to themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. If then any be in Christ a new creature, the old things are passed away, behold, all things are made new. But all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself in Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Then the apostle in another epistle gives us the reason why the Son of God, and not another, should be our redemption and salvation. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the sufferings of death crowned with glory and honor that through the grace of God he might taste death for all. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, who had brought many children into glory, to perfect the author of their salvation by his passion. For both he that sanctifieth 
and they who are sanctified, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. After this, the Apostle proceeds to show why the word of God should take our nature to secure our redemption. Therefore, because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself in like manner hath been partaker of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the empire of death, that is to say, the devil, and might deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to servitude. Of what use is our existence unless we can obtain the object of our existence? If we cannot come to the knowledge of God, for whom we were created, our life is empty and vain. How can we be the full partakers of reason unless we know the word of the Father, who is the reason of God, of whose reason we are made partakers? If ignorant of him we use our reason upon nothing but earthly things, we bring ourselves down with our reason to the level of the animal creation. But God made us partakers of his own image, of the eternal word of his reason, to lift us in mind and heart above this earth. By the wealth of this gift, he made us capable of receiving the word of God, the perfect image of the Father, into our soul, that through that image of the Father we might know the Father. For no one hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. A gift such as the image of God in our soul ought to have been sufficient of itself to keep us in the knowledge of God, since it is an implanted reflection of his own eternal word. But against the neglect of that self-knowledge which brings us to the knowledge of God, God provided for us another and an external way of knowing him in his works and even against the neglect of that evidence in which the eternal word speaks to us from every side, he provided another and more human way of bringing us to know him. The divine word spoke through his prophets, whom he clothed with sanctity and power. And although the prophets were sent directly to the sons of Israel, who rejected and persecuted them, they were not sent to them alone, but to leave their teaching for a light to the world at large, both as regards the knowledge of God and the conduct of life. But if men neither recognized God through the reflection of his image within them, nor through his law written in their conscience, nor in the works created through his eternal word, however many and various, with which he surrounded them, nor in that conduct of his providence in which, through his creative word, he upholds and moves all things and guides them to man's service, nor in the word of God speaking his truth, wisdom, and will through his prophets. If despite of all these manifestations of the benignity and humanity of God, the race of man is still conquered and subdued by the present delights of the world and the flesh, and by the delusions and seductions of demons, worshipped and obeyed in place of God, if so far from opening their eyes to the truth, they only sink deeper and deeper into blindness, vice, and crime, until they seem no longer to possess their natural reason, what does this prove but that they stand in absolute need of an internal renovation of that likeness to God in which they were created, and of a restoration of that likeness to God which is beyond the power of any creature to effect? The word of God himself came, therefore, into the world, that as the very image of the Father he might repair the image of God in man and restore to him the likeness of God. 
No mere man could do this, because he is only made to the image of God. No angel could do this, because he is not the image of the Father. No one could do this but he who is the one sole image of the Father, and as this could not be done unless death and corruption be first destroyed, he took human nature with which first to destroy death and sin, and then to restore man to God's image and likeness. If a great artist makes a good likeness of some great personage on a valuable material, and that likeness becomes defaced, it cannot be renewed on that same material unless both the person whose likeness it was and the artist who made the likeness be again present to recover the likeness. The material in this case is the human soul. The original of the likeness is the word of God, the express image of the Father, and the artist is the same word of God who formed the likeness in the beginning. If, then, man is to be restored, the Son of God must first remove the damage and then restore the likeness. As the Gospel says, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Who again could have effected this restoration but he who knows what is in the mind and soul of man? Who but he who moveth all things, and through their movement makes the Father known? He says of this himself, All things are delivered to me by my Father. And no one knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and they to whom the Son shall reveal him. But this revelation is made through all the works of the Word of God. Therefore, as men had ceased to look up to heaven, as they looked but to earthly and human things, or to the similitudes of earthly and human things, the Son of God took a human soul and body, that through visible works done in the body men might know the Son of God, and through the Son the Father also. Having lost the sight and sense of divine wisdom in its spiritual purity, that wisdom came to men as a man, and with all the infirmities of man, yet in the person and power of God, that they who had lost the divine sense of wisdom might be brought back to that wisdom through their human sympathies. This is what St. Paul says, seeing that in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed. As a man among men, the word of God took hold of men by their senses, that they who put their senses foremost and judge of all things chiefly through their senses might be led back through those very senses of the body to the word of truth. If they looked with admiring eyes on the visible creation, they saw that very creation confessing its Lord and Maker and obeying His commands. For our Savior wrought such miracles in nature as no man had ever done, and wrought them as the Son of God and Master of all things. If men were devoted to evil spirits, they saw him expel those spirits from the possession of men, and might know by his command of them that the demons are not gods. If they gave themselves to superstitious worship of the dead, they saw him rising from the dead and exhibiting his mastery of death. But the Son of God came for a yet greater work than to remove our errors or even to expel our sins. He exhibits to us his divine character and his sublimer work where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way through which we pass to God, and he gives us his truth and life that we may pass to God that, as St. Paul has told us,
Christ may dwell by faith in your hearts, that being rooted and founded in charity, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know also the charity of Christ, which surpasseth all knowledge, that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Let no one imagine that the Son of God is enclosed in his body so as not to be elsewhere. He was not so engaged in the work done in the body as to leave the universe without his creative support and his active providence. For the word contains all things, but is contained by none. Whilst he is in all things by his action and influence, in his own divine nature he is above all things. His power is in all, he administers to all, and expands his providence over all, gives light to all who have light, and life to all who have life, but he wholly exists in his Father alone. The human soul must still abide with the body whilst it contemplates things at a distance. We contemplate the heavenly bodies, for example, and watch their movements, although confined to the body and unable to influence or move what we contemplate. But it was in no such way that the Son of God was in his body. He was in the body and in all things, and was at the same time exterior to all things, and reposed in the Father alone. Contemplate, then, this unbounded mystery of the eternal word in all its length and breadth and height and depth, how he who acted as man is in the person of God, how as the word of the Father he gave light and life to all, and how as the Son he was always with the Father. His human nature was framed by the Holy Ghost in the Virgin Mary, and that virginal body of the mother of God suffered nothing at his birth, nor was defiled, but made more holy by the mystery. And although, as the word of God, he is present in all things, he partakes not of them, but all things live and are fostered by his influence. For as the sun which he created and placed in the heavens gives its light and quickening influence to the earth, yet is neither defiled nor obscured by earthly things, whilst it enlightens and purifies whatever is on the earth, much more did the most holy word of God make himself known in the body without being defiled by the body, but free from all corruption he gave life and purity to the body, who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth. Yet he was born and suffered as a man and died, and there might be every kind of proof that he was man as well as God. He did not offer himself, therefore, at once to death upon his coming, but first exhibited his human life and spoke his divine word and manifested his divine works that when he came to his sacrifice he might be known to be the Son of God. And when the Jews treated him as a man, but refused to accept him as the Son of God, he said to them, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you will not believe me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Who that saw him change water into wine could doubt that he was the Lord of both? Who that saw him walk on the sea as on the land and still the angry storm by command could question his dominion over the elements? Who that saw him feed the hungry multitudes with a small quantity of bread and beheld with astonishment the quantity remaining, could mistake him for any other than the Lord of that providence which provides for all things. Who that beheld him healing the sick with a word, curing the blind and maimed with a touch, 
or raising up the dead with a command, could doubt his being the Lord and Master of life and death. End of Lecture 12, Part 2lecture twelve part three of the endowments of man by william bernard ullathorne this librivox recording is in the public domain lecture twelve the restoration of man part three thus far from where we gave note of it we have chiefly followed the exposition of st athanasius let us now turn back for a moment to the state of the world when Christ appeared to bring it back to God. We have observed in a former lecture that three fundamental principles were to be found at the root of all ancient religions, and that under all the accumulations of error, idolatry, and superstition, they were still perceptible when the Son of God came into the world. The first is, that man had fallen from an original state of light and happiness, the second, that he stands in need of a divine deliverer, the third, that his deliverance from evil must come through a substituted sacrifice. But there is a fourth principle which equally shines, like an original truth corrupted through all the heathen deifications, poetries, and mythologies, and that is the belief that human nature is capable of union with the divine personality. The pagans erred not in the possibility of such a union, but in their gross misapplication of it to their imaginary gods, whom they both deified and humanized. But the true nature of a divine incarnation could not enter the mind of man without the revelation of God. Yet so familiar was the heathen mind with the general idea of a personal union of divinity with humanity, that when the incarnation of the Son of God was preached to them, it was not this union of God with man that shocked and startled them, so much as the humiliation and sufferings of the Son of God, until prepared by grace to receive the truth. We have full evidence of this both in the controversies which the pagans held with the Christian fathers, and in the examinations of the martyrs before the pagan tribunals. Even the pantheistic systems of Asia, dark as they were and are, through the loss of distinction between God and his creation, and abounding as they do with metaphysical monstrosities and the wildest legends, are but gross corruptions of the older belief in the unity of God and of a promised union of God with man. In their dreamy reveries they confound the universal light with universal substance, and the material world with the illusions of the imagination. Yet through all their reveries of gods and incarnations of gods, we discern a certain imperfect notion of a true God and of a deliverance of man through an incarnation of God. There are deeper things in the human soul than the natural man can reach or understand. Created rational by the word of God, the light of reason is implanted by the eternal word, and that upon a divine exemplar present in the eternal word. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. And again St. John says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There were consequently lights and aspirations even in the souls of the better heathens, of the cause of which they were ignorant, but which through all their obscurations look towards the eternal word, of whom they were ignorant. For deeper than his errors, deeper than his opinions, deeper than his mythologies, 
is the light of man's reason, an image of the eternal reason, an image of the Trinity. In searching, therefore, more profoundly into the soul, such men as Parmenides, Socrates, and Plato found the testimony of one only God, and of one word of God, the enlightener of man. In short, the great mysteries of the Trinity and the Incarnation are found to agree with what was previously in the soul, whilst the entrance of the light of faith expels every false religion as disagreeing with what already exists more profoundly in the soul. This fact was noted by St. Chrysostom in his wide experience of pagan converts. The pagans, he says, incur no dangers so long as they keep to their old institutions and customs. But when they abandon them for hours, they expose themselves to great dangers. Had they found what they had been brought up in for so many ages to be more accordant with their reason than our doctrines are, they would never have abandoned them especially as this change exposed them to the greatest perils. But when they found out that what they had been brought up in was mischievous in the very nature of things, they gave up their old customs even though death stood in the way, and they took refuge in the things of Christ because they found them to be in accordance with their nature whilst their old customs were contrary to their nature. The image of God was oppressed by error, and craved, and still craves for deliverance from error, and for restoration to congenial light. For the expectation of the creature, says St. Paul, waiteth for the revelation of the sons of God, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that made it subject in hope because the creature shall be delivered from the servitude of corruption unto the liberty of the glory of the children of God. To ascend to higher truth than we have yet contemplated in the divine mystery of the Incarnation, as it is the nature of good to communicate good, so it is the nature of the supreme good to communicate good in every way in which it can be received. That divine being whose nature is goodness and whose goodness is infinite must be expected to communicate his goodness in every possible way in which the creature is able to receive his good, whether the good of light, of grace, of justice, or that good which he is. He gives us all things, and with them the truth that lights us to himself as the end of all things. As the first cause, he has produced through his word a most wonderful procession of creatures, one ascending above another in excellence, each capable of greater good, until the grand procession ends in man, with God himself for his final good. But is there any higher order of creation imaginable, and therefore possible? Is there such a creation possible that it shall resume the creation already existing in a nobler way, and shall unite the whole in one grand summary with God? From the perfect artist we look for some unrivaled work of superabounding excellence, embracing the whole creative power of the artist, and revealing the whole motive of his mind. But God works not, like human artists, with material appliances upon models already existing in nature. He has the forms of all creatable things everlastingly before him in his eternal word, and works with power, wisdom, justice, and goodness. And to his divine art we have no access until he reveals it in his work. But this new and surpassing work he has both produced and revealed. For as the first man came of nothingness and had no inalienable union with God, 
he failed from natural weakness and fell from god in the false exercise of his freedom and his whole posterity with him what then is to become of all that divine good which was destined for the human race and how can god allow himself to be defrauded of the end of his work in this world he puts forth the masterpiece of his divine art and wisdom he creates a new man united with the divine person of his eternal word and makes the union of man with god eternally secure as all evil has come to mankind through human generation from adam he establishes a new and most pure principle of generation by grace in this new and divine adam that being transferred from the stock of the sinful adam men might be regenerated in him as the true head and father of the human race and as he unites in himself all things heavenly and earthly in their purity he is destined to renew all things and to be the fountain of pardon grace and benediction to all who accept his redemption and salvation the person of the father is incommunicable because he is the first principle of all things but the person of the word is communicable not by ceasing to be what he eternally is but by assuming to himself what by nature he is not yet even in this mystery god is always god and the creature is always the creature there is no mixture or confusion of the two natures of god and man but the principle of their union is the divine person of the word st thomas has explained why the divine word should become man rather than either of the other persons of the holy trinity in words as profound as they are clear he says the divine word hath not only a rational nature but he hath a certain affinity of reason with all creatures whatsoever as an artist has a conception of reason in his mind for whatever he produces so the divine word containeth in himself the reasons of all god's creatures wherefore as the creations of god are but a certain realization and representation of things that are embraced in the conception of the divine word all things are said to be created through the eternal word and from the consideration of this truth we can more readily understand how it became the divine word to enter into personal unity with the creature in human nature all that is required for a work so great and wonderful is a motive worthy of god but what motive can be more worthy than to secure the final end of his rational creation what motive more worthy than to give a new head and new life to his intelligent creatures what motive more worthy than to destroy sin and death what motive more worthy than to bring back truth and grace to the inhabitants of this earth what motive can be more worthy of god than to restore to humanity that lost humility by which man may be once more subject to god what motive can be more worthy of the divine goodness than to redeem his sinful creatures and restore them to the friendship of their creator what motive can be more worthy of god than to restore the light of divine truth to countless intelligences the power of grace to their enfeebled wills and the divine communion to their souls external to his essential glory what can be so glorious to god as this creation of such a new creature in the person of his son that though in form like the old yet in virtue he is filled with all the fullness of the godhead bodily that through him all things may be renewed in heaven and on earth 
what can be more glorious to god than to compass heaven and earth in a work of such surpassing power and excellence as to benefit all men and angels and to crown his creation with inexhaustible mercy and goodness the incarnation says saint augustine is the supreme example of the grace of god it is impossible for grace to be more graciously commended to us than in the son of god clothed with our humanity he made of himself a stepping says saint leo that through his humanity we might ascend to his divinity through the mystery of the incarnation the whole work of god is brought back to its first principle as in the soul of christ the spiritual creation is summed up in perfection and as in the body of christ the material creation is summed up in perfection and as this one example of perfect humanity has no other person than the eternal word and the eternal word is one with the blessed trinity all the elements of creation recapitulated in one perfect man return as by a circle of life to the first principle of all things as christ has purchased mankind with his blood and through his blood filled with his spirit he regenerates every man of good will to himself so the regenerate are concorporated with him and return through christ to god as in adam all die says st paul so also in christ all shall be made alive but every one in his order the first fruits christ then they who are in christ who have believed in his coming afterwards the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to god and the father and when all things shall be subdued to him then the son also himself shall be subjected unto him that put all things under his feet that god may be all in all to consider the nature of the union of god with man in christ there is no human person in christ but only a divine person the person of the son of god yet there are two natures in christ the divine and the human nature which two natures are ever distinct from each other as the soul and body is one man so god and man is one christ as the body of man is united with his soul in one person whilst the two substances are distinct so the humanity of christ is united with his divinity in one person whilst his two natures are distinct as the body of man is the living instrument of his soul to do his will so the humanity of christ is the living instrument of his divine person to do his will yet there are two wills in christ the human will and the divine will for each nature has its own will although his human will was ever obedient to his divine will st paul has used very remarkable terms to express the hypostatic union of the humanity of christ with his divinity in him he says it hath well pleased the father that all fullness should dwell again he says in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and using a yet more definite expression he says in whom the whole fullness of the godhead dwelt bodily that is to say the godhead dwells in the humanity of christ not accidentally not by mere operation or by grace alone but really and substantially there are two bonds of this substantial union the spiritual bond by which the soul of christ is in substantial union with the godhead and the corporal bond by which the body of christ is substantially united with the godhead and hence although the body and soul of christ were separated from each other in his death each was still united with his divinity 
Hence St. John says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Having considered the height of this masterwork of God, as it ascends even to the bosom of the Father, let us consider its depth for a moment as it descends even to the abyss of human weakness. St. Peter tells us how the angels long to look down into the depths of this amazing descent, that the almighty nature should descend into our humble condition, says St. Gregory of Nyssa, is the revelation of a power incomparably greater than all miracles, however stupendous, however high above the order of nature. When God puts his power forth to do some great and exalted work, we at once admit that it accords with his nature. But when he descends to what is low and abject, he reveals to us a most singular and overabounding power, yet a power that meets no hindrance, because the things done are above nature. Whatever work God undertakes, he destroys the impossible, he wills, and nature yields to his will. It was no reproach to him, says St. John Chrysostom, that he bore his own work upon him, and made that work his clothing, thereby conferring a great glory on that work. Even the first man was not made until the clay came into his divine hands, and such a corruptible vessel cannot be transformed until it becomes the clothing of the divine workman. In taking our human nature, the Son of God became our mediator and redeemer. There is one God and one mediator of God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a redemption for all, a testimony in due time. That he might execute this office, he received from his father the eternal priesthood, concerning which priesthood St. Paul quotes the solemn words of prophecy, showing it to have been already accomplished in the eternal decrees. He says, So Christ also did not glory in himself that he might be a high priest, but he that said to him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As he saith in another place, Thou art a priest for ever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek was both king and high priest. His origin is left in mystery, and he offered a sacrifice that differed from that of the law. To him, as priest of the Most High God, Abraham made offerings in the hour of victory, and in him all who are the children of Abraham. The priesthood of Christ is therefore a different priesthood from that of Aaron, which was but figurative, representative, and expectant of the priesthood of Christ. But from the priesthood of Christ, all priesthood before his time, and all priesthood after his time, obtains its power and derives its efficacy. What is the nature of this priesthood? St. Paul will tell us. Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in the things that appertain to God, that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sin, who can have compassion on them that are ignorant and err, because he also is encompassed with infirmity. To adopt the clear definition of St. Isidore of Pelusium, priesthood is the mediation between human and divine nature, worshipping the divine nature and working a change in human nature. The priesthood of Christ is in his human nature, although it receives its dignity and power from his divine person for which reason St. Paul says that every high priest is taken from among men, and that there is one mediator of God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Hence St. Athanasius says that the Word, who is the Creator, was made a high priest when he put on a created body. 
the priesthood of christ is therefore exercised in his human nature although in his divine person for says saint paul it was fitting that we should have such a high priest holy innocent undefiled separated from sinners and made higher than the heavens who needed not daily as the other priests to offer sacrifices first for his own sin and then for the people's for this he did once in offering himself the son of god is not only the high priest offering but the victim offered the lamb of god who taketh away the sins of the world he differs from all other priests in that whilst they offer another victim for their sins he offers himself as the one sinless victim for all sin this also saint paul reads in the eternal decrees as revealed through the prophets of old it is impossible he says that with the blood of oxen and goats sins should be taken away wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and oblation thou wouldest not but thou hast fitted a body to me holocaust for sin did not please thee then said i behold i come in the head of the book it is written of me that i should do thy will o god then said i behold i come to do thy will o god in the which will we are sanctified by the oblation of the body of jesus christ once the priest and victim are one because the innocent offered himself for the guilty they are one because when in his infinite mercy god decreed the justification of the unjust the atonement for sin could only be made by one who is perfectly just and who has the dignity of god to repair the indignities offered to god he therefore gave up his human nature to humiliations sorrows sufferings and crucifixion upon the altar of the cross that by the destruction of our mortal nature in him he might find immortal life both for himself and us and might show to us that by suffering with him and dying with him to our old and corrupted nature we might rise in him to a new life the priest and the victim are one because the sacrifice is a free offering of obedience unto death to atone for all human disobedience the high priest and the victim is man that he may stand in the place of his brethren whose sins he expiates he is also god that he may give an infinite value to the sacrifice he entered the household of humanity that he might repair what he had built this truth st paul puts forward with all the breath of his inspired mind consider he says the apostle and high priest of our confession jesus who is faithful to him that made him as was moses in all his house for this man was accounted worthy of greater glory than moses by so much more as he that built the house hath greater honour than the house for every house is built by some man but he that created all things is god and moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things that were to be said but christ as the son in his own house which house are we if we hold fast in confidence and hope to the end the builder of the house of humanity came into his own house found it ruined and defiled and purified and restored it at his own great cost and sacrifice and so st paul concludes having therefore a great high priest that hath passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession 
for we have not a high priest who cannot have compassion on our infirmities but one tempted in all things like as we are without sin the intrinsic character of that human sin for which christ offered himself a victim consists of two forms of egotism inordinate self-love or pride the one is the pride of the soul that swells against god and prefers our own light to the light of god our own will to the will of god and our own way to the way of god the other is that pride of the flesh which prompts the pride of the heart and swells in sensual and self-indulgence fills us with delusion and stimulates us to a gross and lawless love of self in preference to the love of god hence the scriptures tell us that pride is the root of all evil and that all evil takes its beginning from pride if the scriptures also tell us that covetousness is the root of all evil it means that avarice which draws all things covetable to the fostering of our self-love and pride rather than to employ them in the service of their divine author the proud man covets all things to himself makes himself the end of the creature in place of god which is consummate pride but christ saw human nature with the eyes of god and saw that to heal the egotism of that corrupted nature demanded sacrifice which is the direct and proper remedy for self-love from his birth to his death he took the way opposed to self-love pride sensuality and every kind of egotism in the fire of suffering he made himself a holocaust sacrificing every human inclination to obedience to his father's will coming to destroy the evil of self-love he said i came not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me and again i do nothing of myself but what i see my father doing that do i he showed us the wonderful strength and freedom of will that results from obedience he not only obeyed his father's will as it was internally made known but as it was externally manifested even in those human instruments that were in themselves evil and who by their pride and cruelty subjected him to ignominy and torments his maligners judges and executioners represented the malice contained in the whole sinfulness of human nature in its war against god and he suffered from sinful men for the love of sinful men so that we may ever say with too much truth that by our sins we have crucified the son of god he atones for the excess of our pride with the excess of humility and for the excess of our disobedience with the excess of his obedience and the world beholds the astonishing spectacle of god in man enduring all ignominy with divine patience and sounding all the depths of abasement he atones for the sins of our souls with the agonies of his own and for the sins of our bodies with sufferings unspeakable that began with his birth and were consummated in his death being in the form of god he thought it no robbery to be equal with god but emptied himself taking the form of a servant being made in the likeness of man and in habit formed as a man he humbled himself becoming obedient unto death even to the death of the cross but as saint paul says god was indeed in christ reconciling the world to himself having redeemed us with his blood that blood filled with his spirit and life obtained a virtue to purify all men and to restore them to justice 
rising from the dead and ascending on high he carried his blood through the veil into the sanctuary of heaven where he sits at the right hand of god making perpetual intercession for us for being consummated he became to all who obey him the cause of eternal salvation our saviour has taught us in the whole example of his life and death that as our fall and degradation comes of descending from the love of god to the love of self which can do nothing for us our reascent to god comes of sacrificing our love of self to the love of god which does all things for us and this he has taught us by word as well as by example he said to all if any one will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it but he that shall lose his life for my sake shall find it to sum up this discourse and bring its lines to one point christ is the head the summing up and the restoration of all things if we listen to saint irenaeus that disciple of the apostolic men will express this truth for us in vigorous terms one he says christ jesus our lord comes in virtue of a universal plan and sums up all things in himself as he is made both invisible and visible being both the word and man he recapitulates all that is heavenly spiritual and invisible and hath likewise the princedom of things visible and corporal taking to himself the primacy and setting forth himself as the head of the church he draws all things to himself in their due time st paul has portrayed this universal plan which god contemplated and which the eternal word has executed through his incarnation from its beginning to its final consummation in a passage of unrivalled magnificence giving thanks he says to god and the father who hath made us worthy to be partakers of the lot of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption through his blood the remission of sins who is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of every creature for in him were all things created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and in him and he is before all and by him all things consist and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may hold the primacy because in him it hath well pleased the father that all fullness should dwell and through him to reconcile all things unto himself making peace through the blood of the cross both as to the things on earth and the things that are in heaven end of lecture twelve part three Lecture 13, Part 1 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 13, The Regeneration of Man, Part 1. Who hath regenerated us unto a living hope? 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 there is no race of angels each one of them is a distinct and separate creation the substance of their nature is spiritual without the vesture of a body 
They are pure intelligences, with free and unceasing activity that requires no repose. They live by grace, and minister to the will of God. Of a nobler creation than man, their nature is more simple and pure, their intelligence more luminous, their fervor more ardent, as their love is without division, their response to the divine will more prompt, and their action more vigorous and steadfast. Having entered, after trial, into their beatitude, their spirits are as pure mirrors in receiving and reflecting the eternal truth, and their being is most beautiful and radiant with the light and ardor of the vision of God. They form a celestial hierarchy of many orders and degrees of excellence, according to the dignity of each one's creation, and the character and greatness of his gifts. Among those myriads of spirits, each one has his position, office, dignity, and glory, and as all are filled with happiness to the brim of capacity, there is neither rivalry nor jealousy, but the happiness of all augments the content of each through their mutual love in God. The higher have a divine ministry to the lower orders, the greater lights illuminating the lesser lights, and the greater powers giving strength to the lesser powers. God operating all in all. In numbers innumerable, those blessed spirits hold to their order, and are communicative of their gifts, and praise the divine author of their blessedness without ceasing. But as God never repeats himself in his works, but makes up in diversity what is wanting in infinity, and as the angels are not multiplied like men by generation, each angel is not only a separate creation, but a separate species. As compared with the angelic creation, the most wonderful thing in human nature is that corporate unity of all men in one species, which results from the generation of all men from one as the whole tree and all its branches are virtually contained in the root, the whole race of mankind was virtually contained in Adam. The very terms mankind and the human race, which have their representatives in all languages, express this unity of the human species. To the angelic intelligences, this plan of human creation must have appeared most wonderful, especially when they beheld that to each individual body, as it came into existence, a separate spiritual soul was created. In providing for the propagation of the human race from one, the Almighty contemplated the corporate unity of the human race for reasons most profound. This corporate unity of mankind is the cause of many virtues which otherwise could not exist. In that unity, God laid the deep foundations of the family life with its beautiful subordination in the authority of parents and the obedience of children which trains them for obedience to God. In the creation of the sexes, the wisdom of God provided for a high moral union to perfect the corporal unity of mankind. He took woman from man and then reunited them in the divine institution of marriage. He gave to man the stronger mind and greater force to be the guide, support, and protection of the woman. He gave to woman the stronger heart and finer sensibility tenderness and patience, to be the consolation of man. The man protects the woman, the woman gives her piety to the man. Each sex again exercises its special influence in the forming of their offspring. The man represents the authority, the woman the love of God. 
the one enfolds the child's heart with her affections, the other rules its waywardness with fear. Each is the complement of the other, and when their union is formed in God according to his divine institution, that union is the completion of humanity in all its attributes and qualities. The government of the household by the father, when he governs by the law of God, is an image of God's paternal government, and the obedience of the family in the fear and love of God is an image of the service which is due to God from all humanity. In the unity and brotherhood of mankind, God has also provided for the social life and for the government of men and for the social and political virtues which spring from that universal brotherhood. He who governs his brethren according to God's will and law is the servant of his brethren, as well as the servant of God. And they who obey him who governs for conscience' sake obey God, and yet are free in their obedience, as being of one blood, and therefore equal in the sight of God. In the corporate unity of the human race, provision was also made for that virtue of kindliness from man to his fellow man, which is founded in our natural kinship, and for that thoughtfulness for each other, which receives the beautiful name of humanity as being founded in the community of mankind. Although the bodies of men are multiplied and individualized through generation, the soul united to each body is not propagated, but is separately created to each body that is propagated. Hence our mother Eve spoke literally as well as prophetically, when at the birth of her firstborn she said, I have conceived a man through God. For whilst the body of the child was born of Adam, the soul came to that body from the creative hand of God. It is this consciousness of giving birth to an immortal soul that fills the mind of every devout mother with awe and wonder when she brings forth her firstborn into the world. So intimately, however, are the body and soul united in the composition of one person, so constant is the action and reaction of soul on body and body on soul, that each imparts its condition to the other, so that the body of sin propagated from the fallen Adam imparts its culpability to the whole person of man. Unless, therefore, that culpability be eradicated by regeneration into a better humanity, it remains in the same condition. But in constituting the human race in one common humanity, the almighty wisdom had yet higher objectives in view. The incorporeal angels have no corporate union. Their union is in the light grace and glory of God, and their communion with each other is in the charity of God. But as men are created lower than angels, as their spiritual being is united to a marvelous organization derived from the material substances of this world to which their souls impart life, God created them in the unity of one blood, as a natural foundation for that unity of mind and heart which is the work of his gifts. Had all men remained in grace and innocence, their common humanity would have provided a natural basis for the unity of their minds in one truth through one faith, and of the unity of their hearts in one hope, and one love of God and of each other for God's sake as also for their unity in one common worship, adoring God and giving him thanks together. In short, God designed that all men should be of one mind in his eternal word of truth and of one spirit in his Holy Spirit, 
as they are of one body, through propagation from one common father of their race. Such was the divine plan. But alas, how grievously has the unity of mankind been broken asunder! How perversely has that unity been thrown into disorder through the weakness of human wills and through that perverted love of self that puts pride in the place of charity and revolt in the place of obedience. This pride has not only separated man from God, but man from man, breaking up the concert of humanity after it had lost its harmony with God, and throwing men into endless discords. The propagation of the sinful Adam is the propagation of humanity in self-division, in the warring of man against his conscience, and in divisions and contentions of brethren against brethren that never cease to distract and afflict the great family of man. In his all-present knowledge, God foresaw those evils of division and dissension, as well as the other calamities of the human race, and he permitted them, that from their bitterness man might learn the misery of departing from God, and might find out from his weakness the need he has of God. Nothing more strikingly proves what rents and wounds have been made in human nature by its fall than those wars and contests between men of the same flesh and blood. Despite of all the provision made in the economy of our nature for the unity of its members, sin has not only brought division into each individual man, but that inward division has burst out into open divisions among the whole human family, divisions of mind, divisions of heart, divisions of nations, divisions of sects, and divisions of interests. But God, who sees all things past, present, and to come, in one ever-present, because eternal view, ordained the unity of the human family from one stock and blood, that it might profit in the end. The order of communicating grace provided for the angels would not have suited man, but God adopted the whole order of his grace for the whole order of our nature, and took up this very principle of generation into the supernatural order, united it with the divine man, and made it the principle of regeneration. He who by the Holy Spirit was born of the Virgin Mary in the person of the Son of God became a new principle of generation in whom all men have redemption and from whom all receive the grace of redemption who are regenerated in him. Through the union of his pure and sinless nature with the eternal word filled with grace and life, and using the sacrament of baptism as the visible and assured means of his divine operation, the children born of Adam are born anew to Christ, upon which he takes possession of them with his sacred and atoning blood, takes away their injustice, and gives them his justice. Through this divine principle of regeneration, Christ propagates himself. As the true head and regenerator of the human race, he excorporates us from the body of the old Adam and incorporates us into his own body, making us the children of his blood and spirit. Every Christian knows that he has received his evil from one man and his good from another. For there are but two men, there never were but two men, there never can be but two original men, the old Adam and the new Adam. The Apostle calls the first Adam a figure of him that is to come, for as the old Adam was the first head and father of mankind, Christ is the second head and father of mankind. 
Adam became to his children the original source of injustice and death. Christ is to his children the source of justice and life. Adam is the principal head of disobedience, Christ the principal head of obedience. St. Paul draws the contrast between these two heads of the human race in the following terms. The first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam a quickening spirit. Yet that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Afterwards, that which is spiritual. The first man was of the earth, earthly, the second man from heaven, heavenly. Such as is the earthly, such also are the earthly, and such as is the heavenly, such also are they that are heavenly. Therefore, as we have borne the image of the earthly, let us also bear the image of the heavenly. After showing that every man must bear either the earthly image of the earthly Adam or the heavenly image of the spiritual Adam, the apostle contrasts the death of sin derived from Adam with the grace of life derived from Christ. If by the offense of one many have died, much more the grace of God and the gift in grace of one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. For if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more they who receive abundance of grace and of the gift and of justice shall reign in life through one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, unto all men to condemnation, so also by the justice of one, unto all men to justification of life. For as by the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, so also by the obedience of one many shall be made just. After the contrast between the first and the second head and father of mankind, St. Paul brings in a chain of lucid comparisons to show how we are transferred from Adam to Christ, how we are excorporated from the first man and incorporated with the second. As it would have profited us but little to be born of Adam if we had not been redeemed by Christ, so even the redemption of Christ would not have profited us unless that redemption were conveyed into us through our regeneration into his body. This regeneration is our second birth, of which Christ said to Nicodemus, Amen, amen, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb, and he be born again? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to thee, except a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. The first argument of St. Paul in explanation of our transfer by regeneration from Adam to Christ is taken from the expressive signification of the act of baptism. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Baptism is the burial of the man in the water and the raising him out of the water in which he was buried, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. This burial in the water expresses the death of the man to the sinful Adam through the death of Christ, whilst his rising again out of the water expresses the new life that he receives from Christ through the operation of the Holy Spirit the action of the Holy Spirit, Christ himself explains in his continued words to Nicodemus. 
Wonder not that I have said to thee, You must be born again. The Spirit breatheth where he will, and thou hearest his voice. But thou knowest not whence he cometh and whither he goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Again the Apostle calls this regeneration a transplanting, because as the tree that is transplanted from one soil to another dies to the first and lives in the second where it is buried anew, so in his regeneration the man is transplanted from Adam to Christ. These are St. Paul's words. How shall we, who are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that all we who are buried in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death? For we are buried together with him in baptism into death, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, and that we may serve sin no longer. For he that is dead is justified from sin. For if we be dead in Christ, we believe that we shall live also together with Christ. Knowing that Christ, rising again from the dead, dieth now no more death shall no more have dominion over him. For in that he died to sin, he died once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again the Apostle compares the transfer of the regenerated from the body of Adam to the body of Christ to a second marriage after the first has been dissolved by death. Speaking of the law of Moses, a law which revealed sin and provoked it, though it did nothing for its remission, he says, The woman that hath a husband, whilst her husband liveth, is bound to the law. But if her husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Therefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you may belong to another who is risen again from the dead, that we may bring forth fruit to God. In another place, St. Paul compares the stock of Adam to the wild and unfruitful olive tree and Christ to the good and fertile olive, and shows how in our regeneration we are taken as a branch from the one and are engrafted in the other. Speaking to the converted Gentiles of the unconverted Jews, he says, And they also, if they abide not in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the wild olive tree, which is natural to thee, and contrary to nature, wert grafted into the good olive tree, how much more shall they, that are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? To show again that from Christ, as the root and stem, all the richness of his fruitful life flows into the engrafted branches, the Apostle says, If the first fruit be holy, so is the lump also, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken, and thou being a wild olive tree art engrafted in them, and art made partaker of the root and of the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. As St. Paul compares Christ with the olive tree, Christ compares himself with the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. 
for without me you can do nothing. Thus in the water of regeneration we enter into his death, and rise again in his life. As he is the fruitful olive, we are engrafted on him. As he is the vine, we are embranched in him as the root and stem of our life. Inexhaustible in the diversity of his illustrations, St. Paul again compares our transition from Adam to Christ to the casting away of an old garment, that we may be clothed with one that is new. For although Christ has atoned for our sins and has purchased for us the grace of life, although with him there is merciful forgiveness and with him plentiful redemption, yet all this is with him and not with us, until we come to him and accept freely with faith the sacrament of regeneration by which we are transferred from the sinful body of Adam to the glorious body of Christ, that so we may belong to his kingdom. Hence St. Paul exhorts those whom he instructs, If so be that you have heard him, and have been taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off according to the former conversation the old man, who is corrupted according to the desires of error, and put ye on the new man, who according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. How is this transformation accomplished? St. Paul tells us, Ye have been baptized, ye have put on Christ. As he says more explicitly in another place, when the goodness and kindness of God our Savior appeared, not by the works of justice, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the labor of regeneration and renovation of the Holy Spirit, whom he hath poured upon us abundantly, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we may be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This again is another of St. Paul's illustrative arguments, to which he often refers, that by our new birth in Christ through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, through whom, as Christ was generated into our human nature, we are regenerated into Christ, we are made joint heirs with him of eternal life. For whosoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again in fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit himself gives testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God, and if sons, heirs also, heirs indeed of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Yet so, if we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. We may sum up what has been thus far said in the words of St. Leo the Great. If the word had not been made flesh and dwelt among us, if the Creator had not descended into one common life with his creature, if he had not brought back the old humanity to a new beginning, death would have reigned from Adam even to the end, and an irrevocable condemnation would have rested upon all men. The very condition of their birth would have caused all men to perish. Of all the sons of men, the Lord Jesus was alone born innocent, because he alone was conceived without defiling cupidity. He was made a man of our race, that we might be made the consorts of his divine nature. That origin which he took from the virgin's womb, he deposited in the font of baptism. What was given to the mother was given to the water. That same power from on high the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit that caused Mary to bring forth our Savior causes the water to regenerate the believer. 
what could there have been provided more capable of healing the sick of enlightening the blind and of giving life to the dead than the cure of the wounds of pride by the medicine of humility it was by his neglecting the commands of god that adam brought the condemnation upon us that is due to sin and it was by his being made under the law that jesus brought back to us the liberty of justice it was by obeying the devil even to the extent of prevarication that adam deserved that we should die in him and it was by obeying the father even to the cross that jesus obtained that we all should live in him it was by ambitionating angelic honors that adam lost the dignity of his nature and it was by taking upon him our infirm condition that jesus raised up those souls to the heavenly places for whose sake he descended into hell it was said to adam because of his pride dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return but it was said to jesus because of his humility sit thou at my right hand until i make thy enemies the footstool of thy feet as there are two heads of mankind there are also two bodies each cleaving to its own head into which the human race is divided the one is concorporated with adam the other with christ these are the two cities or kingdoms so often described in the holy scriptures as the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of god this is the one great division of the human race as god beholds the human family of these two cities or kingdoms st augustine wrote the history from the creation to his time in the great and arduous work of the city of god as his chief object was to instruct the children of this world concerning the ways of god in the world he began that history as he tells us with a sense of dismay because he knew how hard it is to persuade the proud that the great force of virtue lies hidden in humility for the city of this world takes its rise from pride while the city of god is founded in humility christ as god in humiliation has founded the city of god satan the author of pride has founded the city of this world in the city of god the truth the law and the love of god prevail but in the city of the world it is error and injustice and contention that have the sway the one is called the city of jerusalem where the people of god live in unity and peace the other is called the city of babylon where it is the city of division and confusion christ rules the one through his servants satan rules the other through his bondsmen the aims of these two cities are as far asunder as heaven is from earth for the inhabitants of the one seek god and are but as travellers from this world to a better whilst the inhabitants of the other confine their views to this world and care not to look for the better world to come the one rests in faith upon the revelations of god as upon a rock of truth unchangeable the other floats upon the opinions of this world as upon banks of sand that are ever shifting and uncertain in this world the populations of these two cities are visibly mingled together although invisibly they are separated but in the world to come they shall be forever separated as the justice of god shall separate them but whilst they are in this world there is a frequent migration from one city to the other for there are those who pass from the earthly to the heavenly city but who are weak in faith and fall back again there are others who are visibly in the city of god 
but their hearts are with the city of the world. And there are others who, although visibly in the city of the world, have their hearts with the city of God. As each of these cities is formed of men who have a body and a soul, a visible presence and an invisible spirit, in the visible kingdom of God are those who are visibly united with her and openly profess her faith and obedience. But the just alone belong to the soul of God's kingdom and shall alone inherit that kingdom after the great judicial division of mankind. If we look into the interior spirit and life of these two kingdoms, nothing can be more unlike, nothing more opposite, than they are to each other. From a deep experience of both of them, St. Augustine has drawn their contrast in a celebrated passage. Two loves, he says, have founded these two cities. The love of self, carried to contempt of God, has made the earthly city. The love of God, carried to contempt of self, has made the heavenly city. The one, therefore, glorifies in herself, the other in God. The one seeks glory from men, the other puts her glory in God, who is the witness of their conscience. The one lifts up her head in self-glorification, the other says to God with a humble soul, Thou, O God, art my glory, and the uplifter of my head. The earthly city is moved by the lust of power and dominion, and rejoices when her chiefs subdue the nations. But in the heavenly city all serve each other in mutual charity. Those who preside consult in charity, and those who are subject obey in charity. Whilst the earthly city puts her confidence in her own strength, the heavenly city seeks her strength from God. The wise men of the earthly city are wise in their own prudence and live according to man. They seek the goods of the body or of the intellect or both together. If they know God, they do not glorify him as God nor give him thanks, but they become vain in their thoughts and their hearts are darkened. But in the heavenly city men know no greater wisdom than faith and piety and the worship of the true God after the manner which he prescribes, and they expect their reward with all the saints and angels, that God may be all in all. These two cities, with their empires, date from the beginning of mankind. No sooner had Adam fallen and Christ appears in the promise of redemption. In the first two sons of Adam, the two kingdoms become visible. In Abel and his children, the kingdom of faith arises. In Cain and his descendants appears the kingdom of this world. Abel worships God, offering the sacrifice of the Lamb, expressive of redemption through the blood of Christ. Cain offers the fruits of the earth. Abel offers the sacrifice of obedience. Cain chooses an oblation of his own devising. In the person of Cain, the city of this world already persecutes the city of God in the person of Abel. And this persecution is destined to continue through all time until the two kingdoms are forever separated. It is not without a profound reason that this conflict between the children of Adam is recorded in the beginning of the Holy Scriptures, where the child of injustice inflicts, and the child of justice suffers with patience. Nor is it without profound reason that the Scriptures exhibit this conflict between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God going on with ever-increasing intensity, as prophetically summed up in the closing book of the Scriptures. End of Lecture 13, Part 1
Lecture 13, Part 2 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 13, The Regeneration of Man, Part 2. The kingdom of God is the church of Christ, ever one and the same from the promise of redemption in paradise to the end of time. Christ yesterday, says St. Paul, today, and he is the same forever. He is the object and end of the patriarchal worship from Abel to Abraham. He is contemplated in the divine deliverance of Israel from Egypt. He is the end of the law and of the sacrifices. He is contemplated in the prophetical teachings from Abraham to John the Baptist. One dispensation is added to another, the latter enlarging upon the former, and each more wealthy in the expression of Christ, until Christ appears, and all those figures vanish like shadows before the sun in presence of the reality. As the church sings in the ordination of her priests, the Holy Lord, Almighty Father and Eternal God, through whom all things are brought onwards, and by whom all things are strengthened, doth always enlarge the growth of rational nature, with greater increase unto better things. As God first creates the elements of things, and then by his provident wisdom advances them with time to their better state, so in the spiritual order of good, which he provides for rational natures, he unfolds one dispensation after another, each the amplification of the former, until the whole divine plan is revealed in its magnificent mercy and brought to the perfection of good. But Christ, the deliverer and true father of mankind, is the beginning and end of all. This has been admirably expressed by St. Augustine, Whatever he says appeared in a sacred and mystical manner to the fathers in angelic miracles were figures of this sacrament, of this sacrifice, of this priest, of this God. These and all that the fathers did were figures of him before he was sent and made of a woman, that every creature might speak in facts concerning the one to come, who is the salvation of all who are restored from death. As we had turned with wicked impiety from the one true and supreme God to rebellion and discord, we fell from him who is one to many things, were divided by many things, and clove to many things. It therefore became needful that through the merciful command of God many things should proclaim that one, and that the one should not come until many things had proclaimed him, that they might be the witnesses of his coming, and that when at last we come to that one, we may be unburdened of those many things. Of those many things that spoke of Christ, the one that spoke most clearly and universally was the sacrifice of the Lamb. Christ is called the Lamb that was sacrificed from the foundation of the world. Abel offered the Lamb in sacrifice and became the victim of his faith. Noah, after his deliverance from the flood, offered sacrifices of all clean animals, and God gave him the promise, I will no more destroy every living soul as I have done. Abraham prepares to sacrifice his beloved son at God's command. God accepts his will, and a ram is offered in his place. The Israelites in Egypt sacrifice a lamb in each house as God commands. Their doorposts are stained with its blood, and the destroying angel passes over them uninjured. The paschal lamb is the great central institution of the law of Moses. The prophet Isaiah saw Christ in these sacrifices and these sacrifices in Christ. 
the lord hath laid upon him the iniquities of us all he was offered because it was his own will and he opened not his mouth he shall be led as a sheep to the slaughter and shall be dumb as a lamb before the shearer and he shall not open his mouth he was taken away from distress and judgment who shall declare his generation st john the baptist the predestined connection between the old testament and the new fulfills his divine office first by a figurative baptism then by pointing christ out to men in these words behold the lamb of god behold him that taketh away the sins of the world after the lamb of god was slain and many had been purified in his blood st peter reminds the faithful of his kingdom that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as gold or silver from your vain conversation of the tradition of your fathers but with the precious blood of christ as of a lamb unspotted and undefiled foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world but manifested in the last times for us the chief of apostles then reminds them how they became partakers in this precious blood being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god who liveth and reigneth for ever finally in the closing book of scriptures st john the evangelist wrapped in spirit beholds the golden altar before the throne of god and upon the altar the lamb standing as it were for ever slain and the lamb unseals the book of mysteries and sends forth the seven spirits of god into all the earth before him ascends the incense of prayer from all the saints whom he has redeemed around him are the angels and the elders of his church before him in their orders are the thousands of thousands whom he has redeemed from the twelve tribes of israel and from every tongue and tribe and nation and they sing the canticle of god and of the lamb with a voice like the sound of many waters they sing the lamb that was slain is worthy to receive power and divinity and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and benediction and the lamb in the midst of the throne shall rule them and shall lead them to the waters of life and shall wipe away every tear from their eyes and he was clothed with a garment sprinkled with blood and his name is the word of god such is the kingdom of god such is the church of christ all who are generated into christ are generated into his kingdom it is composed of all the angels who stood firm through the grace of the eternal word their mediator with the father and of all just and faithful men and women who either lived by the grace of christ believing and trusting to the promise before he came into the world or who have lived by his faith and grace in his kingdom since he came into the world each according to the dispensation granted to their times, whether in the church expecting Christ or in the church possessing Christ. The wonderful descriptions of the celestial kingdom that conclude each period of the conflict of Christ's church on earth grow more magnificent in the apocalypse as each epoch sends its contribution of martyrs, confessors, virgins, and saints of every class to fill up the heavenly places and swell the eternal chorus. The eternal rewards are promised with ever-renewed conflict to them who overcome their adversary by the conquest of themselves and who account this life as nothing in comparison with the life to come but before the price of our redemption was paid the gates of heaven were closed against mankind even the just men of the former times looked to god with fear and trembling and went down in sorrow to the grave knowing that their spirits must abide in a region of exile 
until their divine deliverer should come. They felt, as they said, that they should not praise God in the land of the living. They called their place of detention the Hebrews Sheol, the Greeks Hades, that is, the lower regions, the Latins Limbus, that is, the region bordering on heaven. Christ himself called it the bosom of Abraham, not the bosom of God, as being the place where the father of the faithful awaited in expectancy with all the children of faith and justice. The Hades of Homer and of other pagan writers, and that thirst of the departed spirits for sacrificial blood, presents an evident link of common tradition with the Sheol of God's people. But St. Peter tells us that whilst the body of Christ was dead on the cross, his living spirit went down and preached to the captives who were in prison, even from the days of Noah. And St. Paul tells us that before he ascended to heaven, Christ first descended into the lower regions of the earth and made captives of those who dwelt there in captivity. The apostle speaks of the unity of the whole church as the one body of Christ in one spirit through his gifts, and to show that the church of the former ages is one body with the church of Christ, he says, Wherefore he saith, ascending on high, he led captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it, but because he also descended first into the lower regions of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. This is that descent into hell which is expressed in the Apostles' Creed, not into the everlasting hell of which we have such awful descriptions in the prophets, but into the limbus of the fathers. Of this descent and deliverance we have magnificent descriptions in the prophetic writings under the figure of nearer events. The Spirit of Christ went down thither from his cross, broke the iron bars, and burst the brazen gates asunder. The whole region was stirred at his coming, and the mighty ones arose from their seats, for the light of the long-looked-for presence of their Redeemer shone upon them, and they heard the voice of their Deliverer, listened to the ghostly dialogue. Who is this that cometh from Edom with garments stained from Basra? this beautiful one in his robe, walking in the greatness of his strength. I that speak justice, and am a defender to save. Why then is thy apparel red, and thy garments like theirs who tread the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the Gentiles there is not a man with me. I have trampled them down in my indignation, and have trodden them down in my wrath and their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and all my apparel is stained. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redemption is come. I looked about, and there was none to help. I sought, and there was none to give aid. And my own arm hath saved for me, and my indignation itself hath helped me. I will remember the tender mercies of the Lord, the praise of the Lord for all the things that the Lord hath bestowed on us, and for the multitude of his good things to the house of Israel, which he hath given them according to his kindness, and according to the multitude of his mercies. And he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not deny. So he became their Savior. In all their affliction he was not troubled, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy he redeemed them, and he carried them, and lifted them up all the days of old. And they said, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath taken us, and he will heal us. He will strike, and he will cure us. He will revive us after two days, 
On the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. We shall know, and we shall follow on, that we may know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning light, and he will come to us as the early and the latter rain to the earth. On the third day his spirit arose from the limbus of the fathers, attended by all the spirits of the just, and left it empty. Many of those saints arose and appeared to numbers of people in Jerusalem. His spirit united with his body, and as the apostles significantly say, he rose again from the dead. Because his first rising was with the spirits of the just from the lower regions of the earth. On the fortieth day he ascended into heaven with all that glorious company. Now are the angelic hosts to meet their brethren from the earth, whom through the long ages they have served, whom they have helped in all their combats. And King David, on his prophetic harp, had mused upon this rapturous moment. This is the generation of them that seek him, of them that seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, O eternal gates, and the King of glory shall enter in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, O eternal gates, and the King of glory shall enter in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Christ carries his blood through the veil into the eternal sanctuary, and behold, he stands for us upon the golden altar before the throne of God the Lamb forever slain for us, the victim forever pleading for us, the high priest forever interceding for us. And around him and before him is that great multitude whose voice is as many waters and as great thunders, and they sing the canticle of God and the Lamb, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to take the book and to open the seals thereof, because thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God in thy blood, out of every tribe, and tongue, and people, and nation, and hast made us to our God a kingdom, and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We here contemplate the marvelous unity of the church in heaven, as its countless members center their spirits upon the throne of God, and the altar of the Lamb. The whole heavenly part of St. John's revelations is a picture of this unity, but there is also an earthly history in these revelations, running from the apostolic times to the end of the world, where amidst the unceasing conflicts between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, between the church and the ungodly world, we are made to see another order of union, a union of a most intimate kind between the church in heaven and the church on earth. We are made to see that all the victories of the church in the world are achieved through the blood and grace of Christ. We behold the angels and saints intensely interested in the combats of their brethren on earth, we see the angels descending in the ministry of God and confronting the adversaries of God's servants. This is but a continuance in the church of what we find throughout the older scriptures, and in the records of these later times, St. John often adopts the language of the older prophets in describing the combats of the church with the world as if to show that they are only now having their final fulfillment. As the kingdom of this world is severed from the unitive body of God's revealed truth, and from the unitive grace whereby the heart cleaves to that all-uniting truth, the world is necessarily broken up into endless divisions. 
and whilst it bears the stains and wrinkles of concupiscence upon its brow it bears on its features the marks of selfish thought and of every varying opinion self-love self-opinion self-interest and self-exaltation are the motive powers that move the world in opposition to the kingdom of god self-love in all its vicious forms is the enemy of god the adversary of his truth the corrupter of justice and the enemy of social unity pride resists god and dissolves all unity whether by heresy it sets up man's opinion against the unity of faith or by schism it sets up self-will against obedience to authority or by ambition it stirs up nation against nation or by iniquity it divides the man against his conscience but the church of god is one and undivided throughout the universe of heaven earth and the region under the earth where just souls are purified for their entrance into heaven and this union of every part of the church st paul expresses in the following sentence that in the name of jesus every knee should bow of those things that are in heaven on earth and under the earth and that every tongue should confess that the lord jesus christ is in the glory of god the father the unity of god's kingdom rests upon the unity of god upon the unity of christ upon the unity of his body which is his church and upon the unity of the means of redemption which he has prescribed as he alone has power to prescribe the father is one the word of the father is one the holy spirit is one and all these three are one truth is one for all minds justice is one for all wills the authority of god is one for the obedience of all souls christ is one his doctrine is one his body is one his sacrament of regeneration into his body is one one is the supreme end of man and one is the way to that supreme end christ himself has said i am the way the truth and the life one therefore and only one is the kingdom of god on earth that universal kingdom which daniel so clearly predicted and described and of which christ declared that the unity of its members should always be the proof of his presence one on earth and one with the kingdom of heaven where christ reigns all in all the unity of faith in the church rests upon the unity of that truth and of that unitive grace which christ has deposited in her bosom and upon his promise to abide with her as the life in the body even to the ending of the world what is christ christ is all that he is by his divine and human nature all that he has spoken of truth all that he has wrought of justice all that he has done for our redemption he is all that he has organized of power and ordained of authority to teach his word to govern his kingdom and to minister his grace through the sacraments which he has established he is all that he imparts of regeneration pardon light and grace and consolation to all who receive those gifts from him all that emanates from christ is christ to accept a divided truth a divided justice a divided kingdom of god is to accept a divided christ which is impossible when the corinthians divided themselves into parties marked by the names of their several teachers st paul rebuked them in these terms now this i say that every one of you saith i indeed am paul and i am of apollo and i am of cephas and i am of christ 
Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? We must accept the whole Christ, but this is to accept his whole truth, all that he has instituted, and all he has ordained, not as we choose to fancy them, nor upon any man's opinion of them, but from the authority of that kingdom or church in which he has deposited them, and which he has commanded to keep them, where we neither have faith in Christ, nor can we be members of his kingdom. Christ organized his kingdom in a visible unity, conspicuous to all men, and he declared that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. He made the entrance into that kingdom through the door of a visible sacrament. He organized its authorities in subordination to one supreme authority established in one person. To that one he gave the keys of power. To that one he committed the chief and universal charge. That one he made the foundation upon which the structure of the church was built and to that one he promised that the gates of hell should never prevail against what was built upon him. He ever takes the lead, and his successors have ever claimed, have ever exercised the apostolate, have ever been recognized and obeyed as the vicars of Christ. There has never been anything like this compendious and comprehensive unity in the world besides. Nothing in human nature can explain it. It is the keystone of that unity of Christ's body which he commanded to be, and for which he prayed. What have we said that St. Paul has not said more compendiously? One body and one spirit, as you are called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in us all. There is nothing on which the great apostle has been more explicit or emphatic than the organic unity of the church or body of Christ. He says, As the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of the body, whereas they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For in one spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free, and in one spirit we have all been made to drink. In the same chapter the Apostle enlarges upon the mutual connection and dependence of the many members of this body, and of the one spirit that breathes through the whole and he thus concludes that there may be no schism in the body, but the members might be mutually careful one for another, and if one member suffers anything, all the members suffer with it, or if one member glory, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members of member. That is to say, the faithful of the church of Corinth were members of a member of the universal church. To the Ephesians the apostle brings out the organic unity of the church in yet a more striking way. After speaking of the one body and one spirit and the rest, as we have recently quoted, he thus explains the construction of this unity. He that descended is the same also that ascended above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and others evangelists, and others pastors and doctors, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all meet in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the age of the fullness of Christ, that henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro, 
and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the wickedness of men, by the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. But doing the truth in charity, we may in all things grow up in him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being compactly and fitly joined together, by what every joint supplieth, according to the operation in every part, maketh increase of the body unto the building of itself in charity. With a sense thus vivid of the organic unity of the church, felt as vividly as any one can feel his own organic unity, the apostles were intolerant of all heresies, sects, and schisms, which they repeatedly denounced, forbidding all communication with their authors. And as the church has always lived in the same keen sense of her unity, she has never hesitated to cut those off who disturbed her unity whenever they have proved incurable. As man lost his dignity by disobedience and his spiritual strength by self-assertion, and as all the divisions of mankind have come of their terrible egotism, the whole plan of the Savior of mankind was to destroy this egotism, this self-assertion and disobedience. His great object, therefore, was to reunite the human family in himself, that through his humanity they might cleave to his divinity that so they might recover their unity in one and their final end. Consider the nature of man. He is not a mere intelligence. He is made of body and soul, most closely adhering to each other. He is compacted of sense and imagination as much as of intelligence. Before he can be restored to God, all these elements must be taken hold of. What carries him from the truth but his senses? What leads him into error but his imagination? What takes him from the spirit but the flesh? What holds him back from God but his pride or sloth? What withdraws him from the virtues but the passions of his fallen nature? They fill the imagination with the promise of great things that they can never perform. We talk of the five or the seven senses, but what a manifold network there is in each of these senses that work from outwards inwardly. And when they have reached there, what an unsearchable network there is in their combination as the result of their play meets in the imagination. How innumerable again are the objects that attract the senses and through them affect the soul how these senses and the imagination on which they work catch the flames of concupiscence and conspire to fill the soul with earthly to the exclusion of heavenly desires. Nothing can be more evident than that the senses and even the imagination of man require to be rectified as well as his soul, and that the body must be brought under subjection before the soul can recover her superiority. Those who speak of a purely spiritual religion as most suitable to man know not what they say. A purely spiritual religion is for natures purely spiritual, like the angels, as if man had not fallen in body as well as soul, as if he had not fallen through the very means of his corporal senses as if the soul did not live in the senses as well as in herself, as if the senses did not act with amazing power on the soul, as if this covetous body did not make the soul covetous, or the sensuous body did not make the soul sensuous, or the impure body did not make the soul impure, or the restless body did not make the soul passionate. How are we to reach the revelation of God, except through visible teaching? How are the spiritual things of God to be laid hold of securely, except as clothed with sensible forms, 
whether of language, figures of speech, those brighteners of intelligence drawn from visible things, or of sacraments. What is the divine incarnation but an appeal to mankind through God's visible human nature? What are the words and actions, the life and death of Christ, but one grand appeal to our spiritual nature through every sense and feeling of our earthly frame? To deny that religion embraces body as well as soul is to deny the efficacy of the divine incarnation. To deny the organic unity of Christ's universal church is to deny both the unity of Christ and the unity of the human family, which he came to restore and to perfect. Who that understands human nature can fail to see that the incarnation of the eternal word is most divinely fitted to the requirements of human restoration? If all religion is incorporated in Christ, if it be all summed up in the words of St. Paul, Christ yesterday, today, and he is the same forever, and if in Christ our religion is both spiritual and corporal, what else ought we to look for but that his divine institutions should reflect his incarnation and should incorporate his authority in visible persons and his spiritual gifts in visible elements? The body of Christ is pure, undefiled, and ever obedient to his spirit. His spirit is not filled with flesh, but his flesh with spirit. That body is the veil and the vital instrument of his spiritual action. Through its medium he takes hold of the senses of men, and through their senses he takes hold of their spirit. Christ is a universal sacrament. The eyes of men look on him, and their souls feel his power. His words enter their ears, and light passes to their minds. He commands and yields nature to his voice. He puts forth his hand, and power goes forth from him, to heal the sick, to cure the blind, to raise the dead. He draws all visible things into parables, in which he makes the truth visible and perceptible to human sense. The eternal word tempers all his acts and teachings to human nature in a human manner, fitted both to sense and understanding, and expressed with human sympathy. He weeps over evil, and the souls of men are opened by his tenderness. He smiles, and their hearts expand. He rebukes, and they fear. He loves, and they are drawn to his love. He blesses with open hands, and their hearts feel his grace. He takes bread into his hands, and with a consecrating benediction he says, This is my body, and at his creative word it becomes what he calls it, and so of the cup with his blood. His body and blood are full of his life and spirit, and whilst his disciples partake of the one, they receive the other. End of Lecture 13, Part 2《Lecture 13, Part 3 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Lecture 13, The Regeneration of Man, Part 3 Christianity consists more in actions than in words. The object of teaching is to bring us to action and external action is but the expression of internal action. Can there be anything more striking to mortal sense, or healing to human sensuality, than to look with the eyes of faith upon the sufferings and death of Christ? What can be more purifying to our senses 
than to contemplate that agony in which the Son of God suffers in innocence as a penitent for our sins. What more destructive to our pride than his humiliations before the courts of Jerusalem? There we see the value of this world's judgments when it speaks in the cause of God. There we see the God of truth and justice condemned to death to be even put out of this world because he troubles the pride of life. What can be more corrective to the unclean passions of our nature than to behold the Son of God denuded to the cruel scourge? Pilate declared him innocent and then gave him up to be lacerated and torn in body and in soul and Christ submits to atone for our sensualities. What can more effectively open our heart to Christ with repentance than to look upon the divine victim for our sins and healer of our sorrows as crowned with thorns, and with the cross upon his shoulders he moves on his dreary way to Mount Calvary, where extended on the cross and fastened with nails to its wood, and lifted up by human malignity unto a divine sacrifice, he bleeds for us, suffers the extremes of anguish for us, prays for us, and pardons us, dies to give us life, and reconciles the world that crucifies him to God and the Father. It is your mortal eyes that bring your spirit to see, your mortal ears that bring your soul to listen, and your heart to know this man, this God, this priest, this victim, torn and rent for the destruction of your concupiscence, this blood of God shed for the cleansing of your sins, this fountain of life and grace expended for your use and service this sermon of sermons, this truth of truths, enacted before your eyes, and appealing through every mortal sense and feeling to your immortal soul. It is a spectacle that subdues every petulant passion and conceit into awe and silence, fills your whole being with the sense of how God has loved you and given himself for you and brings down the whole pride of life into humble fear and faith and gratitude. Then the charity of Christ falls upon us like fire, and our hearts are constrained to acknowledge that as Christ died for us, we ought not to live to ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose for our justification. Then we understand how we ought to mortify our earthly members, that Christ may reign in our mortal body. Then we can comprehend how the old things ought to pass away, that we may become a new creature in Christ. Blind is every one, and blind with pride, who cannot see that the whole intent of the divine incarnation is to take hold of us bodily as well as spiritually, and to bring the whole man under subjection to the rule of the Son of God. Blind is he who does not see the condition of his own nature, and that the great obstacle to his bringing his spirit to the Spirit of God is the opposition of his carnal to his spiritual nature, and that it is through the conquering of his senses that the mind and heart are conquered to the light and grace of God. The first design for the happiness of man was to make one kingdom of the human family, all being united in truth and charity, both with their Creator and with each other. They were therefore created in corporate unity, in one Father and from one flesh and blood whereby all men were cemented into one common and natural brotherhood, and were intended to be united with God and with each other through one common light of faith, and by the heavenly gift of charity. But this great design for the securing of human happiness 
was broken and destroyed by man himself. Sin entered into him, and with sin the loss of the principle of union, and division took place within the man, and broke forth and filled the world with contentions, enmities, hatreds, and rivalries. The restoration of man would therefore be very incomplete, were it not a corporate as well as a personal restoration, were it not that unity of brotherhood re-established in Christ, which sin had destroyed by the fall of Adam. This was the great work of the Son of God. He established his kingdom, or church, in which those who were no longer united in the blood of Adam were united in his blood, so that they who were before divided in soul were reunited together in his truth and grace. This is that kingdom of God which the prophet Daniel saw in vision, with the kingdoms of the earth falling down before it. The king of Babylon was a stone cut out of a mountain without hands. This stone is Christ, of whom St. Peter says, The stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. Then the stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And this is the prophet's interpretation of the vision. In the days of those kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, and his kingdom shall not be delivered up to another people, and it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and itself shall stand forever. This universal, inalienable, and everlasting kingdom has ever been regarded as the kingdom of Christ, nor can it be any other. The prophet marked out the very time and the conditions of its appearance in the world. To secure the unity, life, and perpetuity of this kingdom, Christ gave to it a divine and a fourfold power. This fourfold power was received from him as the king, the priest, the teacher, and the savior of mankind. The first power Christ gives to his kingdom is government, invested in a priesthood derived from his own. He centers this government in one as the secure foundation of its unity and gives to that one the keys of power and the command to feed his whole flock as the shepherd of men. He establishes that one as a rock and gives his strength to that rock to sustain the whole building of the church. Having given his kingly power to one, the apostolic authority which he had first concentrated in that one, he distributes to the twelve, but their apostolate expires with them, and the sacerdotal and pastoral powers continues with their successors. But the apostleship continues to the end of time in the succession of the one in whom it was first concentrated. Then the divine founder of the church establishes a second order of clergy, cooperating with the first in the seventy-two disciples. Having provided for the government of his kingdom, he deposits with that government his eternal truth, with authority and command to teach that truth to all nations, and with the promise to be with the teachers whom he has appointed, and to keep them in all truth to the end of time. He thus gives to all men of good will the certainty and security as to where they may find his authority, and where they may obtain his truth. In the hands of that authorized priesthood he also ordains his sacraments, the visible and most certain channels of his invisible grace, for the cleansing, the sanctifying, and the consecrating of human nature. He also institutes a divine worship in his own divine sacrifice, to be the great and the perpetual center of all worship. In this sacrifice, Christ himself is still the sovereign priest, 
still the sacred victim, not another sacrifice, but always the same that was offered on the cross. As that sacrifice is always offered for mankind in heaven above, so it is offered on the earth beneath by Christ himself through the hands of his appointed ministers. He thus fulfills his promise through the last of his prophets, that from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, my name is great among the Gentiles, and in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation. The Eucharistic sacrifice and sacrament, the sublimest communication between heaven and earth, the greatest of God's gifts to man, is the extension through time of the divine incarnation. What is commenced in the sacrament of regeneration is completed in the Eucharistic sacrament. The first of these sacraments brings the child of Adam into the mystical body of Christ. The second perfects his union with Christ in the partaking of his very body and blood, filled with spirit and life. And by this access to the spring of grace and truth, he obtains more than ever he lost in the tree of life. In all the communications of God with man, there are divine and even infinite reservations into which we neither can nor ought to penetrate beyond the veil of faith. God reveals not his majesty. He gives us no approach to his sacred privacy. He withholds us from the splendor of his insufferable light and burning glory. We cannot see God with our mortal eyes or with our spiritual eyes. There is no proportion between them and the unspeakable vision of God until, after our probation is over, they shall be prepared for their measure of beatitude. Yet the just soul often feels the tempered influence of the eternal presence. The word incarnate was seen by mortal eyes, yet in a human way, so that faith alone discovered that he was the Son of God. Once alone to chosen witnesses, he appeared in effulgent glory, which overwhelmed their sense and soul, so that they could not continue to look upon him. After he arose from the dead, he was seen often and by many, yet in a way that was toned to their ordinary senses, until the crowd of witnesses beheld his ascent to heaven. In all these revelations of the Son of God, there were infinite reservations. But his Eucharistic presence is preeminently the mystery of faith and the reward of faith. Even his sacrificed humanity is presented under veils. The external qualities of bread and wine remain to form those veils, whilst the substance is changed into his body and blood in virtue of his own creative words. Faith penetrates those veils with love whilst unbelief is turned away. The substance of things is the object of human intelligence, but not of human sense. God alone has the perfect knowledge and view of substance. This again is a divine reservation. Substance is that secret force or energy which sustains the qualities presented to the senses. From the qualities in the ordinary course of nature we infer the substance, but in the Eucharistic sacrament, whilst the qualities remain, the substance is changed, and the qualities veil the substantial presence of the body and blood of Christ. The reality is concealed from the sensual man, whilst it exercises the faith of the spiritual man. For faith is the fundamental condition of spiritual life in this world of probation. As the presence of the eternal word, who is in the world, though the world knows him not, is veiled from us by the whole creation, so the presence of his body and blood is veiled as in a mystery, that it may not be seen except by faith. 
pride is ever curious and restless to know everything before its time. Patient humility is content to await the hour when God shall reveal all things. Pride, which would command all things, turns with averted eyes from the evidence that rests on divine authority. But the divine mysteries are ordained for humble souls, whose subjection to God is the preparation for the reception of eternal things. There is even a divinely benignant consideration for our human weakness in this veiling of the heavenly mysteries, which the Greek father Theophylact has expressed in these terms that we may not hold back with fear at the sight of the body and blood upon the holy tables of our churches god condescends to our weakness infuses the power of life into the oblations and the energy of his blood what a scene was that in the synagogue at capernaum whose walls have recently been brought again to light it is recorded in the sixth chapter of st john the multitude who had eaten the miraculous bread the day before followed our Lord across the lake in their boats. Jesus said to them, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews therefore debated among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Clear proof is this, how well they understood his words. They knew not that he was the Son of God, nor did they know how his flesh was to be eaten, but they had no doubt of his having declared that his flesh was to be eaten. Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, abideth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. This most clear, emphatic, unmistakable, and often repeated declaration literally staggered his audience. Now mark the result. There could not be, nor was there, any doubt as to his meaning. The difficulty was to believe what was so new and strange. Many, therefore, of his disciples, hearing it, said, This saying is hard, and who can hear it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Does this scandalize you? If then you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you that believe not. They thought of eating his dead body like ordinary food, whilst he spoke of his living and life-giving body, Yet he points to this once more. What if you saw me ascend to heaven where I was before? He then explains that the flesh is nothing without the spirit of life, and that their fleshly views will not help them to accept his words without faith. Now mark the final result. After this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They went away because they could not believe that they must eat his flesh and blood. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. 
and we believe and have known that thou art the christ the son of god the apostles understood not how this was to be more than the multitude but they believed he would fulfill what he said because he is the son of god we may imagine the impression left on the minds of the apostles by these plain but mysterious words and by this extraordinary scene how often must they have recalled it how often they must have talked it over and have wondered how this promise was to be fulfilled but at the last supper their eyes were suddenly opened and they knew how they were to partake of his body and blood why should it be thought incredible that christ should give us his flesh and blood there are only two impossibilities in the question and they both vanish the moment we take a comprehensive view of human nature the first is the very changing of the substance of bread and wine into christ's flesh and blood the second is the multiplication of that body and blood according to the multiplication of them who partake as to the first question how can we refuse to the second adam who is both god and man what we must allow to the first adam and to every one of his descendants how does man grow from birth to maturity how does he maintain his strength but by a natural process of transubstantiation he is constantly changing the substance of meat and drink into the substance of his body and blood we may call this process a natural miracle for it is certainly most mysterious how does life take hold of these dead substances animate them for a time and then let go of them if the living body and blood of the natural man are formed and grow and are strengthened by this natural process of transubstantiation how can we deny to the divine and supernatural man the power to exercise a divine transubstantiation the first is according to the power of man the second is according to the power of god the natural man takes bread and ceasing to be bread it becomes his flesh and blood christ the son of god takes bread and says this is my body and it becomes his flesh and blood and in like manner he takes wine and says this is my blood which shall be shed for you and it becomes his blood inseparable from his body the bread and wine are separately consecrated to represent the separation of his blood from his body in his sacrifice but as his blood was resumed to his body in the resurrection and he liveth for ever there is henceforth no separation of his blood from his body or of his spirit and life from both and it is his spirit and life that profit us the fathers of the church compare this change this transmutation this transubstantiation of bread and wine into the body and blood of christ with the change of water into wine at cana with the changing of the rod of aaron into a serpent with the changing of the waters of the nile into blood with the sweeting of the bitter waters of marah with the conversion of food into the substance of the body and with the change of earth and water into the substance of plants what we have here said was well summed up in the comment of theophylact on the sixth chapter of st john observe he says that the bread eaten by us is not a mere figure of the lord's flesh but it is the very flesh of the lord for he did not say the bread which i gave you is the figure of my flesh but he said it is my flesh this bread is transformed by the secret words through the mystical benediction and the coming of the holy spirit into the flesh of the lord 
nor let it disturb any one that the bread must be believed to be flesh. For even whilst the Lord walked in the flesh and received nourishment from bread, that bread which he ate was changed into his body and became like his sacred flesh and contributed after the human manner to the increase and support thereof. Therefore, now also the bread is changed into the flesh of the Lord. The second difficulty is the multiplied participation of the body and blood of Christ. Yet what are we all but the multiplication of the body of Adam? What if, as after the deluge, the human family were again reduced to one parental stock? Who can doubt but that from one man the earth might be again repeopled? How is the body of Adam multiplied into the great human family, except that it obtains its power to multiply by the transubstantiation of food into corporal life? If the first man can be thus multiplied, if every man can be thus multiplied, how is it that the perfect man, the God-man, whose work it is to restore all men, cannot equally multiply the communication of his body by another mode of transubstantiation, not unlike the first. It must be ever remembered that Christ is the fountain of our new and regenerated humanity, as Adam was of the old humanity, and that from Christ as the head, life flows into the members. The Holy Communion is the consummation of what is begun in baptism, since by it the old man is more and more transferred into the new man. At last, therefore, as the old Adam becomes regenerated, after being multiplied in the body of evil, so fast does the new Adam multiply the communication of the body of grace and life that we may enter into his life through his sacramentalized body, may partake of the vital principle of the resurrection from the dead, and live by Christ as he lives by the Father. But the Holy Eucharist is more than this. It is a sacrifice in the act of becoming a sacrament. The sacrifice of the Lamb prefigured the sacrifice of Christ from the days of Abel until the Last Supper. Our Lord then celebrated that figurative sacrifice Himself for the last time, immediately after which He established His own, so that there has been no interruption of the sacrifice of the Lamb from Abel until our day, except that at the Last Supper the figurative gave place to the true Lamb of God. The shadow disappeared before the substance. He took bread, and giving thanks, he broke and said, Take ye and eat, this is my body, which shall be delivered for you. This do for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the cup, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you shall drink, for the commemoration of me. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink this chalice, you shall show the death of the Lord until he come. Observe that Christ not only delivered to the apostles the mysteries of his body and blood, but that he spoke of it as his body delivered for us. The Greek and Syriac texts say, My body that shall be broken for you, on which St. Chrysostom says, The breaking of the body in the sacrament expresses the breaking and suffering on the cross. In like manner elsewhere Christ says, This is the cup of my blood which shall be shed for many unto the remission of sins. But the body broken and offered for us, the blood shed for the remission of our sins, constitute the sacrifice of Christ. 
Christ therefore celebrated his sacrifice at the Last Supper and commanded its celebration to all future times. St. Paul says that he offered himself once forever, which signifies that the one offering is continued forever, yet is always the one and same offering that was made upon the cross. And St. John beholds the Lamb upon the golden altar in heaven, standing, as it were, forever slain. He beholds the divine victim in a perpetual state of sacrifice. Again, St. Paul compares the sacrificed blood of Christ with the blood of the old victims of the tabernacle and the temple, which sanctified all that it touched, and was carried yearly through the veil into the Holy of Holies, whilst Christ carries his blood into the holy heavens by a new and living way which he hath dedicated through the veil, his flesh, as a high priest over the house of God. The apostle therefore says in another place, We have an altar of which they who serve the tabernacle do not partake. It is not another sacrifice, but the same that was offered on Calvary, offered on Calvary with the real shedding of blood, offered on our altars with the representative and commemorative shedding of that blood, which is accomplished by the separate and distinct consecration of his body and of his blood, the one in the form of bread, the other in the form of wine. But whilst this double consecration and communion is essential for the priest who offers the sacrifice in the power of Christ and as his minister, Yet as Christ is no longer dead, but liveth for ever, he is not divided. And therefore, whoever receives under one kind, receives the body and blood, the life and spirit of Christ. Here, then, is the center of all Christian worship, in which the fruits of the oblation on the cross are plentifully received. The Mass is not a mere prayer, although the sublimest of all prayers, not a mere instruction, although the divinest of instructions. The Mass is a divine action, in which the priest represents Christ, and in which Christ presents his immolation to God for man. As he sits in his sacrificed but glorious body at the right hand of God making perpetual intercession for us, in the same body upon our altars he makes intercession for us. The sacrifice of the altar is not only the most sacred, but it is the freest of all forms of worship. For whilst the priest performs the sacrificial action according to the sacred rite, the people who assist follow each their own devotion and are not tied to the words and actions of the priest. As Mary and John stood by the cross and beheld the Lord crucified and heard his supplications to the Father for our pardon, reconciliation, and peace, so each one has his own light, his own feelings, his own devotion, his own mode of view, his own spirit, his own way of prayer and inspiration of heart, his own fruit of grace through the sacrifice of our Lord, at whose renewal he assists. When St. John saw his vision of heaven, he beheld it in that order in which the church on earth assists at the holy sacrifice, yet transformed with glory and blessed with the open vision of her mysteries. He beholds the throne of God, and before the throne the golden altar, and upon the altar the seven golden candlesticks, and behind the altar one like to the Son of God, in a white garment and a girdle of gold, for he is the bishop of souls. Beneath the altar are the souls of the martyrs slain for the testimony. By the altar is the book of mysteries. Upon the altar stands the Lamb, as it were forever slain. Around the altar are the seats of the twenty-four presbyters who assist the sacrificing bishop, 
who is like to the Son of God. And there stand the great congregation of saints, in their several orders and ranks, the martyrs, the virgins, the confessors of the faith, and the vast multitude. And they sing the canticle of God and the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain is worthy to receive power and divinity and wisdom and strength and glory and benediction. And to the Lamb, when as at the sacrifice, he opens the book of mysteries, they sing, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to take the book and to open the seals thereof, because thou wast slain and hast redeemed us in thy blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us to our God a kingdom and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of Christ in heaven is the transformation of the kingdom of Christ on earth. On earth he reigns over his own in the word of truth and in his Eucharistic presence. In heaven he reigns in the open light of truth, for there is no sun or moon, but the Lamb is the light thereof. And he reigns in his open presence, where all the blessed behold him in the glory of his Godhead, and in the full stature of his glorious manhood, from which every saint has received the fruits of his redemption, and has drunk from it as the fountain of immortal life. Here, then, we reach the full measure of man's dignity. The perfect man, as St. Paul tells us, is he who has reached the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. End of Lecture 13, Part 3《Lecture 14, Part 1 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Lecture 14, From the Beginning to the End of Man, Part 1 Thou wast cast upon the face of the earth in the abjection of thy soul, in the day that thou wast born, and passing by thee, I saw that thou wast trodden under foot in thy blood, and I said to thee when thou wast in thy blood, Live, yes, I said to thee, Live, thou that art in thy blood. And I washed thee with water, and I cleansed away thy blood, and I anointed thee with oil, and I clothed thee with embroidery. Thou wast clothed with fine linen, and embroidered work, and many colors. Thou didst eat fine flour, and honey, and oil, and wast made exceeding beautiful. And thy renown went forth among the nations for thy beauty, for thou wast perfect through my beauty, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 5 through 14. In the opening picture of this divine parable, every Christian may contemplate his own portrait as he first appeared in this world. Fear precedes his birth, pain and distress attended his coming to the light, his first infant cries proclaimed his sufferings. Clothed in the blood of the fallen Adam, his trembling dawn of life brings with it such a state of want and such a cry of helplessness that the heart of every beholder is moved to compassion. The poor little body is in want of everything and can provide for nothing. The tender soul, fresh from its Creator's hand, is immersed in that fragile body and is become an abject under the mortal sensibilities that quiver in the feeble earthly frame still ignorant of what she is, still ignorant of her eternal destiny. Can this be the original state in which God created man? 
can this represent the condition in which God originally designed that man should come into the world? Assuredly not, for everything about the newborn child proclaims its descent from an ancestor who has fallen from good to evil, from an ancestor whose blood is attained because of treason against the sovereign of the universe. The first things that appear in the offspring of Adam are abjection, defilement, and suffering, and the signs of the presence of moral disorder quickly follow. For the animal is dominant over the spiritual man, the inferior controls the superior nature from the first instant of personal life, whilst reason sleeps a profound sleep within the soul, and conscience, as the witness of God, is silent in the heart, until reason dawns to awaken its power by degrees. The child passes its earliest years under the exclusive influence of its animal senses and instincts that spring from the tainted blood of Adam, whilst the soul that comes with the body into the world is an alien from God and from His grace, and is trodden under the malignant influence of God's enemy and ours. Can we possibly imagine the spiritual image of God removed to a greater distance from God than in this state of unregenerated infancy? Is it possible to conceive the beginning of an intelligent creature in a lower or more abject condition? The soul is in want of everything, and the body is in want of everything. Through long years must the child be dependent on the care of others for every want of the body and every instruction of the soul, that infancy may be advanced to youth and youth to manhood, that the mind may be open to light and intelligence, that the sensual instincts may give way to the moral sense, and the moral sense be brought into discipline. Thou wast cast upon the face of the earth in the abjection of thy soul in the day that thou wast born, and passing by thee I saw that thou wast trodden in thy blood. God came to us when estranged from him, when cast out from our inheritance, when trodden down in the guilty blood derived from Adam. He came as one passing by, because we knew him not, yet he cannot forget the creature made to his image. He reprobates the evil that deforms his image and estranges his creatures from him, but loves the good that still remains, and that, however defiled, is still undestroyed. Nor will God abandon his own divine plan, or suffer his adversary to destroy his work beyond all power of reparation. He beholds that power of memory created to receive his eternal light. He beholds that power of understanding made for the purpose of entering into his divine truth. He looks to that will that he created with a free and generous capacity to love him as the supreme and eternal good. He beholds that soul which he created with that trinity of powers in disorder and division, and turned away from him, yet still capable of being brought back to order, turned to truth and restored to justice, still capable through his divine gifts of being united with him in the bond of eternal love. Man may forget God and the glorious end of his creation, but God cannot forget the intelligent creature whom he has so wonderfully made, and made with so much love, for an end so perfect. His eternal word, therefore, came in a most beautiful humanity, established us in kindred with him, and by a new and most pure generation, made us the heirs of his blood and of his life. That he should come to our nature was no descent, because he encompasseth every creature. But when he took our human nature to his own divine personality, 
he bridged over the infinite distance between his divinity and our humanity, and in that humanity he descended into the lowest depths of creation, where he found nothing but blindness to restore to sight, misery to redeem, and iniquity to repair with justice. The child that comes into this world stands in need of another life beyond this mortal existence. Without this second life from God, the first derived from man leaves the soul without her reason of existence, and without the means of accomplishing the object for which she came into this world. To be made for God, and yet have no just and due relations with God, is to be in a position that is utterly false and unmeaning. To have our desires centered on oneself, when the true center of our life is in God, is to be in a state of existence which is altogether perverse and absurd. Until this evil state derived from Adam is removed, and until the elements of a divine life are planted in us, to draw us from the false to the true center of light, there is nothing either in the child or in the man that can establish us in just order, either with God or within ourselves. Every Christian child has therefore two beginnings of life, of which the first is natural and is derived from Adam, and the second is supernatural and derived from Christ. It is this second and supernatural life which commands our utmost faith and gratitude, the giving of which is so impressively described in the divine parable of the prophet Ezekiel. And I said to thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yes, I said to thee, live, thou that art in thy blood. And I washed thee with water and I cleansed away thy blood, and I anointed thee with oil, and I clothed thee with embroidery. Thou wast clothed with fine linen and embroidery and many colors. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and wast made exceeding beautiful. For thou wast perfected through my beauty, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. The redeeming, the restoring, and the clothing of man with a divine life and beauty is the work of God through the divine incarnation. But the very nature of the divine incarnation implies that the whole man requires to be healed and restored. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Evil came to man in a corporal shape, and passed through his senses to his soul. It is because the soul is immersed in her corporal senses and is thereby prompted to self-love and pride and sensuality that she has become alienated from God. The flesh lusts against the spirit and makes the spirit turn from God to inferior things with a love of preference that fills her with disorder. Whoever does not understand this can never understand the full meaning of the Incarnation, as it brings God to us both in body and in spirit, nor why the principle of the Divine Incarnation should be continued in the sacraments, which are given to both the body and the soul. Christ acts through His visible Church, which is His mystical body both in the delivery of his word and of his sacraments externally, whilst he conveys the light of his truth and the grace of the sacraments to the soul internally. The body is washed with living water, and the soul is purified. The body is signed with the saving cross in the name of the Holy Trinity, and the soul is restored to the likeness of the Holy Trinity. The body is anointed, and the soul is strengthened. The body is clothed in white to express the inward clothing of the soul with the supernatural light of faith, 
and with the rectifying grace of justice, and with the graces of the virtues, that when cultivated they may beautify the soul as with an embroidery work of many colors. Faith opens the way to God, hope aspires to God, and charity unites the soul with God. The divine seed of these virtues is committed to the infant soul, where in secret and silence it awaits a devout and holy cultivation. The child of Adam has become the child of God, and an immortal food full of life, strength, and sweetness awaits the soul of that child until it reaches the age of active reason, faith, and responsibility. Thou wast perfect through my beauty, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. This regenerated child with its hidden treasures, God commits to the care and responsibility of its parents, whom he made the authors of its first life, that they might guard the second, and might be to that child as his visible providence. To them he has committed the sacred duty of first opening the mind of their child, both to the light of reason and the light of faith. The Christian child is not only a member of the family, but a member of the church and the body of Christ. And as God's representative, the church has her solemn duties towards that child, which can only be accomplished through the cooperation of its parents or guardians. Of the two orders of gifts with which God has endowed this child, the divine is given to exalt and perfect the natural, and to bring the whole man into communion with God. The natural order must therefore be so cultivated as to bring it under the effectual influence of the supernatural order of gifts, and the supernatural order of gifts must be so cultivated as to accomplish the divine intentions. To reverse this order of things in the training of infancy and youth, to put the natural before the supernatural and man above God, to fill the mind with human notions to the exclusion of divine truth and the heart with human motives to the exclusion of divine intentions, is to subvert the nature of things, to reverse the eternal order of justice, and to put the inconstant things of time before the unchangeable goods of eternity. Woe then to the parents, woe to the teachers, and woe to the blind politicians who look only to the natural and forget the divine elements implanted in the children of God who devote all culture to the child of nature, and have little or no consideration for the child of grace. In neglecting the principles of divine justice, they are destroying the foundations of human justice, and preparing the way for every domestic and social disorder. For all human justice rests ultimately on the conscience, as the conscience rests on God and whoever is not well trained in his duties to God can never be expected to be well trained in his duties to man. It is like cultivating the weeds and neglecting the corn. It is the making a wilderness of opinions through which the soul of man can find no way to God, left as he is amidst the perplexity of human opinions and starved in soul for the want of spiritual nourishment. The education of man begins with his birth, and only terminates with his mortal life, for the whole of this life is but an education for eternity. Happy is he who considers this great truth with intelligence, and takes the whole course of God's divine providence for his instructor who forgets not the past in the present, and from the present and past draws lessons for the future, and who, living in the presence of God, is ever subject to his discipline, and is guided by the providential manifestations of his will. Such a one is always learning in the school where God has placed him, 
and is always making some advancement in the fulfillment of justice. He looks back upon his origin and finds himself the work of God upon the verge of nothingness. He recalls his infancy and youth and finds himself at first altogether helpless and dependent, then wayward and thoughtless, and still dependent upon the labors, lights, and solicitudes of maturer heads and minds, whilst his maturer years depend in a thousand ways on the good providence of God. Let him distinguish what he has received from what he has not received and he will find nothing to claim as from his own fountain but the acts of his own will. Let him distinguish between the good and evil in the acts of his will, and he will find that the motive power of his good will comes of the light and grace of God. Always the choice be his own, whilst his evil thoughts and acts alone are purely his own. This is that separation of the precious from the vile, which makes the man sincere and truthful, and as the prophet says, like the mouth of God. It will teach him the great lesson, that whilst in doing evil he sinks into his own weakness, in doing or receiving good, he has but followed the good that God in his divine providence has put before him. If he turns from the exterior world into his own interior, he will there meet with wonders that are constantly increasing, and to which he can find no termination. For although on our material side we everywhere meet with limitation, on our spiritual side, where God holds communion with us, we find his unchangeable truth without bounds or limits and his unchangeable justice speaking ever with his voice. What an endowment is the light of reason, in which all men see the same principles of truth and justice, and to which all men are equally subject. What an incomparably greater endowment does the same soul receive when the light of faith descends upon the light of reason, and the man is brought into the higher sphere of light, in which God is more nearly seen, and his eternal mysteries are revealed to us. Nothing more completely shows what man is of himself, and what by the gift of God. The man of faith is the friend of God, and is made partaker of his secrets. I call you not servants, but friends, says our Lord to his apostles, because all things whatsoever I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. We receive two kinds of light, the one corporal, the other mental, the one given to the eyes of the body, the other to the eyes of the soul. The corporal light is a resplendent image of the spiritual light, the two small eyes that are set in our face have no proportion whatever to the vast prospect of earth and heaven that we are enabled to see through them. Compared with the vastness of their objects, our eyes are as nothing. But the eyes are only the instrument. The power of vision is in the soul. How is the vision accomplished? Through the gift of light. But that light is no part of our nature, it is external to us, and we are subject to its influence. It is the medium which God has provided for bringing the forms of all visible things through our eyes to our mind. We can never confound the source of that light with ourselves. The source of that light is the sun, which God has placed at a distance from us so remote as to exceed the power of imagination to represent that distance to us. Yet from that distant source of light we receive the power of vision and warmth and fostering strength to our earthly frame. Were God to remove the sun from the sphere in which it acts, we must pine away and perish in darkness. 
the material sun is the visible symbol of the eternal word of god who is the sun of all intelligences and who sends forth his light and his truth to all minds that was the true light which enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world for the light that makes god known is from god the light that manifests eternal principles is from eternity not that whilst we are in this world we can see the truth of god even by the light of faith and much less by the light of reason for that would be to see god which is reserved for the life to come we do not even see the created sun in himself but only in certain rays of his light as they are reflected and tempered by the atmosphere of this world through which they pass yet they make the sun known to us through its action reflected upon us so have we received into our minds a certain reflection and participation of the light of eternal and unchangeable truth tempered indeed to the feebleness of our nature but revealing to us its divine author this is that bread of intellect with which our minds are fed even as the air feeds our bodies with its vital fire yet the distance in communication between god the eternal truth and the created intellect of the natural man is infinite and he receives but the luminous shadows and remote images of that essential truth pale and slender is the ray of rational light that reaches the understanding of the carnal man whose mind is absorbed in earthly pursuits or obscured by the turbid influence of his sensuous appetites and impassioned instincts wisdom he has not because his heart is not touched with the light or moved with the sense of eternal good when we know anything for certain observes st thomas it is from the light of reason that we know it from that light which is divinely implanted in our soul and by which god speaks to us the natural reason he says elsewhere is nothing less than the divine brightness reflected in us this light of reason he says again acts as a universal cause and is reflected in our mind as the moon reflects the sun or more truly as the solar rays are reflected through the atmosphere from the objects on which they alight we thus see the truth as st bonaventure remarks through the medium of the creature as through a mirror not seeing the substance but the images of things but the light of faith is a more direct light which more clearly reveals to us the divine author of that light and those divine truths beyond the reach of our natural light which he would have us to know and believe and although obscurely seen as through a glass they are most certain as well because of the divine source from which they emanate as from the divine authority on which they rest and because they receive a certain illumination of divine light in the mind endowed with the gift of faith st john tells us in the beginning of his gospel that the eternal word of god is the giver of the light of reason as well as of the light of faith of that eternal word he says that all things were made by him and without him was made nothing that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shone in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it that was the true light which enlighteneth every man that cometh into this world he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not thus far the apostle speaks of the light with which all men are enlightened but with a light insufficient to reveal to them the eternal word as the author of their light then he speaks of the same eternal word as the author of the light and grace of faith through his divine incarnation 
and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory, as it were, of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What is the darkness into which the light of intelligence shines, but which knows not the divine author of its light? There are many degrees of this darkness. There is the darkness of the subjective man, who would be in utter darkness were it not for the light of reason which the eternal word planted in his soul at her creation. There is the darkness again of which St. Paul speaks, the darkness of the animal man, who turns from God to live on himself, and whose light is clouded by his pride and sensuality. There is the darkness of those again who are willfully dark, and who, like the tempters of Susanna, look down upon the earth that they may not see God. Then there is the darkness of those many souls who will not look beyond their natural light, and care not for the divine light that reveals the mysteries of God and of the soul. Finally, there is the thick darkness of those souls that confound the objective light of truth with their own subjective darkness, as though they were themselves the authors of their light, the givers and not the receivers of truth. In a word, as if they were the sun, and not merely the intelligent eye that receives the light of the sun. It is the truth of truths, to know the divine author and giver of our light. And this knowledge is the foundation of that intellectual humility which makes the soul sincere and just in obeying the truth, and in feeling her own littleness in the presence of the truth, whose foundation is in God. For whatever is true, as St. Augustine observes, is derived from the truth, and a soul is only a soul in so far as she is a true soul. Each soul derives it from the truth that she is a soul. But truth cannot admit falsehood, yet the soul does admit falsehood, and that often. Whatever truth, therefore, a soul may have, she does not obtain that truth from herself. God is truth, and it is from God that the soul obtains the truth that makes her a rational soul. Truth has, therefore, the right to command the soul, whilst the soul has no right to command or evade the truth. But the man who is sunk in sensual affections cannot lift up his eyes to contemplate the spiritual light of truth, and the world addicted to carnal cupidities is like the man whose eyes are too weak to look into the sunlight. End of Lecture 14, Part 1Lecture 14, Part 2 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 14, From the Beginning to the End of Man, Part 2. We may sum up what we have said of the great and beautiful gift of spiritual light in the words of St. Gregory Nazianzen who is called the theologian by eminence. Great, many, and unspeakable, he says, are the things which we now receive or shall receive from God. But the greatest and most benignant of all is our attraction to unite with him. What the sun is to the things of sense, that God is to the things that we understand in our minds by reason. As the sun visits our eyes in such a way as to enable us to behold his light, so God renders our mind divine. 
the sun strengthens our eyes to see and causes all visible things to be seen and in like manner does god bring to all minds the power to understand and gives to all intelligent things the power to be understood whilst he is himself the summit of all intelligible things and in him all desire ends and is at peace because there is nothing beyond however wise however high however inquiring the mind of man may be it neither has nor can have an object more sublime than god he is the supreme of all desirable things and when we have come to him all anxious questioning is at an end the man who breaks through the earth that weighs upon him and dispels the clouds of sense with the help of reason and contemplation is the man who seeks god and seeks the illumination of his soul in his most pure light this man is twice blessed he is blessed by being raised on high and he is helped in having his soul made conformable with the divinity and he draws towards that unity which he contemplates in the holy trinity but although the man that cleaves to his fleshly senses and clings to his clay had his beginning from god and is called to ascend on high yet he debases himself below what he is and will neither direct his mind to the rays of truth nor ascend above these baser things but of this man i say that although everything in this world were to follow his will he would still be wretched in his blindness and the more his earthly prosperity deludes him the more wretched he will be he only plucks the bad fruit of evil opinion to be punished with darkness and will find that the god whom he has not learnt to know in the light of truth is a consuming fire one or two sentences more from the eminent theologian that reason he says which is divinely implanted in all minds and that primal law which is inserted and woven into the bosom of all mortals is that which raises us up from visible things to god no man knows or will ever know what god is in his own essence and nature but to my thinking we shall know what is like to god in ourselves our mind and reason will be united with him whose likeness we are and the image of god will be raised into the presence of the original with whose desire our soul is touched and then we shall know even as we are known yet what reaches us in this life is but a little streamlet but a feeble ray of that great light we may now draw out the duty of the will towards the truth in the words of one whom the greeks look upon as the successor of st gregory nazianzen beware says simeon the junior theologian beware thou illuminated soul whom christ hath illuminated that the light which comes to thee comes by a secret path that is not visible to mortal eyes take it not for thy own ascribe it not to thyself lest it be taken from thine eyes and thou return to darkness for neither god nor his light is visible to the senses his light is seen in its effects but you may know how far you are illuminated if you only consider how far you have a meek and humble heart for you are illuminated as far as you are humble and no further the reason of this is that the soul advances in light as far only as she advances in humility and the pontiffs of wisdom declare that the knowledge of humility and meekness is the knowledge of god and of self for the soul that has been divinely visited is peaceful and gentle nothing in this world is so marvellous as the transformation that a soul undergoes when the light of faith descends upon the light of reason 
it is like the sunlight coming upon the moonlight and dissipating a thousand shadows and delusions the soul is lifted into a higher sphere finds herself in a new element and sees from a new principle resting her mind upon the mind of god and not upon her own faith gives to her a new faculty which rises above the faculties of her nature though in complete accordance with them the light of faith may approach by degrees or it may come suddenly like the sunburst from the cloud but there is a moment when all things are changed to the soul and with a certain inspiring confidence that the light and authority of god alone can give the memory the understanding the natural reason itself are pervaded by this supernatural light and the will is illuminated with its luster it claims to rule our nature as what is divinely superior rules what is naturally inferior yet so far from oppressing our liberty the opening to our mind and heart of such a high and heavenly order of truth and motive enlarges our freedom of interior action beyond all that we could have previously imagined the light of faith not only reveals the heavenly world to us and brings its power within us but it illuminates all earthly truth and the higher knowledge of god gives us the deeper knowledge of ourselves the heavenly mysteries seem to draw nigh to us because we are drawn towards them and in their light the value of all things is changed and in many things reversed so true are the words of st paul that if any man be in christ he is a new creature where faith presents us with the truth there is no more question of opinions or of the judgments of the natural man with their doubtings hesitatings and waverings but as we only require light or authority to know the facts of this world so we only require supernatural light and authority to know the great truths of christianity all of which are facts and facts to faith so certain and undeniable that with every increase of light and every new instruction from that authority with which christ has deposited his truth those divine facts grow more firmer and clearer to the mind are seen in greater profundity and in a more beautiful harmony with each other whilst each particular truth gives light to all the rest because all are essentially one and indivisible in the mind of god man is therefore the recipient of truth and the subject of truth not only of natural truth but of divine truth and this truth purifies his mind from darkness and error but we have shown in a previous lecture that he is also the subject of justice and that the light of justice comes to him with the light of truth and is contained in that light and expresses the essential order of things when the mind is purified elevated and made sincere towards god in the eternal truth and the will is made conformable with the divine justice the soul is prepared for union with god as the supreme good from whom that divine light of truth and justice is received the divine truth and justice are therefore the first objects that reach the faithful soul revealing to her that supreme good which is the final object of the soul and which is the reward of her fidelity to truth and justice but to be the subjects of this heavenly light implies that we live in subjection to its divine influence and this subjection constitutes us in the fundamental virtue of humility the communicating of the light of divine truth and justice is far however from being the whole account of what god does for the faithful soul the nature of man is too far from god 
too near to nothingness, and the natural will too weak and disproportionate to rise of its own strength to things divine. The will must be purified from the injustice through which it turns from God, and must receive the grace of justice by which to return to God. The soul must receive a divine strength by which she may ascend to the truth and justice of God, a strength to enable the will to cleave to God through the light of his truth and justice, in faith, hope, and charity. This is that healing, strengthening, and sanctifying grace which the subject soul receives through the infinite merits of the incarnation and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. But as every increase of natural strength gives greater freedom to the will, how much more must the gift of divine strength increase its power and give it greater freedom? To give us the certain and visible proof that we are subject to God, and that we really receive his truth and his grace, Christ established his church, and made it one as he is one. And in his church he deposited his authority, the principle of unity, his truth, his sacraments, and his judicial power, that through a human ministry his divine gifts might flow to men in a human, open, and visible way, as well as in a divine and interior way, that there might be outward and visible security for his inward and invisible gifts, and that his kingdom might hold together in a visible obedience to God. Thus God gives the interior light, whilst man gives the exterior instruction. God gives the interior grace, whilst man presents the visible sacraments. God gives the grace to obey, whilst man enforces the precepts of justice. And by the divine ordination, resting ever on the authority of Christ, in obeying the authority of the church, we obey the voice of God. To form a sound judgment, therefore, of any one's position with respect to the true and just order of things, and to take the measure of his moral stature, everything may be reduced to two points. The first is his sincerity towards the truth given to his mind and conscience, and the justice with which his will acts upon that sincerity. But this sincerity requires that he make the truthful distinction between what he is as the recipient of God's gifts, whether they be the gifts of his providence or the gifts of his grace between what we are in a word from the gifts of god and what by the conduct of our will amidst those gifts the second is the position which we hold with respect to god as the final end and object of our life and what progress we have made through the use of the divine gifts towards that divine and eternal good for which we were brought into existence but this sincerity with God and with self, the justice with which we act upon this sincerity, and the progress we make towards God, all which depend on our subjection to God and to his gifts, are founded in the virtue of humility. This humility is the matrix, the subjective and susceptive disposition of the soul, into which the light and grace of God which are the seminal principles of the spiritual virtues, are received. It is the receptive disposition of the soul made pure by the sincerity of justice, and capacious to receive, and subject to God that it may receive his divine gifts. This disposition of the soul is itself a grace, and the disposer of the soul for the more positive graces. To borrow the words of Hugo of St. Victor, in humility is the principle of life, because it subjects us to the giver of life, whilst pride is the cause of ruin, 
because it takes us away from the giver of life. The scriptures therefore strive in all their pages to convince mankind that humility is the first good of man, and that pride is the root of all evils. They are both of them amazingly fertile, each is visible in its fruits, and each in its own way exerts a prodigious influence upon the state and condition of man. Consider them as two trees, whose roots are planted in different human hearts, and observe the astonishing difference between their respective growths, and how different is the character of their fruits. Each grows through the moral man of whose heart it has taken possession. They are not merely of different, but of opposite qualities, for one is the root of humility, and the other is the root of pride. The one produces the fruit of life, and the other the fruit of death. The one fruit is transparent with lucid sincerity, the other is dull and dark with egotistical error. The one grows heavenward and seeks the light, the other grows earthward and seeks the gloom. The one is medicinal and heals the soul, the other is poisonous and destructive to the system. Each has found its congenial soil, for the root of pride is planted in the flesh, and the root of humility is planted in the spirit. No one has observed the different qualities of pride and humility more keenly than St. Paul, who never loses sight of them as the fontal sources of good and evil. The heart is the seat of appetite, and whichever of these two roots is planted there, it will determine the appetite for the fruit which it produces. For the old Adam in his pride sits at the root of the vicious tree, whilst the new Adam, Christ, with his humility, holds possession of the spiritual tree. Compare these two trees in their roots, branches, and fruits, and then choose which of the two you prefer to have planted in your nature. It is the character of pride to be self-sufficient, to be independent of the greater good, to trust in self, as though self were the greater good, to draw all things to self, and to measure all things by the man's imagination, rather than by God's truth. Pride is self-opinionated, and hard to believe, and is haughty, and sensitive when touched by the truth, and jealous, and unbending, and uncharitable. It judges, and will not be judged. It exacts obedience unreasonably, and will not reasonably obey. Pride is ever aspiring to exalt the man on false motives to a false position and on false pretensions. It is a swelling and not a growth, because it ever confounds the hollow capacity for good with the good which ought to fill that capacity. But this good the proud man will not humble himself to receive. It is the delight of the proud man to be thought happy, whilst far from the good that makes man happy. It is the delight of the polished man to cover his pride that it may not be seen. And it is the delight of the vain and vulgar man to proclaim that he has no pride unconscious of the gross pride that he reveals. But the virtue of humility is the procreative foundation of all the virtues. It opens the soul to God in the sincere knowledge of her wants, and in the sincere trust that God will give to her petitions that of which she is in want, and the humble soul is reverential in the sense of her dependence on God. This is the reason why God gives his grace to the humble, and why he resists the proud, why he knows the proud afar off, and the humble near at hand. It is also the reason why he who humbles himself shall be exalted. The first of the virtues that comes to humility is faith, and without faith 
it is impossible to please God, for the just man lives by faith. Yet what will faith profit us unless we seek with hope what we know by faith? We hope for that which we see not, we wait for it in patience. But in hoping we love what by faith we hold, and to hope comes charity. Thus faith, working by love, goes in a straight line to God as the true object of the soul. But how these three virtues which have God for their direct object are to be cultivated and followed, we learn from the virtue of prudence. Then justice gives the law for prudence to follow, and completes and adorns the three virtues that directly look to God. Fortitude protects, defends, and strengthens them, and that the virtues of the soul may not be choked with noxious weeds, or with the overgrowth of poisonous things, and so become stunted in their growth, temperance is there to keep away or remove whatever might be injurious to their free growth and expansion when therefore the three theological virtues are engrafted into the receptive root of humility and the four cardinal virtues are added to them these virtues bring to them in addition the seven gifts of the holy ghost which are the richest fruits that they can bear and by their efficacy the conspiracy of the vices is broken up the corporation of the devil is dissolved and the divine fountain of all the virtues will be reached in safety if you set opposite qualities against each other those qualities will be strongly impressed upon your mind put black against white folly against wisdom, or pride against humility, and the nature of each will come out in the most vivid contrast. Apply this method to the fruits of these two trees. After you have once tasted the sweetness of humility, you will find that there is nothing so bitter as the fruits of pride, which are not only bitter, but destructive to the soul. But if you have ever been the victim of pride, and have got free from that ruinous evil, you will find from what a malignant root you have parted, and how wonderfully sweet and unexpectedly abundant is the peace that comes to you with holy humility. If then you have the good desire to have the peace of the virtues, rather than the fury of the vices, you will do well to trace them one by one to their root, because then the whole secret of their triumph will come out. You will find that secret in the fundamental grace of humility, and that the theological virtues which seek God and the cardinal virtues which rule the man rest upon this virtue as its crown. If these lectures have taught you anything to the purpose, they will have shown you that this virtue of humility rests upon the very nature of things, and has the whole breadth and height and profundity of truth, both human and divine, for its foundations. They will also have pointed out, or left to your inference, that nothing can be more reasonable nothing more just, nothing more consonant with all truth, than that a man should bear himself with sincere humility, both as the disciple of truth and as the subject of God's gifts. The parable of the mustard seed may be taken in its small beginning as the parable of creation, and its glorious growth from so small a germ as the parable of divine providence. For although it refers immediately to the beginning and growth of the church, the same law of great growth from small beginnings through the gifts of God belongs to the order of nature as well as to the order of grace. But whatever growth we individually receive, we can never forget our feeble origin, 
Our earthly life is too short, and we have too many examples of like beginnings around us to allow of such forgetfulness. Our actual advancement from such a poor beginning is a parable again of future things. For if our present existence is wonderful as compared with our first existence, if we have already received such an expansion, and that so much greater through the gifts of God on our intelligent and spiritual side than on our earthly side, what may we expect from the promises of God for the life to come? whose shadows are already upon us, provided we fulfill the divine conditions which we know so well. To measure our being by the space we fill in this world would be too absurd to think of. The true measure of our being must be taken by the amount of truth with which the mind is united and by the amount of life with which the soul is endowed. The great difference between man and man consists in their amount of spiritual power. For the mind grows on truth and is greater in proportion to the grandeur and elevation of the truth of which it partakes. And the soul increases in grandeur with the greatness and elevation of the good on which her love is fixed and she grows less in proportion as she sinks her affections down to things that are low and base. We cannot think of material things without thinking of their limitations, because by their limitations they are chiefly known. What is greater than their limits is added by the mind, whose limits are of another order. In a statue we see nothing but the limits which the artist gives to the marble out of which he gets the form of man by limiting the block of stone. And what else there is, is supplied by the mind of the beholder. Who can tell the mystery of space? All we can say is that it is the local limitation of the material creature, and that time is the measure of the flight of mortal life. And St. Paul calls time momentary, and the creature next to nothingness. But the soul holds communion with what is infinite and eternal. It is no wonder, therefore, that those who give their minds to nothing but what belongs to time and space find life a great perplexity. If we reflect how time affects us under different conditions, we shall find how intimately it is connected with ourselves. When much occupied with ourselves, we find that time goes long and heavily with us. The weariness of sickness, of a period of inward trouble, or of disappointed expectation, is proverbial. The weariness of idleness is not in any way less effective in causing us to feel the burden of time. Why is this but because we are thrown upon ourselves, and self is wearisome? But whenever we are absorbed in some great objective truth, affection, or interest that carries one away from oneself, we not only find the time short, but are often unconscious of its passage. Well known is the Eastern legend of the hermit who upset his jar of water at the instant he was wrapped in the contemplation of eternal things. On returning to himself, he thought his mind had been away for a thousand years, but he found that the water had not yet all run out of the jar. Equally well known is the legend of the monk, who whilst contemplating in the woods, heard the eternal song. On returning from his rapture to himself, he thought he had been but a moment or two, but on returning to his monastery, he found that all was changed. No one knew him, and he knew no one, but on referring to the registers, they found there had been a monk of his name and description long years ago. These legends are attractive, because they put a profound truth in a striking way. 
the one took the measure of time from the great things he beheld, and the other was so rapt away from himself as to be unconscious of time. Leaving legends for authentic facts, one has known holy souls so absorbed in the contemplation of God as to be altogether unconscious of time and place, until the call of duty brought them back to themselves. When engaged with ourselves, we are less happy, or altogether unhappy. When occupied with some great object, we are more happy. But when absorbed in God, we are altogether happy. What greater proof can we have of the truth that man is a subject only, and not an object to himself, and that he is made for an infinite and eternal object? But this subject bears the image of God, and in that image there is a certain reflection of God, a certain shadow of his eternal truth, and a certain consciousness of the divine presence as well as of the divine law and will. In these lights he has a certain knowledge of a being who is infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and perfect, whose subject he is. And he knows, or ought to know, that all the unchangeable forms of truth, justice, beauty, and goodness present at any time in his mind have their origin in God, and not in himself or in any creature, because these are unchangeable, and the creature is changeable, because these are eternal, and the creature is of time, because these are not limited to space, and the creature of this world is limited to space. But the more we adhere to the unchangeable truth and will of God, the less changeable we are, and the less conscious of the burden of time. We are the stronger, better, and happier, because we are nearer to the source of strength and happiness, closer to our real good, closer to the divine object for which we are created, and farther from ourself for which we were not created. St. Augustine understood this when he said, Join thyself to eternity, and thou shalt find rest. For the more our spirit is united with eternal things, the more we reflect the unchangeable peace of eternity, and the less subject we are to the fretful things of time. Whilst we are so much limited on our sensual side, we are unlimited on our spiritual side, in that degree at least in which we deny ourselves to our sensual side. From our spiritual side we communicate with eternal and infinite things. This is the reasonable ground of that law of self-denial and mortification which the Son of God has given us and which, as the perfect man, he practiced. But this denial of our inferior nature is exercised in three ways. By refusing ourselves beyond what is needful to our sensual appetites, by holding the passions of our nature under firm control, and by abstracting the soul from them through the active communion of the mind and will, with divine and eternal things. End of Lecture 14, Part 2。Lecture 14, Part 3 of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 14. From the Beginning to the End of Man. Part 3. Let us return to the grain of mustard seed, to the law of the first beginning. What parent ever took the trembling mystery of infancy to his breast without feeling how poor and feeble is the origin of man? The first dawn of human life 
is nothing but animal instinct and vegetable life the soul created in that animal frame is still enfolded with its light as the rosebud in its green and tender leaves how has the body grown from its germinal existence to its state of vigorous maturity unless god has provided the inexhaustible resources of his providence it must have perished every mother might repeat the words of the brave mother of the maccabees when she exhorted her seven children to die for the law of god i know not how you were formed in the womb for i neither gave you breath nor soul nor life neither did i frame the limbs of each one of you think of your long dependence on your mother's love and care you grew at her breast your affections were opened by the outpourings of her own your mind was awakened to its first acts by her tender babblings and she brought your tongue to speak upon the mother's care came the father's authority and your subjection to your parents prepared and disposed you for your subjection to god whom they first taught you to know this is the wonderful moment of transition from earthly to heavenly beginnings when the light of reason begins to dawn and when with the light of reason dawns the light of grace the mother points to heaven with gentle words and the child begins to know that heavenly father to whom the little hands and eyes are lifted up in the first simple accents of prayer what can be more beautifully ordered than this carrying up of love and duty from our earthly parents to our heavenly father from whom they descend anew with greater strength towards those earthly parents by whom they were first awakened the long years of growth and consequent dependence assigned to man as compared with the rapid maturity of the irrational animals shows how much he has to acquire as an intelligent being and the length of his pupilage is divinely ordained that the dependence of his nature may be deeply imprinted upon him and that he may be trained to that lifelong obedience which he owes to god how have you reached your manhood the mere history of your corporal nourishment is most wonderful it has come to you from all climes and has engaged the industry of many races of men thousands of your fellow creatures have contributed their toils cares perils and sufferings under the overruling providence of god to build up your body to the vigor of manhood it were a goodly lesson to human conceit were you to meditate on the history of your clothing shelter diet and personal comfort and then on the providence of god that beyond the intention of all these toiling and suffering creatures has brought the products of their labors to bear on your own well-being put all these means and eternal resources together trace them to their several origins and you will be amazed at the number and variety of causes external to your own will that god has brought into operation to make you what you are but if the earth has conspired with all its elements and with the toils and labors of so many of god's creatures to construct nourish and protect your mortal frame heaven has sent forth its light and god his graces to develop and raise up your soul that the image of god within you might ascend to his likeness by the faith of your parents you were brought in your unconsciousness to the church of god your offences were removed and you received the grace that inclines the soul to god thus was the image of god raised to his likeness and the light of god's countenance was sealed upon you in the reception of faith hope and charity as you were generated to adam without your will 
you were regenerated unto Christ without your will. As you contracted offense without your will, your offense was removed without your will. And now began your training, both as the child of man and the child of God. Who shall tell the outward and still less the inward history of the opening of your mind to light and knowledge? How many minds and how many facts have helped you to this knowledge? But of what avail would all external help have been without the interior light of reason and faith, which have never ceased to shine into your mind from God? Think for a moment how many minds, in how many ages, nations, and conditions of life have contributed to the education of your mind and the storing of your memory. Who again shall tell the history of the forming of your heart to justice, duty, and generosity? What a narrative would that be that would tell the history in all its steps of the interior of one single Christian soul, through her conflicts of light with darkness, of grace with nature, of conscience with self, of humility with pride, from the first dawn of reason and active faith to the sanctified hour of her departure to God. This is the charm of the lives of the saints, although so much of their interior history can never be known until it is revealed to us in heaven. But in vain had been all teaching, in vain all the discipline of youth, without the light of God to see his truth, and the grace to will his law. Parents, pastors, and teachers may have done their part, but God gave them the light to teach and gave us the light to understand. They were the instrument to develop the gifts of which God is the giver. What a gift is that of speech! What the body is to the soul, speech is to our intellectual light. It is the essential instrument both for apprehending and communicating truth, as well as the bond of social life and of social religion. It was given by God to the intelligence, and can only exist through intelligence. Through the gift of language, we receive the revelations of God, the wisdom of past ages, the present communications of mind to mind, and the knowledge of what is distant from us in time and place. Through the gift of language, we are able to know the course of God's providence through all the ages of the world. Through this gift, all the traditions of past ages reach us in this present time, and every kind of knowledge, both human and divine. As the body in due order is the obedient servant of the soul, speech in due order is the obedient servant of truth. Looking to all these things, each of them seems to put St. Paul's question in its turn, What hast thou which thou hast not received? And if thou hast received, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received? These questions go to the very roots of good and evil, for both truth and justice require us to confess the gifts of God and that we should not ascribe to ourselves what we receive from him. But whoever is so far gone in pride as to ascribe to himself what he has received from God has infected his soul with a dark falsehood and deformed his life with a deep injustice. It is often said that men have much in common but in so far as the vision of the mind and the justice of the will is concerned, they are often as far from each other as though they were creatures of another kind and lived in different worlds. What can be farther asunder than the man who thinks in the light of God and the man who thinks only in the light of nature? What can be wider apart than the man whose will is centered on God and the man whose will is centered on himself. 
they differ from each other in the fundamental principles of life thought and conduct whilst the man of nature has the most contracted views of everything the man of faith has an infinite prospect before his mind whilst the natural man acts on the lowest motives the man of faith is elevated by the highest motives of which an intelligent creature is capable he thinks more from god's point of view than from his own because this divine point of view has become his own and thus he beholds even human affairs in the light of divine principles let us not be deceived by our present confines and limitations we already feel our capacity for eternal things and whilst bound in body to the earth we can ascend in mind to heaven our desires are in advance of our position and we know that god is secretly with us but every advancement towards the open possession of god involves the breaking down of our natural limitations and this breaking through our limitations is always a surrender of self and a sacrifice through our birth from adam we are in the bondage of satan and we are freed from that bondage through the regeneration of christ but though by his regeneration we are transferred into his kingdom we are still in the bondage of ignorance from this bondage we are set free through the labors of instruction after the light of instruction has expanded the mind and made it free in the truth we still find ourselves compressed and held under restraint by our bodily senses and by that passionate egotism and concupiscence which fetter and clog the wings of the soul then comes the combat of the spirit against the flesh and of the love of god against the love of self a long and severe combat calling for self-denial patience and many sacrifices before the soul obtains the calm supremacy and the body is reduced to subjection when this deliverance is won it is only the first restoration to order and the beginning of freedom every more earnest aspiration after god is a departure from that bondage which holds us in fetters to our self-seeking limits every new light from god breaks down something of the dark circle of ignorance by which we are imprisoned if the soul ascends to a higher contemplation of eternal truth she has parted with some of her earthly load and has ascended into a diviner atmosphere whenever she courageously quits herself in the ventures of faith and hope and casts her heart upon god as the fountain of her life she breaks some invisible chain that held her to her native weakness when she denies herself to herself that she may live to god and love him above all things and in all things and when in the love of god she sacrifices her repose in the service of her neighbors she habitually breaks away from the limits set to nature by self-love and becomes enlarged in spirit light and grace and free with that liberty with which god sets us free extending herself ever more beyond her native confines finally the mortal body is wholly sacrificed at the divine call that the soul may pass to god we have considered the beginning and the midway of man but the beginning is for the end and the midway leads to the end the beginning rests on creation the midway rests on the divine providence but the end of the just rests on god our great capacity as the image of god was given to us as our first preparation for our final end the fundamental appetite of our soul for universal good was given to dispose us towards our final end 
The supernatural light of faith is given to light us on the way to our final end. The law of eternal justice is given to rule us towards our final end. The grace of Christ is given us to strengthen our will to gain our final end. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to sanctify us for our final end. The creation makes God known to us, whilst it veils him from our sight. And the more closely we question the creation, the more clearly it tells us that it is not our end, it is not the universal good, but only an inferior and transient good, only a veil before the eternal good, unable to satisfy the soul of man, which is the image of God. All things in this world, in their right use, are for our final end. But our final end is for its own sake. Our beginning is full of solicitude. Our midway is full of labor and care. But our final end has neither solicitude, nor labor, nor care. But the greater the love which the soul has for God as her final end, the more rapid is her movement towards her final end. Love moves, and intention guides her emotion to the end of all her desire, and she is already in part possession, although not yet secure. As all good is measured by its end, so all evil is measured by its end. For as there is a supreme end of all good which is so high that there is nothing above it, there is also an end of evil which is so base and low that there is nothing beneath it. Heaven is the summit of the good that reaches its end, and hell is the lowest descent of the evil that reaches its end. The end of the wicked, who go on to their mortal end in wickedness, is their utter failure from their final end and the consummation of evil. God is their final end, but to God they can never come. With the God who is infinitely pure, just, and holy, the defilement of what is unchangeably impure, unjust, and unholy can never be united. The end of the wicked, says St. Paul, is destruction, and the destruction the more terrible because it is not the destruction of existence, since the soul is created immortal, for immortal good, nor yet the end of evil, since the sinner would not change his evil will, but a destruction that brings the evil one to the last extremity of evil, that stands at the remotest distance from the final end of man. For as there is a supreme end of good, in which the just man finds all the good for which he was created, there is an extreme end of evil, prepared by the eternal justice for all unjust and perverted wills. But this is not the final end of man, which is the same for all, but the final loss of that end. In the words of Ecclesiasticus, every corruptible work shall fail in the end, and the worker thereof shall go with it. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. In these words the Son of God proclaims that all things have their beginning through him, and all things have their end in him, to whom the Father hath delivered all things. As the word of God he made all things, and enlightens all intelligences, as the Word incarnate, he bridged over the gulf of separation between God and the fallen creature. Through his sacrifice and resurrection, he renewed all things, and opened the way of return through himself for all mankind to God. He is the author and the end of the world and of the ages, of the law and the prophets, of the gospel and the church, and to all that are his he gives the beginning and the end of perfection. He is the first and the last, 
says St. Ambrose, the first because all things are through him, the last because the resurrection is also through him. He descended into this earth and placed himself beneath all, that he might lift up whatever has fallen. As he is the renewer of all things and the perfecter of whatever is perfected, he is likewise the judge of all, assigning his end to every one according to his works. There is no beginning or end of God, and only with respect to us is this to be understood, that he is the beginner of our nature and the author of our grace and the end of our faith and love. He is the beginner of our justification and the accomplisher of our justification and the perfecter of our justification. Wherefore he concludes the whole course of his divine revelations with these words, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to his works. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are they who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in by the gates of the city. Without are dogs and sorcerers and the unchaste and murderers and servers of idols, and every one that loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and stock of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And he that heareth, let him say, Come. And he that thirsteth, let him come. And he that will, let him take the water of life freely. When the just soul leaves the earth and is purified from every stain, she is prepared for the vision of God. She will enter into the eternal region, where there is no sun nor moon, for the Lamb is the light thereof. She will have reached her final end. She will have come to the fountain of light, from which all spirits are illuminated, and will be at the fountain of life, in which all the angels and saints are blessed with eternal life. She will see God. And what is it to see God? Eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of any man, to conceive what God hath prepared for them who love him. Let us not be deceived, I again repeat, by our present limitations. This world is but our place of trial. The body is our prison, and our carnal senses are the fetters that confine the soul. We are now in the day of clouds, and see but obscurely, and have but slight foretastes of the life to come. But when we are delivered from this earthly prison, and unfettered from the carnal senses, and the spirit prepared by faith and love shall pass from place and time, and come into the open presence of God, her capacity shall expand to all its magnitude, as the glory of God enters into her being. A fire of life will enter into her spirit, giving her immortal strength to behold the vision of God. Beholding with open face, she will be filled with light and see all truths in one eternal truth and will see the substance of truth in the Father who created her, in the Son who redeemed her, and the Holy Ghost who sanctified her, in one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all intelligences, she will see the beginning and the end of whatever is good in heaven or on earth. God is love. The life of God is love. The life of all that are in God is love from His infinite love. 
this life of love carries the intelligent creature towards god with a fire and force that consumes every thought and desire of turning again to the creature for all good is found in the one supreme good on which the soul makes her final rest she neither turns to herself nor to anything beneath herself god is her object her light her strength her life they shall be inebriated with the torrent of his delight the soul is now a pure likeness of god looking to him alone filled with his good to the brim of her capacity no longer living in herself because god lives in her she sees nothing in herself but become ecstatic she sees all things in god and what shall she there see she beholds the mystery of the holy trinity the fountain of all reason and life she beholds god at his work of creation drawing all things out of nothing through the eternal word she beholds him exercising the stupendous work of his providence ruling all things on their course nourishing all things and giving to each creature the perfection that accords with his eternal plan she beholds the eternal word in his infinite and eternal beauty illuminating all spirits and enlightening all intelligences she beholds him in his godhead as he is the image of the father's substance and the splendor of his glory she beholds him in his humanity as he sits at the right hand of the father and looks into the depths of the mystery of human redemption into which the angels longed to look before it was accomplished she beholds the son of god as he is the divine head of his church and of humanity sending forth to all the earth the rays of his light the streams of his grace and the power of his spirit and holding the members within his body in the unity of faith and obedience she sees the holy spirit one eternal love with the father and the son sending forth the gifts of wisdom and sanctification reaching from end to end of all things mightily and disposing all things sweetly she sees that whatever is good or wise or strong or pure or sweet or beautiful or deserving of love in the created universe is but some shadow reflection image or vestige of that supreme and sovereign power wisdom goodness beauty holiness and perfect unity of being in whom is the one indivisible and eternal life whom she blesses and adores as the infinite good and as the inexhaustible giver of all good to every creature that soul thus blessed with the beatific vision is but one of myriads of spirits embracing every order of angels and saints who form one society in god and after their successful probation form one united kingdom of heaven each of those innumerable spirits was a special creation and each is a distinct and singular work of grace each a several and particular star of light and life in that bright heaven with her own history her own accomplished course her own especial reward and glory and whilst each is a likeness of god how endlessly varied is the likeness the good of each is the joy of all for there is no jealousy where there is no self-love and where the same divine spirit worketh all in all now do those blessed spirits comprehend the full sense of his words who redeemed them in his precious blood i am the light and the life and i have given you to have life and to have it more abundantly and as the father liveth by me and i by the father so he that partaketh of me 
the same shall live by me. And where he said, He that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. And he also said, If any one love me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him, and make our abode with him. All that these divine promises signify is now unveiled and perfected in spirits become all sight and spiritual sense, and able through their whole capacity to embrace the supreme good for which they were created. As the soul contemplates all things in God and nothing in herself, and as all things past are present with him, she sees all that God has done for her in the divine mirror of eternal truth, and there beholds the record of her marvelous advancement from her beginning on the verge of nothingness to her final end in God. Her creation in the image of God, her gift of rational light, and her growth and progress in the world through the unceasing gifts of God's providence in so many kinds, are all present to her mind. The work of her redemption and restoration to God fills her heart with an unspeakable gratitude. She beholds all those converging lines of good, whether earthly or heavenly, which God in his loving care had made to bear upon her course of life, to nourish and protect her nature, instruct her mind, sustain her hope, and build her up in the service of the living God. She sees the whole of that precious chain of divine lights, graces, inspirations, encouragements in trial, pardons after failure, consolations and strengthenings, that extends over her mortal life, and has brought her on her way to God. She sees how God went before her preparing her way, and with her to support her in the way, and followed after her to make her way secure, afflicting her but to heal, striking but to save, humbling but to exalt her. In a word, she there in that eternal mirror sees how God made all things work together for the good of his elect. She there also sees with most profound astonishment how poor are the services which even the most zealous of his intelligent creatures render to God when compared to the services that God has rendered to them. He has not only given us the services of his creatures on earth and of his angels and saints in heaven, but has himself provided for all our needs of every kind. And when our blessed Lord came to this earth, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. Hence great saints of God in moments of ecstatic intuition have used such language as this. When I behold the dear God taking such care of us, and bringing us all that we have need of both for soul and body, I cannot but exclaim, O God, thou art our servant. It is nobler to give than to receive, but to serve is to give more than all gifts. The Son of God gave himself to us. It is most truly a very noble thing to give ourselves to God's service, since he gives himself to ours. That one soul whom we have considered as she has reached the final object of her existence is but an example from the great multitude which no man can number, and in whom are exhibited the inexhaustible diversities of the divine gifts. Each of them has a separate and singular history, each has her own course among the countless tracks that mark the ways of souls through time, each her own path of providence, each her own luminous chain of graces and mercies, that have conducted her in a different way from nothingness to the final possession of God. And when all these souls shall have received their corporal frames anew, 
raised in the power of Christ from mortality to immortality, and from dishonor to glory, each will be the spiritualized and agile instrument of the soul to which it belongs, having its own proper character and glory, derived from the glorifying presence of God in the soul. The great end of the creation, contemplated from the first, is accomplished in them. God is wonderful in his saints. Their very bodies are as harps and symbols on which to celebrate the praises of God, who has raised earth itself to a life so magnificent. The kingdom of Christ is transformed into the kingdom of heaven, where he reigns supreme over those whom he has purchased with his blood and perfected by his spirit. It is the new heaven and the new earth raised up to God by him who makes all things new. And whilst every spirit praises God with a gratitude ever renewed for all that he has done for her, that endless diversity of spirits, in whom one spirit reigns, gives an inconceivable breadth and magnificence to the harmony of the celestial choirs, in whom all the works of the Lord bless the Lord, praise and exalt him for evermore. We may sum up the moral application of this book in a few sentences from the pen of St. Hilary. In his own example, the Lord hath taught us to give up the ambition of human glory. He has also left us this precept. The Lord thy God thou shalt adore, and him only shalt thou serve. And through his prophet, he tells us that he chooses the humble people who tremble at his word, and shows us thereby that he has placed the beginning of beatitude in a humble spirit. If we breathe humble things, we shall not forget that we are men. And whilst we are made members of God's kingdom, our conscience will keep us in remembrance that God has perfected our body out of the meanest and poorest elements, and through his ministering providence has advanced our soul to her present sense, and to her present ability of knowing, feeling, judging, and acting. Nothing is any man's own, for no one can claim an exclusive right or property in what he has. From one divine Father we have all received the same beginning of life, and he has ministered the substance whereby our life has grown and is maintained. Our duty, therefore, is to imitate that bounty which is exercised towards us by the best of fathers in giving us all things. This is done by being good to all, and by holding what we have received at the service of all. On the other hand, we ought not to suffer the pretentious insolence of this world to corrupt us, nor the thirst for wealth, nor the ambition of vainglory. But let us keep ourselves subject to God, and as we have received a life that is common to all, let us hold to all who have this life by the charity that is given us for all. We may take the fact that we have been advanced thus far from nothing by the divine goodness as proof that we may be advanced still farther until we reach the divine goodness himself as the honor and reward of our faithful conduct in this life. Thus through the spirit of humility whereby we are subject to God and to his gifts we are brought to the better things of our hope, and the kingdom of heaven will be ours. The End End of Lecture 14, Part 3 End of The Endowments of Man by William Bernard Ullathorne